Chapter One of the Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lisa Marie Duffield. The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter One the coming of man long before men came into the world the earth existed though it was very different from the earth as it is to-day men of science who can read a story in the rocks which make up the surface of the earth tell us that at one time it was so hot that nothing of any kind could live on it it was a great round lump of melted stuff whirling round and round by degrees it got a little cooler the outside cooled first, and a crust was formed which broke and perhaps at first fell into the melted part underneath. Later on it stopped falling through and turned into a hard, cool skin, much like the earth as it is now, except that at first there was no living thing on it, not even the smallest flower or insect. But the inside of the earth has not cooled altogether yet, and we find that if we go down into it, for instance down a coal mine, it grows hotter the lower we go. Sixty feet below the surface a thermometer would tell us that it is a degree hotter, another sixty, another degree, and so on. Since the outside has cooled, and when it had become cool enough for water to be on it, then it was possible for plants and animals to live. Now the first plants and animals began to live so long ago that even the cleverest men cannot say exactly when it was. It must have been in any case hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years ago. We do not know even when the first man lived, and we do not know where. In the Bible we are told that the first man was Adam, and that he lived in a certain place which had four rivers flowing through it. Many people have thought that this place, the Garden of Eden, must be in Arabia, in the valley of a river called the Euphrates, where the Assyrians and Babylonians lived afterwards. But some of the greatest men of science now say that probably the first man lived in an island in the Far East, which in those far-off days would not be an island at all, but a part of southern Asia. One of the reasons for thinking this is that not many years ago a skull was found there which is thought to be that of the very first man. He must have been a very strange man. His forehead sloped back sharply from his eyebrows, instead of going straight up, and then gently back, as ours do. His head must have been smaller than that of any man now alive, but it was larger than the head of a certain kind of monkey, called the gibbon monkey, though it was very much like it in shape. Learned men who think, as many of them do now, that men are descended from monkeys, say that this was probably the skull of the very first man, and would therefore naturally be very much like that of a monkey. There are other reasons why men of science think that it was in Jawa that the first man was born and one of them is that it could only be in a warm, moist climate such as we know existed there that man could first grow. Picture Caption The Shape of the First Man's Head From the Skull Found in Jawa by Dr. Dubois End Caption if this is so, of course, it might almost as well be in the place where the Garden of Eden is supposed to have been, except that no traces of these far-off men have been found there. But we really do not know anything, certainly, about the first man, though we know a good deal about men who lived many thousands of years ago. 
there are some signs of the existence of the first men even in europe in far-off ages when the land was covered with white glistening ice and everything was dreadfully cold we do not know how these men came to europe nor do we know how many kinds of men there were at the time but traces have been found of three kinds at least we shall hear something of these presently although we do not know where these first men came from we know a good deal about them they were cave dwellers they did not build houses as we do but they moved about until they found some hole in the rocks which would keep out the cold winds and the hail and snow and there they made their home if they could for sometimes they would find huge animals in the caves and would have to fight for their lives we think the elephant a very big animal but the elephants of those days were much bigger the elephants of today would look beside them as sheep beside horses there were also other huge animals of different kinds with strange names and strange shapes besides these there were giant bears lions and wolves these ancient men had very poor weapons to fight with they had not learned to make swords and spears of iron stone was all they could think of to make their axes spears knives and swords they would knock one piece of stone against another until they had made a sharp edge and then after a long time it would look something like the head of an axe a favorite place for caves chosen as homes by these wild men was the side of a steep cliff or hill probably because the great wild animals could not reach them there very easily we know of several of these caves which because of the things dug out of them must have been the homes of wild early men like these they stained themselves different colors with the juice of plants just as the people did whom julius caesar found in britain they wore skins of wild animals for clothes and they lived on the flesh of the animals they killed and on roots which they dug out of the earth we find not only their rough stone weapons but their bones lying side by side with those of the great rhinoceros which they seem to have learned how to kill easily they knew how to make fires and they kept the wild beasts away at night by building up great fires made from the brushwood of the forests these men were not attractive to look at their foreheads went sharply back from their eyebrows and these stood out like a shield over their eyes their chins also went back from their teeth instead of forwards like ours they were short men and as we have seen did not know many things as yet they must have been very cunning hunters as that was the work they lived by and some of their weapons were cleverly made but at best they were not very different from monkeys these ancient men are called by some people neander men because the first head of such a man was found in a cave in germany called the neander cave the reindeer men long after the neander men lived we know that there was another sort of ancient men who are called cromagnard men because their skulls were first found at cromagnon in france they are also sometimes called reindeer men because they lived at the time when reindeer roamed over the south of europe now these reindeer men although of course they were savage men who lived thousands and thousands of years ago must have been in some ways almost like the men of today the climate had changed very much from that which the neander men had had to put up with it was now cold and dry the ice had disappeared and the climate was not very different from that in the north of europe in the winter now the reindeer men were still cave dwellers and some of their traces have been found in caves in devon and derbyshire 
but they had foreheads like those of men now rising fairly gently from the eyebrows the whole head and face of a reindeer man must have been quite like those of men we meet every day the size of his head was about the same the only great difference was that the chin still went backwards from the teeth they were tall men too with much better figures than the neander men but this is not all though they were hunters and had only weapons of stone their weapons were more finely made and strange to say the reindeer men were very fine artists curious savage people though they were covering their bodies with yellow and red paint they could cut into ivory perfect little pictures of the things they saw around them you can almost see the deer putting down its finely shaped legs when you look at some of these scenes in ivory they could paint too in a cave in the north of spain there are painted on the walls in almost natural colors and in natural positions buffaloes wild boars and horses they were painted long ago by the reindeer men sometimes they tried sculpture and at this too they were very clever these paintings and sculptures and drawings are to be found not in one cave only but in many in the south of france and in the north of spain so we cannot think they were the work of one artist among a number of savages just like a genius among thousands of ordinary people today they were a real race of artists clever men in many ways though so savage in others we know that they were clever in other ways too they got their flints and stones to make weapons from mines from which they dug them with axes sometimes made out of the horns of animals we know too that they made lamps for themselves altogether they must have been men whom we should have liked to know a strange thing about these reindeer men is that we are almost certain that they were not descended from the rougher and ruder neander men it seems more probable that they came to the western parts of europe when the terrible covering of ice had gone from it but a still stranger thing is that the bodies of another kind of men still have been found of the same sort as the negro of the present time picture caption specimens of the work of the most ancient of the world's artists one a buffalo painted on a wall of a cave at altamira north spain perhaps fifty thousand years ago two carvings on ivory by reindeer men three a tool carved out of flint found at a great camp of the new stone age in sussex four and five beautifully carved flint arrowheads of the same age found in ireland six a flint pick found in the thames seven a flint knife from denmark and caption so here we see there are three kinds of men found living at the same time the savage small neander men the artistic and clever and finely built reindeer men and the negro men but we know almost nothing about the negro men all these men lived in a time which the people who study these things call the old stone age but the reindeer men still lived in the new stone age a time which is nearer to the days when real history begins the weather in the west of europe was growing warmer still so that new and different kinds of animals could live there the reindeer men had gone but there was now the red deer which long afterwards the red king loved to hunt in england the lake dwellers the reindeer men disappeared with the reindeer where they went to we do not know perhaps they just died out because the weather did not suit them as it did other men who now began to show themselves so far as we know the new people did not come from the reindeer men 
the men of this new time began to build houses sometimes of stone sometimes of wood a favorite place for houses was the middle of lakes the men first drove heavy pieces of wood into the water and then built their houses upon them lake dwellers as we call them are known to have lived at glastonbury in england they began to collect herds of cattle and kept them for food they also tilled the land and grew things they built strange circles of stone one of which may still be seen at stonehenge in the south of england we know too that they began to make pottery but they could not draw and paint like the reindeer men who had lived perhaps thousands of years before them this seems a strange thing as the new men were so much more civilized in other ways the new stone age reaches the time of which real history begins to speak it lasted until about four thousand years ago in some parts of europe but in egypt even about seven thousand years ago the people had learned to make weapons of bronze and a little later of iron it is with these people that the most interesting part of the story of the world commences of the earlier peoples we can never know very much and real history begins with the writing down of the doings of men who were very different from these savages people who knew many things and wanted to know more and so people whom we understand better and like to hear about when people learned to make weapons of bronze and iron instead of stone the wild animals were more frightened of them and fled before them when all the animals in one place had been killed or had run away the people moved on to another place to find more animals so that in the very early days people were always moving from place to place families who were related to each other kept together and moved with each other we call a number of families keeping together in this way a tribe often two tribes would want to go to the same place and then they would fight and the tribe which won would have the land picture caption how the world began the world probably began as a great mass of glowing gas whirling round and round which gradually after millions of years cooled down into solid matter this photograph taken through the great telescope of yerkes observatory shows the mass of glowing gas in the milky way called the nebula of andromeda which is now in the state that our world was probably in at the beginning End caption after many years men began to collect together sheep and cows from which they got nearly everything they wanted they killed some of them for meat to eat and got milk from the cows to drink and they made themselves clothes from the wool of the sheep when there were so many animals the grass was soon eaten up and so again the tribes had to move on to other places for fresh pasture land sometimes when a tribe found land on which things grew very easily they stayed there and instead of keeping so many sheep and cattle they kept only a few and instead of letting grass grow all over the land they gave up some of the land to grow many other things they built themselves houses to live and sleep in instead of the tents which they had used when they were always moving so villages were made and some of these grew into towns and instead of all the men hunting or fishing or fighting or growing corn some began to do one thing and some another some men made boots and others made weapons for the people who were looking after the land and had no time to do these things for themselves but always for thousands of years there were tribes still moving 
sometimes coming to fight the people who had settled down and taking their lands from them. Most of the people in the hottest part of the earth had black skins and black hair. Those farther north were brown or yellow and also had black or very dark hair. Then there were tribe upon tribe of white people, and more and more of these were ever pouring into Europe from Asia. We know most about the people of Europe, Asia, and the north of Africa, and more about some of these peoples than about others. With the story of the people who lived on the banks of two great rivers, the Nile and the Euphrates, real history begins. End of chapter one. Read by Lisa Marie Duffield of DuffieldDiscovery.org on May 5th, 2021. Chapter two of The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lisa Marie Duffield. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 2. The Jews and the Phoenicians. The rich lands on which things grew easily and where men first settled down to live without moving away were generally found on the banks of great rivers. People cannot live without water to drink, and the soil too must be watered before it will bear fruit. For thousands of years, while tribes were still swarming over Asia and passing into Europe, lasting settlements had existed near two great rivers the river Nile in North Africa, and the river Euphrates in Western Asia. The country round the banks of the Nile was called Egypt. The Egyptians were a brown people with straight black hair and curious long dark eyes. The country on the right of the Euphrates was called Mesopotamia. The people there belonged to the lighter races. In both these countries, as the years went on, the people had learnt to do many wonderful things which would have been impossible in earlier and wilder times. They learned to know something about the sun and stars. They could count and do sums in arithmetic, and they had learned to build not only houses of brick, but great buildings of stone. And though they did not write as we do, and had not paper and ink, they had a picture writing of their own which they scratched on stones and the walls of their buildings many of these pictures remain to this day and clever men are able to read them and tell us what they mean in egypt the most wonderful buildings of all were great pointed stone monuments which the old egyptians built over the graves of their dead kings to do them honor lest they should be forgotten. These pyramids were built nearly 4,000 years before the birth of Christ. And there they stand to this day, and people go from far-off countries to look at them as one of the wonders of the world. They are so big and wonderful that the people of today cannot imagine how they were built. The Egyptians, too, made beautiful stone statues, and they must have been very fond of beautiful things. But we must remember that not all the people could enjoy these things, for many of them were slaves and had to do all the work, and could be bought and sold like animals. It must have kept thousands and thousands of slaves busy cutting the great stones to build the pyramids. Picture caption, the pyramid tomb of King Khufu and the great Sphinx at Giza, Egypt. This is the greatest of the pyramids. It was built over 6,500 years ago and is 150 feet higher than St. Paul's Cathedral. End caption. 
more than a thousand years after the pyramids were built the egyptians were conquered by a new people who came out of arabia these were a semitic people quite different from the egyptians it is to this race that the jews and arabs belong all the semitic peoples seem to have come from arabia at first after about two hundred years the semites were driven out of egypt but long before these semites went into egypt others had crossed the country called syria and conquered mesopotamia they found there a people much more civilized than themselves but they soon became as civilized as the people around them and set up great kingdoms the southeastern part of mesopotamia was called babylon and a great semitic kingdom was founded there one of its rulers called hammurabi drew up some famous laws which he had written down on a great block of stone on which clever men today can read the laws of the babylonians two thousand years before the birth of christ these laws show that the babylonians were very highly civilized indeed the part of mesopotamia to the northwest of babylonia was called assyria and was nearly always under the same ruler as babylonia the old writers used to call them both by the one name assyria but it was generally the babylonians who were the more important people clever men who are interested in the story of these old peoples have dug deep down in the ground at different places in these countries which are now very lonely and wild they have found there old forgotten temples and walls and tombs and all sorts of vases and weapons belonging to different times in the several thousands of years during which the greatness and civilization of the assyrians and babylonians lasted in the british museum we can see the great bronze gates of a palace built nearly a thousand years before the birth of christ they are covered with curious and beautiful sculpture but many older things than these have been found and some have been carried away to different countries of europe it was in the time of hammurabi that abraham of whom we read so much in the bible lived up to this time the people of egypt and mesopotamia though they knew so many things knew very little about each other and the rest of the world abraham at last one man traveled from beyond the euphrates right across the land of canaan which we now call syria and into egypt this was abraham the father of the hebrew or jewish people who were to have such a wonderful history abraham was a very rich wise man the father of an immense family he was a semite who lived in the land of mesopotamia but he heard the voice of god telling him to go out from his home to leave his father and friends and to go to the land that should be shown to him in those days people worshipped many gods but abraham believed in the one god and he handed on his belief to the people whose father he was it was from the jews that after hundreds of years nearly all the world learned to worship the one god abraham traveled out of mesopotamia into the land of canaan he was a rich man and the head of a tribe of about twelve hundred people besides the family and followers of his nephew lot who traveled with him abraham was head of all and led the rest he went on before dressed in a bright scarlet robe his wife and children probably rode on donkeys or camels there were many of these and on their backs the men servants and maid servants piled abraham's great possessions his clothing and that of his family the tents in which they slept food 
and the things with which to cook it, and what hangings and coverings were used. Other slaves drove the great herds of sheep and cattle belonging to Abraham and Lot. It was Abraham who said where they should travel and where they should stop. Generally, they were moving up and down amidst the rich pasture lands and the beautiful groves of oak in the land of Canaan, which God had promised should belong to him and to his children's children forever. Generally, too, Abraham and his people traveled under a cloudless sky of blue, and all must have been gay and happy. But there was a dark side to this free and happy life. Sometimes no rain would fall for many days, and the grass would dry up under the blazing sun, and there was no water for man or beast to drink. Corn would not grow, and there was little or nothing to eat. It was the dead time of famine. At one time, when famine fell thus upon the land, Abraham led his people further and further south into the rich land of Egypt, where they could have water and bread. Here Abraham saw for the first time the wonderful land of the pyramids, with its temples and its statues. It was even hotter in Egypt than in the land of Canaan. Half the year it had soft spring weather, and for the other half a scorching summer. But it was a rich land, and generally had much corn. The great river Nile, which runs through the land, and which the Egyptians worshipped as a god, overflowed its banks each year, and the water spread over the lowlands fertilizing the crops. Having done its work, the river shrank again to its ordinary size. Sometimes the Nile did not rise, and then the people were sad, for nothing would grow. But there was so much corn in the years of plenty that it could be stored up to feed the people in the days of famine. It was at a time of famine in the land of Canaan that Abraham led his people into Egypt, where there was corn for all. Picture Caption How an Ancient Egyptian Painted the Coming of the Israelites into Egypt From a Painting on the Walls of a Tomb at Beni Hassan, Egypt, Made Nearly 4,000 Years Ago It may very easily represent Israelites as the Egyptians saw them, when Abraham went with his people into Egypt in the time of famine. End caption. The pharaoh, or Egyptian king, welcomed him and gave him corn and rich presents, and Abraham taught the Egyptians things about the stars which he had learnt in Mesopotamia and which the Egyptians did not know. When the famine was over, Abraham went again out of Egypt into the beautiful land of Canaan. But he had now so many people that his servants and those of his nephew Lot quarreled about the pasture lands, and Abraham thought it best that they should separate. He took his nephew to the top of a hill where they could look down upon all the land of Canaan, and told him to choose which part he would take for himself. Lot chose the rich country that lay round the banks of the river Jordan, and Abraham was content with another part of Canaan. There were other tribes besides those of Abraham and Lot in the land of Canaan, and when one of these, called the Elamites, fought against Lot and carried him and his people off as prisoners, Abraham went to their rescue and brought them safely back. It was on his way back from this expedition that Abraham met Melchizedek, who was a priest and also ruler of one of the many cities which were spread about the land of Canaan. Melchizedek also worshipped the one God, and offered to him a sacrifice of bread and wine instead of animals or fruits, which were the common sacrifices of the time. Melchizedek felt himself drawn to love Abraham, 
and offered him the tenth part of all he possessed. But Abraham would take nothing for himself or his own people, but only for the men who had joined their servants to his in the battle. When Abraham had gone back to his home, it was revealed to him that he should become the father of a great nation, to which the land of Canaan should belong in the end, though it must suffer much and be carried into captivity after his death. Now Sarah, the wife of Abraham, had not any children. She was already ninety years old, for people lived to a great age in those days. And Abraham wondered how his children's children could become as many as the stars in heaven if he had not even one child. But Sarah had a son, as had been promised, and they called him Isaac. Sarah lived to see her boy grow to be a man, and was buried at the age of 127 years in the cave of Hebron, which Abraham bought to be a burying place for himself and his family. Through Isaac, Abraham was the father of the Jews, but he had other children with other mothers, and through these he became the father of other nations. His son Ishmael, whose mother was Sarah's handmaiden Hagar, was the first of an Arab tribe, and six sons of Abraham by a second wife founded other tribes. These families went out from the land of Canaan, leaving it to Isaac, the son of Sarah. When Isaac had grown to be a man, Abraham sent a servant to seek a wife for him in his old home in Mesopotamia. Men now traveled much oftener between Mesopotamia and Egypt across the land of Canaan. The servant prayed that he might have a sign to show him how to choose a wife for his master's son. He asked that the maid who was the one to choose should give him water to drink when he asked her and offered to draw some from the well for his camels, too. One evening, when he had made his camels lie down near a well outside a town, he saw a beautiful girl coming to the well with a pitcher on her shoulder to draw water. He asked her to give him water to drink, and she immediately filled the pitcher and gave it to him, and then drew more for the camels. The servant knew then that she was the wife whom he was seeking for Isaac. He went back with her to her brother's house, and, bringing forth precious gifts of silver and gold, he asked that Rebekah might go back with him to be Isaac's wife. And so she did. Isaac and Rebekah loved each other at first sight. They had two sons, Esau and Jacob. Esau grew up to be a strong man. His skin was covered with hairs, and he loved hunting. He was his father's favorite. But Rebekah loved Jacob best. One day, when Esau came in tired and very hungry from hunting, he found Jacob cooking some food for himself, and he begged him to give it to him. Jacob said he would if Esau would promise to give up to him his rights as eldest son. So Esau sold his birthright for a mess of pottage, and Jacob, though he was the younger son, became the head of the children of Abraham. Jacob, by covering himself with the skins of kids, pretended to his father Isaac that he was Esau and Isaac gave him his solemn blessing. Then Jacob went away to the land of Mesopotamia to find a wife. He loved Rachel, the younger daughter of his uncle Laban, and Laban promised her to him as his wife if he would work for him for seven years. Jacob did this, but Laban then said he would give him his elder daughter Leah, and he must serve seven years more for Rachel. 
In those days men could have several wives. At the end of another seven years Jacob won Rachel, and he always loved her best. Leah had six sons, and Rachel only two, Joseph and Benjamin. And these two Jacob loved best for their mother's sake. After the birth of Joseph, Jacob took his wives and children and all his possessions and went back again into the land of Canaan. Here his sons grew up, and Jacob always loved Joseph best. He loved to dress him in beautiful clothes, and he gave him a wonderful coat made of different colored stuffs. Joseph had eleven brothers altogether. Some of them were jealous of Joseph and wanted to kill him. One day, when they were far away from home looking after their father's sheep, Jacob sent Joseph with a message to them. But they took his beautiful coat from him and sold him to some merchants who were traveling into the land of Egypt. Then they dipped his coat in the blood of a kid which they had killed and sent it to their father. Jacob was broken hearted, for he thought that a wild beast had killed and eaten Joseph, and that it was his blood which stained the coat. But Joseph was sold in Egypt and became a servant to Potiphar, a captain in the palace of the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh at this time was probably one of the Semitic conquerors of Egypt, and so was friendly towards other Semites. Joseph had many strange adventures in Egypt. At one time he was shut up in prison through the wickedness of Potiphar's wife, who told her husband that Joseph had done wrong things which he had never done. While he was in prison, he was able to tell some of the other prisoners the meaning of some strange dreams they had had. Then the Pharaoh had a dream which troubled him, and which none of the wise men in Egypt could explain to him. Pharaoh was told of this servant in prison who could tell the meaning of dreams. So Joseph was sent for to go before the Pharaoh and hear the dreams. Joseph in Egypt The Pharaoh had dreamed that he stood upon the bank of a river, and out of the river came seven beautiful fat cows and began to feed on the banks. Then again came seven thin, ugly cows, and they ate the fat cows up, but did not look any fatter themselves. Then the Pharaoh woke up and fell asleep again and dreamed another dream. In this dream he saw a stalk of corn with seven full ears of grain on it, but beside these were seven small ears which spoiled the others. Then Joseph told the Pharaoh that the dreams meant that there would be seven years of plenty in Egypt, but that they would be followed by seven years of famine. He advised the Pharaoh to choose a wise man to rule over the land for him, and to store up corn in great barns during the years of plenty, so that there should be food for the people in the seven years of famine. The Pharaoh was so pleased with Joseph that he said he should be the ruler. He took a ring from his own hand and put it on Joseph's finger and dressed him in a beautiful robe of silk with a gold chain round his neck. And so Joseph was the greatest man in Egypt after the Pharaoh. During the seven years of plenty he stored up corn and barns, and then came the seven years of famine, and he gave the corn out to feed the hungry people. But the famine spread over the land of Canaan too. And Jacob, hearing that there was corn in Egypt, set his sons to see if they could buy some. They went to Joseph, who knew them at once, though they did not know him. He was so overcome at the sight of them and the memory of his father that he turned away and cried. All the brothers had come except Benjamin. And Joseph gave them corn and put their money back again in the top of their sacks. 
but he said they must come again and bring their brother benjamin for he longed to see him as he was his brother by the same mother to make quite sure he kept one of the brothers simeon saying he would not set him free until benjamin should come so the brothers went sadly back to their father for they knew it would be a great sorrow to him to let benjamin leave him jacob was indeed sad when he heard that simeon was left behind in egypt but he declared he could never let benjamin go but soon the corn they had brought was eaten and the brothers reminded their father that they could only get more if they took benjamin to the governor of egypt who was so strangely interested in him reuben one of the brothers who had tried to save joseph when the others wanted to kill him promised that whatever happened he would bring benjamin safely back so they went again into egypt and joseph received them with great kindness though he had to leave them for a time to hide his tears so overcome was he at the sight of his brother benjamin he again filled their sacks with corn but told his servants to put a silver cup into benjamin's sack the sacks were placed upon the camel's backs and the brothers started for home but when they had gone part of the way joseph sent servants after them to bring them back saying they had stolen his silver cup the brothers were indignant and so sure of their own honesty that they said they would leave behind as slave to joseph the one in whose sack the cup should be found the sacks were emptied and the cup found in benjamin's sack then joseph told the other brothers that they could go home but he would keep benjamin they fell on the ground and told him that they would rather all stay as slaves than face their father without the son he loved best then joseph could no longer keep his secret but sent everyone else away and then told his brothers that he was joseph whom they had sold into egypt at first they were afraid but he told them not to fear and kissed them all especially benjamin then he sent them to bring his father to see him and jacob full of joy came with all his tribe and everything he had and settled down in the land of egypt and here the israelites as his people were called lived for many years until long after jacob and joseph and all his brothers were dead and many pharaohs too had ruled and died the story of moses the israelites became so strong and there were so many of them that the new pharaoh who was probably an egyptian and not a semite was afraid that they would become stronger than the egyptians themselves so he ordered that they should do all the hardest work building cities for him and making bricks but still the israelites grew strong and there were more and more of them then the pharaoh said that every baby boy born to the hebrews as the egyptians called them should be killed he thought that through this there would be none among them to grow up to be men and so the hebrew people would be destroyed but some of the mothers managed to hide their babies and keep them safe there was one woman who hid her baby until he was three months old and then when she found she could not do so any longer she put him in a basket and laid him on the banks of the river nile among the bulrushes she left him there and his elder sister stood a little way off to see what would happen to him just then an egyptian princess the daughter of the pharaoh came down to the river to bathe she saw the basket and sent one of her maids to bring it to her when the princess saw the baby lying inside it crying she felt very sorry for it and said she would adopt it as her own then the baby's sister came and offered to find a nurse for the child she brought her mother 
and the princess gave her the baby to take care of until it was grown up. She called him Moses, and when he was grown up to be a young man, he was taken to live at the palace. But he always remembered that he was a Hebrew, and he longed to save his people, who were still cruelly treated by the Egyptians. At last Moses begged the Pharaoh to allow him to lead his people out of the land of Egypt into Canaan again. But the Pharaoh would not. Then all sorts of trouble fell on the Egyptians, and at last, fearing that God was angry with him because he would not let the Hebrews go, the Pharaoh said they might go, as they had asked, to sacrifice to God in the desert. But the Hebrews went forth at night out of the land of Egypt, never to enter it again. They were led by Moses and his brother Aaron, who was a priest, and they started on the journey through the desert to the land of Canaan, which they called the Promised Land. It was forty years after all before they reached it, and during all those years of wandering in the desert they had many strange adventures. Sometimes they would grumble against God and wish themselves back in Egypt. Sometimes they set up idols and worshipped them. This made Moses very angry and very sad. Once, while he was away on a mountain praying, the faithless people made an image of a calf out of brass and fell down and adored it. Moses was so angry when he came back that he smashed the calf to pieces and ground it to powder. Then he sprinkled it in water and made the people drink it as a punishment. THE TEN COMMANDMENTS It was while he was on the mountain praying that Moses was inspired to write down on tablets of stone the Ten Commandments, which have been handed down from generation to generation for good people to keep, even to our own day. Moses never entered the Promised Land, but died within sight of it. The Israelites settled down in it, and at first shared it with other strange tribes, but gradually won it for themselves. Many wonderful stories are told in the Bible of the battles with the other tribes, and the brave men like Gideon and Samson who helped to win the whole land of Canaan for the Jews. Soon the Jews stopped wandering about with large flocks and herds and instead became an agricultural people and cultivated the land. They learned many things from the tribes round about and became more and more civilized. In time, they chose a king for themselves. Picture Caption A portrait carved in stone by an Egyptian of a king of Israel from a bas-relief at Karnak, said to be a portrait of Rehoboam. End caption. Their first king was Saul, a handsome man, taller than any of the people. He was a great fighter. While Saul was still alive, there was a young boy called David, who killed a giant called Goliath, and many other enemies of the people, so that the people sang, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands, which made Saul very jealous. He tried to kill David, but Saul's son Jonathan loved David more than a brother and helped to save him from the anger of the king. David became king after Saul, and Jonathan was content that it should be so. David did many wrong things, but he was always very sorry for them afterwards. He loved God very much, and many of the Psalms, the beautiful hymns in the Bible, are said to have been written by David. The Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. After David, his son Solomon became king. The Jews were by this time a great people. They had conquered their enemies, and Solomon was a man of peace. It was he who built the wonderful temple at Jerusalem. 
it was built of cedar wood and overlaid with pure gold and carved with wonderful statues and tracery solomon had had the cedar wood and many of the other things which he used for the temple brought from phoenicia a land which lay on the coast of north of canaan hiram king of tyre one of the chief towns of phoenicia was a great friend both of david and solomon picture caption ships of the king of tyre in the arabian gulf from an assyrian stone carving made about two thousand five hundred years ago End caption. The Phoenicians were Semites too, and a very rich people. They were the first people we know of who made boats for themselves and sailed away across the sea to strange lands. In the days of Hiram the Phoenicians had learned to build quite big ships. At first they had only known how to build little rough boats, and had sailed carefully along the coast of Canaan from place to place, carrying their precious woods to other people, and carrying back in exchange corn and oil and things which did not grow in their own land. Later, when new tribes like the Israelites poured into the land of Canaan, the Phoenicians pushed nearer and nearer to the coast, and began to depend more and more on their trade with other lands. Gradually they ventured away from the coast across to the island of Cyprus, which they could see in the distance, and then gradually they sailed right through the Mediterranean Sea, touching at the coasts of North Africa and Spain into what is now the english channel and from the south of britain they carried back beautiful pearls to their own land when solomon saw how rich and great the phoenicians had become through their trade he built himself a fleet of ships and hiram lent him men to build them when they were made hiram sent sailors to teach the israelites how to manage them and so Phoenicians and Israelites together sailed through the Red Sea to Arabia, and on to India, and from the wonderful east they brought back gold and silver and all kinds of precious things. The reign of Solomon was the time during which the Israelites were richest and greatest. After his death the northern tribes broke away from the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, who lived in the south of Canaan. The north had one king and the south another, and in time they became separate peoples. The northern tribes mixed with other peoples in the land of Canaan, and together they became known as the Samaritans, whom we read of in the life of our Lord. The tribes of Judah and Benjamin, with their capital and glorious temple at Jerusalem, did not mingle with the other peoples, but remained a race apart, and to them the name of Jews was left. They did not long remain an independent people. Before long Assyria conquered nearly all the land of Asia round the rivers Tigris and Euphrates and westward to the sea. The Jews fought hard against the Assyrian king, Sennacherib, and the Egyptians helped them. We read in the Bible how they were saved for a time, for a plague fell upon the Assyrians. But a hundred years later the Jews were carried captive into Babylonia, and kept there for seventy years, for the Assyrians and Babylonians often carried off whole nations whom they had conquered in this way. The ruler of Assyria at this time was Nebuchadnezzar. He was a great soldier, but he was also a great builder. He had made for him the hanging gardens of Babylon, which were one of the seven wonders of the world. Seventy-five arches were built, one on top of another, and at the top of all were gardens of trees and flowers. 
nebuchadnezzar was a great builder of walls and temples too and many of these have been dug out and golden figures of gods and gold tables and ornaments have been found the jews were very unhappy in babylon as we read in the bible but at last they were allowed to go back to their own land picture caption jews bewailing the captivity at the old wall of solomon's temple end caption during all this time the jews often forgot the worship of the one god and the observance of the law of moses and fell into idolatry and all the wickedness of the people round about them but they never quite forgot and though they never again became a great people it was from them that the great new religion of christianity was in time to spread over the world meanwhile the jews were subject to the new races which one after another raised great conquering kingdoms in europe or asia or in both end of chapter two read by lisa marie duffield of duffield discovery dot org on may sixth two thousand twenty one chapter three of the story of the world a simple history for boys and girls this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by christine rucker the story of the world a simple history for boys and girls by elizabeth o'neill chapter three the greeks gradually the interest of early history moves from western asia and northern africa where the two great early civilizations grew up into eastern europe and we begin to read about people who seem much more like ourselves this is partly because they belong to the great race of which the english are one branch viz the Aryan race, which rolled in over Europe and almost swamped the earlier peoples already on the land. The Aryan race invaded the north of India, too, and became the chief people there, as we know from the language still spoken in the north of India. It sounds very different from our own language, but it is quite plainly derived, like it, from the speech used by all the Aryan race before it was dispersed all over the world. Another great branch of the Aryan race was the Persian people, who swooped down upon the lands around the Tigris, the twin river to the Euphrates, and founded a great kingdom there, and then gradually conquered the whole of Western Asia and Egypt. The Persians, however, did not bring new ways into the lands they seized, but were content to learn from the people they conquered. So people went on building and teaching and doing most things in much the same way as they had done before the Persians came. But in the east of Europe, there rose up a great people belonging to the Aryan race who developed a very wonderful civilization of their own. These were the Greeks or the Hellenes, as they were called at that time. While the Jews had been wandering from Mesopotamia into the Promised Land, these people had been pouring from the north into that land which we now call the Balkan Peninsula, and into the islands round about it. The Greek were very wonderful people, clever and beautiful, full of curiosity about men and things. When we first hear about them, they were already quite civilized. They lived in towns and built beautiful houses, and very early, too, they loved and made poetry. The first great poetry that the Greeks made was said to be written by a blind poet called Homer, but scholars now think that the Homeric poems were written by many men and handed down from one generation to another. They tell of the early days of Greece, and with some history is mixed much that is legend or mere story. These stories are interesting in themselves and because they show us what the early Greeks thought was great and good. But the stories of Ulysses, of Jason and the Golden Fleece, of Fair Helen and the Great Wooden Horse, in which the Greek soldiers hid themselves, and so got within the walls of Troy, should be read merely as stories. Later the Greeks wrote plays and poems as great as any which have ever been written. 
Indeed, it is through Greece that the other countries of Europe have learned many of the best things they know. The climate of Greece was so soft and mild, and the country so beautiful, that the people were able to live very much out of doors. They were very healthy and happy, and they loved beautiful things. The Greeks tried to bring up all their children to be strong and beautiful, and most of them were so. Being used to seeing only beautiful people, their artists and sculptors painted and modeled very fine figures, and some of the statues carved by these old Greek artists remain today among the world's greatest treasures. The Greeks were very proud of their country and their people. To them, the rest of the world were barbarians or uncivilized. Their patriotism was fired by the religious festivals in which all the Greeks united to do honor to their gods. At first, each Greek clan or tribe worshipped together. Each kindled and kept alight a sacred fire in honor of the gods. Never must the fire be allowed to go out under peril of great disaster through the anger of the gods. No barbarian stranger might bring fuel to the fire. The care of it was a sacred trust. As time went on, some shrines became more famous than others, and to the great temples their Greeks from all parts of Greece would go in great numbers. At Delos there was a great shrine, and a still more famous one at Olympia, a beautiful plain in southwestern Greece, surrounded by mountains and forming a kind of natural theater. Here, every fourth year, the Olympic Games were held in honor of Zeus, the greatest of the gods honored by the Greeks. At the Olympic Games, the best runners from all parts of Greece ran races. Rich men brought their chariots and competed in racing too. Poets brought their offerings and hymns written and sung in honor of the gods. The victors of each contest, those whom the judge thought the best, were crowned before all the people with wreaths of wild olive, while the name of their fathers and the districts from which they came were cried aloud so that the people might do them honor. Yet though the Greeks could thus unite for worship and patriotism, they were not all joined together in one kingdom like the English or the French today. Each town with the country round it had at first its own government, this was chiefly because the land was broken up by deep bays on the coast and by mountain ranges inland, and it was difficult for the people in one part of the country to travel to another part. So there were many states such as Corinth, Delos, and Thebes, and more famous still than these, Sparta and Athens. For a time after the Greek people had settled down, each state had its king. The first king would probably be the bravest soldier who had led the people to victory in war. But when he died, his son would become king, and then his grandson. And in time, some of the kings were not brave men at all, and nearly everywhere in Greece, the people said they would not have kings any longer, but chose several of the greatest men in the land to rule them instead. Government by a few great men was called by the Greeks an aristocracy. Generally, in time, the states grew tired of the aristocracies, too, if they became proud and selfish, and in most Greek states, some one man seized power again. He was not a king, but was called a tyrant, which did not mean a cruel and selfish person as it does now. Soon again, in nearly every Greek state, the tyrants were overthrown, and some states chose once more to be governed by an aristocracy. Sparta chose thus, and was so governed as long as she remained a state. But some of the states declared that all the people should have a share in the government, and these were called democracies. The greatest of these was the state of Athens, whose people were perhaps the bravest and most beautiful, and certainly the cleverest in the whole of Greece. Athens was the most beautiful of all the Greek city-states, Every one of its people was educated, and every man had a vote and took a direct part in the government. The state was so small that all the men could meet together to choose their leader. It was a very vivid, eager life which the Athenians led, all keenly interested in politics, in philosophy, and in artistic things. 
In Athens, every Greek had time and opportunity to hear beautiful poetry, to see good plays acted in theaters open to the air. All took an interest in the building of temples and in the beautiful statues made to adorn them. Perhaps no nation in history has ever had so fine a people, so little poverty, and so much education. But it must be remembered that in Athens, as everywhere in Greece, there were many slaves who did the hardest work and so made possible the brighter lives of their masters. The Greek democracy was not like the modern democracy, which most people think is the best form of government. The Greeks did not consider the welfare of all the people, and in modern nations, where all are free, the problem of making all happy and comfortable is more difficult. The Spartans Sparta, the other great city-state in the south of Greece, was not a democracy, but remained an aristocracy. Its people were sterner and not so bright, perhaps, as the Athenians. They believed that every man should be a soldier, and every boy was taken from his mother when he was seven years old and brought up with other boys and taught how to fight. A Spartan boy would never cry whatever happened. He never thought about being warm and comfortable, but wore the same clothes summer and winter and cared only to be strong and brave. This was the ideal of the Spartans, the thing that they lived for. The women felt just the same as the men about it, and the mothers gave up their boys willingly for the sake of the state. The girls shared the games and races with the boys and grew up strong and brave women. A mother would much rather that her son should die in battle than give in. Return with your shield or upon it, she would say as her son went forth to battle. Besides the Greeks in the Balkan Peninsula and in the islands round about it, there were others who had gone forth across the sea and built cities on the coast west of the land now called Asia Minor. Since the Phoenicians had led the way, men knew much more about ships and how to sail the seas safely, and some of the more adventurous Greeks had sailed westward and set up towns in Sicily and in the south of Italy. Some of these were very rich and beautiful. The towns on the coast of Asia Minor, too, flourished and grew rich and were full of beautiful temples, for the Greeks during many hundreds of years worshipped many gods. It was a long time before their cleverest of men realized that there could be only one god, and then the people were very angry with them for saying so. Meanwhile, they built their temples to Apollo, the god of beauty, or to Diana, the goddess, whom they pictured as a huntress, young, brave, and noble, armed with a bow and arrow, and fluttering graceful garments short to the knees. There was one famous temple of Diana at Ephesus, one of the chief Greek towns in Asia Minor. We read in the Bible how in later days St. Paul tried to teach the Ephesians about our Lord and how they clung to the worship of their goddess. But long before this, a great danger had threatened Ephesus and the other Greek settlements in Asia Minor, a danger which threatened Greece, too, and which was so great that in the end the Greeks joined together to resist it. The Persians For hundreds of years, the Greek towns in Asia Minor, like those at home in Greece and the colonies in Sicily and the south of Italy, were prosperous and free but at length they fell under the power of the Lydians, a people who possessed the land near. The Lydian king, Croesus had conquered most of Asia Minor and had demanded tribute of the Greek cities there. Croesus was wonderfully powerful and rich, but he fell in his turn before the Persian power, which had now spread westward over Babylonia and on to the very coast when last of all the Greek cities there were attacked by this great barbaric power, they sent distressful messages to their kinsmen in Greece proper, and Athens determined to send them help. This decision of the Athenian people is one of the turning points in the world's history. If Athens had not fought against Persia and won, the Persian power might have spread from Asia to Europe, and the whole history of the world would have been changed. 
The Persians belonged to the Aryan people, but they were quite unlike the Aryan people in Europe. They were brave men, but they had no idea of freedom, which was the ideal of the Greeks. With the Persians, as with most Eastern people before and since, the will of the king was the supreme law. On his word depended life and death. The greatest nobles bowed before him, as though he had been a god. His court was full of beautiful things, and life seemed gay and brilliant. But there was a sense of uneasiness, for under a cruel or capricious king, no man could feel that even his life was safe. Stories told of the cruelty of one of these early kings. A nobleman had offended him, but the king pretended to forgive him and invited him to a feast. At the end of the meal, the king asked him what he thought of the food, and when he had been assured that it was excellent, the king called for a basket and showed it to his guest. In it were the head, hands, and feet of the nobleman's own child, and the king maliciously told him that the food that he had eaten was his child's body. The poor people were very poor and often unhappy. Women were hardly thought of as human beings, and children could be sold by their parents as slaves. The great king could lead great armies to battle, but the soldiers did not feel that they were fighting for their fatherlands. They won because of their great numbers, and because they were often fighting men very like themselves. But things turned out very differently when the Persians found themselves fighting with the Greeks, men who loved freedom and beauty and goodness, men who were full of pride in their people and respect for themselves. When Croesus was conquered by the Persian king, Cyrus, the Greek cities had been forced to give in to him too. Instead of the mere tribute that they had paid to Croesus, they were placed under Persian governors and treated as a conquered people. One town, Miletus, was allowed some sort of independence, but even there the people never felt really safe. The tyrant of Miletus had been carried off into honorable captivity with the Persian king, but had left his son-in-law, Aristagoras, to govern Miletus. The rulers of the other cities had become mere servants of Persia, and so the people determined to get rid of them and set up democratic governments. This they did. Aristagoras took the lead in the movement, gave up his power into the hands of the people, and when, in the year 500 BC, the Greek cities of Asia Minor announced that they would no longer live under Persian rule, it was Aristagoras who went over to Greece proper to ask help of the Greeks there for their kinsmen over the sea. He first went to Sparta and told them first of the sad state of the Greeks in Asia Minor, and then of the riches of the Persians. It would be easy, he said, to conquer the Persians, barbarians who wore trousers and turbans, and then all the wealth of Persia would be theirs. But the Spartans refused to go. Then Aristagoras went on to Athens and again told his tale. The Athenians had but lately got rid of their tyrants. They were full of spirits and courage. Aristagoras reminded them that Miletus, the chief town suffering under the Persians, had been founded by people from Athens. The Athenians determined to give them help and sent 20 ships across the seas. The Lydian town of Sardis was accidentally burnt, and the Athenians, without giving further help, went back to their ships and so home. It was afterwards said that the new Persian king, Darius, was so angry with the Athenians that he told one of his servants to remind him before every meal of the vengeance he was to take on them. But it was eleven years before Darius tried to revenge himself on the Athenians. Meanwhile, he turned his anger against Miletus and the other rebel cities. Miletus was taken and many of its men were killed. The others were sent with the women and children to a town far away on the river Tigris and there had to live out their lives as exiles far from home and country. The other rebellious cities were badly treated too and then after 11 years Darius turned to take vengeance on the Athenians who had dared to defy him. 
He sent messengers to Greece asking the states to send him earth and water as a sign that they would consent to live under the yoke of the great king, as he called himself. The Battle of Marathon. Some of the states did so, but Athens and Sparta proudly refused, and it is said that Sparta threw the Persian messengers into a pit and told them to find earth and water for themselves there. In the same year, 490 BC, Darius prepared a great fleet of ships, filled them with soldiers, and sent them against the Athenians. Thousands and thousands of them, clothed in mail, poured from the ships into the plain of Marathon, which was 20 miles from Athens, and belonged to it. The Athenians sent for help to Sparta but were told that no help could be sent until after a religious festival, which was still some days off. The Spartans were never ready to join with the Athenians, for the two states were very jealous of each other. It is said that Phaeopides, the runner chosen to carry the message to Sparta, ran all the way in two days. The distance was 150 miles. When he came back, the Athenians stood on the mountains looking down upon the plain of Marathon, and the generals consulted together as to what should be done. Miltiades, one of the generals, advised an immediate attack, and the others gave up their power to him, and he arranged the battle according to his will. The Athenians, by his orders, plunged down from the mountains on to the Persian army in the plain. There were five times as many Persians as Greeks, but the shock was so great and the Athenians fought so well that the great awkward army of men, who had no knowledge of what freedom meant, were driven into the sea and back to their ships by the splendid Greek soldiers. The Greeks clung on to the Persian ships, meaning to set fire to them, but the Persians slashed savagely at them. The brother of Achilles the great poet and writer of plays, who also fought at Marathon, had his hands cut off as he clung to a ship, and then he held on by his teeth. All but seven ships got away. The Persians sailed round to attack the harbor of Athens next morning, but the Greek soldiers, weary as they were from the battle, marched to meet them, and when the Persians saw the men who had just conquered them draw up again to face them, they gave up the attack and sailed away in disgust. So Athens saved Greece, and probably Europe, for Darius, if he had conquered Greece, might have spread his empire over the whole of Europe, and the ideas of freedom and art and beauty which the Greeks taught the world might have been lost. The Athenians built a great monument on the plain of Marathon to commemorate their victory and they made the men of the little town of Plataea citizens of Athens. Plataea alone of the Greek states had helped the Athenians, and the thousand men whom they had sent were among the bravest and best fighters in the great battle. Miltiades, the victorious general, soon fell into disgrace. He asked the Athenians to fit out for him a fleet of ships, but begged them to allow him to keep as a secret the purpose for which he wanted them promising to bring a great deal of money back. Then he sailed away to fight an enemy of his own who lived in Paros, an island near. He was not able to take the city and sailed back again to Athens without having done anything and without the money he had promised. The Athenians were very angry, and Miltiades would have been put to death, but for the memory of his courage and cleverness at Marathon. He was ordered to pay a fine of a large sum of money, but died before he had time to do so. Some people have blamed the Athenians for having been so severe against a man who had done so much for them, and they have said that people governed as democracies are always changeable. Still, Miltiades had no right to use his country's money to take revenge on his own enemies. Yet the Athenians were perhaps a little changeable, for they showed it in their treatment of others. The two chief men in Athens after Marathon were Themistocles and Aristides. Themistocles was anxious that the Athenians should build a fleet and so be able to fight on sea as well as on land, while Aristides would have preferred a policy of peace. In the end, Themistocles got his way, and Aristides was banished. 
for the Athenians had a custom of sending troublesome politicians into exile so that they should not hamper the rulers at home. When the votes were being given as to whether Aristides should go or stay, one man at least was said to have voted against him because he was tired of hearing him called Aristides the Just. Aristides was not long away, for Persia soon threatened again, and Athens was glad to call back all the exiles who had been sent away after Marathon. The Persian Invasion of Greece Darius went back to Persia, determined to prepare a monster invasion of Greece, and so take his revenge, but he died before he had time to carry it out, and the work was left for his son Xerxes, who became king after him. Xerxes invaded Greece in the year 480 BC. He had endless resources at his disposal in men and money. Fearing the stormy sea round the cape of Mount Athos, which his fleet would have to pass on its way to the Greek peninsula, he ordered great gangs of men to cut a deep channel through it, so that two ships could easily sail through side by side. Then he ordered bridges of boats to be made across the Hellespont, and in the towns all along the way by which his army would have to go, he stored great quantities of food. He meant to avoid all risk. The first bridge broke because the ropes were not strong enough, and Xerxes ordered that the men who had built it should be beheaded. In his mad anger, he ordered, too, that the water of the Hellespont should be whipped with rods, receiving three hundred lashes for its defiance of the great king. Then the bridges were built again with stronger bonds, and in a fit of repentance or amiability, Xerxes poured wine from a golden bowl into the Hellespont, and then flung the cup and a golden bowl and a sword into the water at sunrise of the day when he was at length ready to lead his great unwieldy army into Greece. The baggage with the camels and horses crossed on one bridge and the soldiers on the other. The first to cross were 10,000 Persians, the flower of the army, brave strong men accustomed to conquer. Behind them went the sacred horses and a chariot, empty in honor of the gods, and Xerxes himself drove after. Behind him straggled an enormous host, to the number of at least a million men, drawn from the peoples conquered by the Persians, and with no heart for the fight. So great was the crowd that the two bridges were filled with men and animals crossing over during the seven days and seven nights. It is said that one old man who had sent four sons to the army begged that the fifth might stay home. But Xerxes, instead of granting the favor, ordered that the boy should be killed and the pieces of his body placed on both sides of the bridge as a warning to others who might wish to hang back. Any who were slow to cross were freely lashed with whips. Xerxes could not realize that fear will never lead an army to victory. When the Greeks had seen the danger threatening from Persia, some of the states had been very anxious that the whole of Greece should join to resist it. A congress of the states was called to meet at the Isthmus of Corinth. The part of Greece south of the Isthmus was called the Peloponnesus and here Sparta was the chief state, and had great power over the others. So nearly all the Peloponnesians naturally joined with Sparta, though Argos, a Peloponnesian town, held aloof, declaring she would rather be ruled by the Persians than help Sparta, whom she hated. In the end, very few of the states north of the Isthmus of Corinth joined in the defense. There was, of course, Athens, and the people of Phocis, and the faithful little town of Plataea and Thespia, another town near. But most of the northern Greeks held aloof, and some hastened to send earth and water to the great king. Themistocles had his fleet ready, and was longing for a good sea fight. But as Sparta was the chief state in all Greece for the moment, the chief command was given to them both by land and sea. The Story of Thermopylae As ranges of mountains stretch across the north of Greece, the Greeks knew that the Persian army must come through mountain passes. They decided to make a stand at the Pass of Thermopylae, for if the Persians could get through that, there would be nothing to stop them until they reached the Isthmus of Corinth. 
A band of men were therefore set under the Spartan king Leonidas to guard the pass. More Spartans were to be sent later when a feast should be over. The Spartans would never let anything interfere with their sacred feasts. However, Leonidas knew that a few men could hold the pass easily against even the immense army of Xerxes. But unfortunately, a treacherous Greek went to Xerxes and told him that to the west of the pass of Thermopylae was a path over a mountain which could not easily be defended. Leonidas had placed some Phocians there, but when they saw vast numbers of Persians advancing, they turned and fled. News came to Leonidas that the Persians were advancing, and he knew that there was no hope for those who should remain to guard the pass now that it would be attacked from both ends. So he told his army that those who wished might go away, but that he himself would stay and die fighting the enemy. 300 Spartan soldiers with their slaves and 700 others chose to stay, only about a thousand men in all. The Spartans were never afraid, not even of death, and they spent their time making elaborate toilette, combing out their thick hair, which they wore long, putting on dresses of bright scarlet, and polishing their weapons, so that they might face death with every sign of joy. As the Persians poured into the plain south of the pass, Leonidas told his men to fight their way out of the northern end, and there he and his little band died fighting desperately, killing far more Persians than their own numbers. The Persians were astounded at such courage, and angry too that so many of their own men were killed by a mere handful of Greeks. Two brothers of the great king himself were among the dead, Later, the Greeks built monuments on the spot where the heroes of Thermopylae had fought, and chief among them was a marble lion to honor the memory of Leonidas. In spite of the heroism of Leonidas and his Spartans, all Greece, as far as the Isthmus of Corinth, now lay open to the Persians, and as they marched south, the states gave in their allegiance. Plataea and Thespia were beaten down to the ground and the Athenians, seeing that there was no hope for them, took refuge on the fleet and were carried off to Salamis and other places of safety. One of the oracles had advised them to trust to a wooden wall, and this they thought meant their wooden boats. But a few men remained behind in the Acropolis, the hill center of the town, which could not be entered when the gates were shut, except at one side. Across this side, the Athenians who remained placed great beams of wood to form a kind of wall, hoping thus to fulfill the words of the oracle and take shelter behind the wooden wall. When the Persians advanced to attack them, they threw great stones down on their heads. But it was of no use, for the Persians broke through the barrier, killed the Greeks, and practically destroyed Athens. Thus the fate of the Greeks on land was sad enough, in spite of their great courage but there was still the fleet in which Themistocles had put so much trust. The Persian fleet off the coast of Thermopylae had suffered much from storms, and in a fight they had with the Greeks, though the Greeks lost some ships, the Persians lost more. When the news came of the destruction of Athens, the Greek fleet was at Salamis. Themistocles could not persuade the leaders to sail forth and attack the Persians. One of the generals said to Themistocles, O oh, Themistocles, those who stand up in the games soon are whipped, referring to a rule in the Greek games. But Themistocles answered, Yes, but those who start late are not crowned. At length, Themistocles had recourse to a trick. He sent word to the Persians that the Greek fleet was very frightened and was going to sail away. The Persians then thought it would be best to attack the Greeks before they could escape, and one morning the Greek fleet found the whole Persian fleet drawn up to the east, ready to fight. The Greeks then showed that they could fight on sea as well as on land, in spite of their hesitation. They dashed in and broke the front line of the Persian ships, and drove the two back lines in confusion upon each other. On sea, as on land, the Persian forces were too awkward and unwieldy. There was really not room for so many ships. The battle became fast and furious. 
When a Persian ship was sunk, the men were drowned, for few of them could swim, while many Greeks, even from ships which were destroyed, saved themselves by swimming to the shore. Xerxes had one ally who was a woman, Queen Artemisia of Helicarnassus in Caria. The Greeks had promised a prize to whomsoever should capture her, but when a Greek ship was chasing her, she willfully sank a Persian ship which came in her way. The Greek captain seeing this and not knowing it was Artemisia's ship gave up the chase, thinking that she had deserted from the Persians. Xerxes sat on a great white marble throne on the shore and watched the battle. Even at the end, the Persians had twice as many ships as the Greeks, but so many men and ships had been destroyed that they had no longer any heart for the fight. Orders were given that the fleet should sail away, and Xerxes himself, sick at heart with disappointment, collected what remained of his vast army and crossed the Hellespont in haste, lest the Greek fleet should come to stop him. 300,000 Persians remained in Greece under the general Mardonius to make one more attempt in the next year at the conquest of this small country, which had thus defied the giant armies of the great king. Xerxes met with endless misfortunes on the journey home. The bridges across the Hellespont broke. The ice gave way on a frozen river as the army crossed it. Provisions ran short and disease broke out. Men and animals died in thousands. Mardonius spent the winter in Thessaly and in the spring started again towards Athens. Once more the Athenians withdrew to Salamis and their city was again ravaged by the enemy. The Athenians sent indignant messages to the Spartans, who had again failed to help them, because their religious festivals held them back. Meanwhile, they had built a strong wall across the Isthmus of Corinth. It is said that someone pointed out to them that the Athenians might in the end join the Persians against Sparta, and that their strong wall would be of little use if the Athenians, with their magnificent fleet, attacked them by sea. At last, the Spartans sent an army to join the Athenians, and Mardonius withdrew north to Boeotia, which was better country for his cavalry to fight in. Help from the other Greek states now poured in, and Mardonius, anxious to break up the Greek army, sent Massistios, the commander second to himself, to attack Megara. The Athenians detached themselves from the general army and went to their aid. Masistios was a handsome man and almost a giant in height. He wore a suit of golden mail and over it a tunic of crimson. His white horse was shot under him, and though his mail resisted all arrows for a time, he was at last shot through the eye and killed. The Athenians won the victory, and the body of Masistios was carried in triumph along the lines of the Greek army that all might see it. Mardonius waited several days before he ventured to attack the Greeks, and then one day, when the Spartans were making a change in their position, he led his army against them alone. The Athenians were surrounded by the Greeks, who were helping the Persians, and so the Spartans fought the famous Battle of Plataea, practically alone against the Persians. The splendid Persian cavalry tried to break the solid mass of Spartan ranks, but failed. The heavily armed and mailed foot soldiers of Sparta broke down the hedge of shields, behind which the light-armed foot soldiers of the Persian army stood, and though it was a hard-fought battle and the Persians were overwhelmingly greater in numbers than the Spartans, the splendid discipline of the Greeks won the day. Mardonius himself was killed, and the Persians fell back to their camp. Here another struggle took place, but the Athenians now came up to the help of the Spartans, and the Greek victory was complete. All the precious vessels of gold and silver, which Xerxes had been too hurried to take away, and so had left to his officers, now fell to the Greeks, and in some degree repaid them for the immense expenses of war. It is said that only 3,000 Persians were left alive out of the 300,000 of Mardonius' great army, while in all only 160 Greeks died on the field. 
On the afternoon of the day in which the Battle of Plataea was fought in the morning, the Greeks won another great victory over the Persians at Mysale in Asia Minor. Here it was the Athenians who played the chief part, going to the help of the Greek cities in Asia Minor, who were still under the hated rule of the great king. Persian admiral drew up his boats on the shore, but the Athenians followed, landed, and fought against them on land, and won a great victory. Not only were the Persians driven out of Greece proper, and Europe saved from an invasion by an eastern people, but the Greeks in Asia Minor were freed from their rule, and soon they were to be followed into their own strongholds, and the magnificence of the great king was to be a thing of the past. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Chapter 4 The Athens of Pericles and Socrates Athens had very nobly allowed the Spartans to take the lead in the great struggle with Persia, but once the danger was past, the old jealousy between the two states broke out again. Pausanias, the Spartan leader, who had fought so bravely and won so glorious a victory at Plataea, soon proved himself unworthy of the position he held and Athens took advantage of this to place an Athenian at the head of her fleet. Pausanias was found to be writing to the Persians and even planning to give Greece up into the power of the great king, if he himself should be allowed to marry the king's daughter, and if all sorts of riches were showered upon him. When the Spartans sent messages to the Persians through Pausanias, it was noticed that no answer ever came, and so a slave who was given a letter to take opened it to see what it said. He found that it merely told the Persians to kill the messenger himself. The slave took the letter to the judges at Sparta, and Pausanias, who had already been called back to Sparta, was condemned to death. He fled for shelter to the temple of Athene, and as it was not considered right to kill a man in so holy a place, or even violently to drag him forth, the Spartans ordered that the doors of the temple should be blocked up and the roof taken off, so that Pausanias soon died a miserable death through cold and hunger. Meanwhile, the Athenians had built very strong walls round their city, and round their port at the Piraeus. Now, with such strong walls and their mighty fleet, they had no need to fear anybody, and the Spartans were surprised and angry to find that the new leader they sent to Athens in place of Pausanias was sent back with the message that the Athenians had chosen a leader of their own. After this there was a terrible enmity between Sparta and Athens. Athens was now quite equal in wealth and importance to Sparta, and she took steps to make herself still richer and more powerful. She kept up an immense navy, and many of the islands in the Aegean Sea, Thrace and some of the Greek colonies in Asia Minor, joined in a league with Athens. They were all to send ships and sailors, and all to defend each other against any enemy. The league was called the Confederacy of Delos, and all the money belonging to it was kept at the Temple of Apollo at Delos, and each state sent men there to worship the god. But in time Athens often allowed the other states to send money instead of ships, and after a while she forgot that the other states had joined her of their own free will, and she began to think herself the chief state of a sort of empire, with the other states paying tribute to her. In the end this was very bad for Athens, for it made the other states angry and ready to help her enemies against her. But this was not for a long time yet, 
and for many years Athens grew richer and richer. She kept up an immense navy, but there was more money than was needed for that, and some of this was spent on raising beautiful buildings in Athens and making life very easy for her people. Even the men who met in their parliament to rule the state were paid for their time and trouble. The Athenians became great traders and sent their merchant ships to all parts of Greece. Gold and silver were quite common. But the Athenians were not like the Persians, who wasted their wealth on mere splendor and show. Nor had they any sympathy with the Spartans, who, however rich they might be, would never change from their plain, hard way of living. The Athenians loved beautiful things, and they spent their money in making their city perfect, and in giving joy and pleasure to all the citizens. Pericles the chief man in democratic Athens for many years after the Persian Wars was Pericles, one of the most famous men who have ever lived. He never trusted Sparta, and knew that a great struggle with that state must come some day. He was made general of the Athenian people, but he was always careful to remember that he held power from the people, who chose him to rule as their best and wisest citizen. Unlike so many of even the bravest Greeks, he was faithful and honest in small things as well as great. He was kind, too, and on his deathbed, when the men round him were talking of the great and noble things he had done, he reminded them that he was to be praised not for these things, but because he had never caused sorrow to a fellow-citizen. This was remarkable at a time when the Greeks were terribly cruel and revengeful to any one who offended them. Yet Pericles had done wonderful things for which his fellow-citizens might justly praise him, it was said that he found Athens of brick and left it of marble. The whole city had practically to be built again after the Persian attack. A giant statue of the goddess Athene, made of bronze, was made and placed on the highest point of the Acropolis. Then the Athenians planned and built the Parthenon, a beautiful temple of marble, the ruins of which remain today to show men how beautiful the buildings of Greece could be. Right round the outside of the temple ran a frieze or band of sculpture, carved by Phidias, perhaps the greatest sculptor who has ever lived, and by his pupils, Bits of this frieze have since been carried off by other nations. Some may be seen in the British Museum in London, and others in the Museum of the Louvre in Paris. They are considered among our greatest treasures of art. Inside the temple was another immense figure of Athene, carved by Phidias himself from ivory and gold, as marble was not considered rich enough. The great public buildings were adorned with pictures telling of the legends of early Greece and of the wars of later times. A great theatre, too, was built. It was a fine building and had no roof, so that the Athenians, with their fine climate, could see plays acted in perfect comfort. Just as the age of Pericles was the time when the greatest artists of Athens lived, so too it was the age of the great athenian playwriters it seemed as though the joy of victory over the persians had spread through the nation and inspired the cleverest men in the most wonderful way this kind of thing has often been noticed in the history of nations a nation will grow strong and fight for its freedom and it will be found that the age of great soldiers will be also the age of great poets the first of the great play-writers of Greece was Aeschylus, and he fought with all his strength at Marathon. In the age of Pericles lived two other great tragic play-writers, Sophocles and Euripides, and their plays, which students read today with the greatest admiration, were then played before the Athenian people in their beautiful open-air theatre. 
and the people wept over them, and gained new ideas from them, and went away full of joy and wonder at the beautiful things they had seen and heard. Sophocles had been a boy of sixteen at the time of the battle of Salamis, and he was chosen because he was so beautiful and could play so well on the lyre to lead the chorus of boys who took part in the thanksgiving ceremonies on the island of Salamis to celebrate the victory. Then, too, there was Aristophanes, a writer of comedies which made people laugh instead of weep. Socrates the age of Pericles was the time, too, when the great Greek thinkers and philosophers gave their teaching to the world. The first great Greek philosopher was Socrates. The most educated of the Greeks had begun to ask questions about the real meaning of the world and the things around them, but Socrates was the first who gave any real answer. He understood that the tales about the gods of Greece and of the other nations could not be true, and that there could only be one god. He might have been seen any day in the streets of Athens asking questions of boys and young men, who crowded round him to listen to his wise answers. When they gave foolish or thoughtless answers, he laughed, and showed how necessary it is to think before we speak. Socrates was a little ugly man, with a flat, snub nose, but he was a very noble character. He would talk to any man he met, workmen as well as scholars, and he longed to help men to be good and truthful. He loved the town with its crowds and liveliness, and many of the people loved him. He dressed always in the poorest clothes, and ate the simplest food for he thought that these things did not matter. He cared only for knowledge and goodness. In the end he had a very sad death. Some of the people at whom he had laughed were very angry with him. Others thought that it was very dangerous that their young men should be told that the old tales about the gods were not true. After the death of Pericles, the Athenians, spoilt by success, had grown very changeable and restless. Socrates irritated them by insisting that goodness consisted in doing right, and that offerings to the gods were of no use without this. Thirty years after the death of Pericles, Socrates, now seventy years of age, was called before the judges and put on trial for offences against the gods and the state. He was condemned to die, but did not seem in the least afraid. He even vexed the judges by joking on the subject. When they asked him to suggest what else the Athenians might do to him, instead of putting him to death, he suggested that they should keep him in a certain hall in Athens where men who had served the state were kept at the expense of the state. The judges indignantly passed sentence of death on the old philosopher, and he spent some time in prison before the time appointed for his death. One of his followers told Socrates how sad he was because he was being put to death without deserving it. But Socrates replied, smiling, that it would have been much worse if he had deserved it. He declared that no real harm could happen to a good man in this life or the next. The Greeks used to give poison to a condemned man and allow him to drink it himself at any moment he might choose. Socrates drank the hemlock with his friends around him, and when they broke out in cries and tears, he begged them to be quiet and allow him to die in peace. It was not many years before the Athenians were very sorry indeed for the way Socrates had been treated, and those who had caused his death were punished. The death of Socrates came when Athens had fallen far from her greatness in the days of Pericles. In the days of Pericles he was still held in great honor. It was in wars against the other states of Greece that Athens lost her riches and her power. Pericles knew that a struggle with Sparta must come, 
and he did all he could to strengthen Athens for the fight. He built the famous long walls from Athens down to the sea, reaching the coast at the Piraeus, the port of Athens. No better plan could have been made for the safety of Athens. It would for the future be of little use for Sparta, or any other state, to besiege her by land, for food could always be brought in ships to the port, and then carried between the two long walls into the city. Twice in the early years of Pericles' rule Sparta had taken arms against Athens, but peace had been made. It was not until two years before his death that the famous war between Sparta and Athens, known as the Peloponnesian War, broke out. The policy of Pericles had prepared Athens for the struggle, but she was weakened by jealousies among the members of the confederacy of Delos, whom she had treated so proudly and so unjustly. Other causes helped to make Sparta win, and the later history of Athens in its sadness and gloom serves to throw into contrast her wonderful activity and prosperity in the age of Pericles. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 5 The Greek Colonies in the West. Before continuing the history of the Greeks in Greece proper, it will be well to take a glance at what was happening to the Greek colonies farther west. It will be remembered that about the same time that Greeks had gone forth from Greece proper to make settlements on the coast of Asia Minor, others had sailed westward and made colonies in Sicily and the south of Italy. The Greeks loved to live in cities, and, when possible, near the sea, and so most of these towns were on the coast. Sicily and southern Italy became known as Greater Greece, and the settlers never forgot that they were Greeks. They set up temples to the gods of their country, and lived much as they had done at home. Some of these Greek colonies in Greater Greece were much richer than the Greek cities at home. So luxurious were the people of Sybaris, a town in South Italy, that even today we call a person who loves pleasure more than anything else a Sybarite. A colony which went out from Sybaris itself was called Croton, and became famous for its clever doctors. Pythagoras, a famous philosopher, belonged to Croton. The Sybarites and Crotonians always hated each other, and finally the Crotonians destroyed Sybaris completely in war, for these Greek states abroad were like those at home, always fighting with each other. Another colony famous for its luxury, although it was founded by men from Sparta, who must have been brought up in the strictest way, was Tarentum, on the gulf of the same name. There were many Greek settlements in Sicily, the chief being Syracuse, founded by people from Corinth. Another great Greek settlement in Sicily was Agrigentum, which is remembered by its tyrant Phalaris. He was a tyrant in our sense of the word, as well as the Greek. He is said to have burnt his enemies alive inside a bull made of brass. After some years the people turned on him and put him to death with terrible torture. The Greeks in Sicily and Italy had changes of government very like the states in Greece proper. Some became aristocracies, some democracies, but they always remained city-states, and were too jealous of one another ever to unite under one government. The people of Agrigentum built temples almost as beautiful as those of Athens, and their ruins are still to be seen. The most westerly of all the Greek settlements was Marsilia, in the south of France, now called Marseille. The Struggle with Carthage 
it was a curious fact that at the same time that greece proper was engaged in its life-and-death struggle with persia the greeks of the west were also threatened by a great power this was carthage a settlement made on the north of africa long before by the phoenicians in the days of their greatness phoenicia had long ceased to be a great power but carthage had grown rich and had herself sent out colonies she had also won for herself much land along the north of africa partly consisting of other smaller phoenician settlements and partly to the native people called the libyans with whom the carthaginians mixed freely the libyans however had no part in the government which was in fact in the hands of a few carthaginian nobles it was an aristocracy of the narrowest sort the carthaginians were rich and fond of pleasure though the men who were actually ruling the state at any time lived plainly and would not touch wine thinking that a ruler should keep his brain clear and his wits sharp the greeks and carthaginians in the western mediterranean soon became very jealous of each other there was a third state higher up in italy rome which in the end was to conquer both but her turn had not yet come there were many small fights between the carthaginians and greeks especially in sicily in the west of which the carthaginians had made several settlements the greeks tried in the early part of the fifth century b c to push the carthaginians out of sicily altogether but they did not manage it and the carthaginians in their turn chose the time when xerxes was attacking greece proper to make a determined attack on the greeks in sicily they chose this time because they were afraid that otherwise the greeks at home would come to the aid of their colonies the carthaginians made up their minds to send a great army under hamilcar a brave soldier who was a carthaginian on his father's side and a syracusan greek on his mother's under his command were three thousand ships carrying an enormous army it was an army much like that of xerxes awkward and unwieldy too large because of the different peoples which went to make it up there were carthaginians and men from their colonies the native libyans and some greeks from states which were enemies of himera and the other greek states of sicily which were to be attacked a storm destroyed many of the ships on their way across to panormus now palermo where hamilcar landed his men and marched on himera a great battle was fought, which the Greeks won, partly by a clever trick, and partly by their better fighting. It was said that a hundred and fifty thousand men of the army of Carthage lay dead upon the field. Hamilcar watched the fight all day, burning a great fire of sacrifice to his gods, which may have been a sacrifice of human beings, for the Carthaginians had this dreadful practice at sunset seeing that defeat was certain he threw himself into the fire and died rather than return home to tell of his misfortune all of the ships which had been drawn up upon the beach were burnt by the greeks and of the twenty which had not been drawn up and so sailed away only one returned to carthage to tell the sad tale for again a storm rose and the others were destroyed the greeks raised a monument in honor of hamilcar although he was their enemy and the carthaginians although they were not usually grateful to their heroes honored his memory for many years the soldiers who remained alive out of the army of carthage were made slaves by the people of agrigentum it was afterwards told that the battle of himera was fought on the same day as the great sea fight of salamis it was at any rate about the same time and so the greeks triumphed against their enemies in both east and west for seventy years after the battle of himera the carthaginians left the greeks alone if they had won sicily the carthaginians might have won the south of italy too 
as it was time was given for rome to grow and extend its power there the greeks and carthaginians were to have many a desperate struggle yet in sicily but by that time the greek power had become as nothing compared to that of rome and it was to rome that the fall of carthage was in the end due end of chapter five chapter six of the story of the world a simple history for boys and girls this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rita boutros the story of the world a simple history for boys and girls by elizabeth o'neill chapter six the peloponnesian war the history of this war, which lasted with periods of peace nearly thirty years, is perhaps of more importance in the history of Greece than in the history of the world. In it the power and greatness of Athens were brought to an end. It is just possible, but not probable, that if Athens had won, she would have conquered the rest of Greece, and a great Athenian empire might have been formed if this had been so athens would have had an even greater influence on later history than she has had but it was not to be and there is no real reason to believe that athens even if she had been victorious would have set up such an empire still the story of the war is interesting and important ever since the persian war and especially under the rule of pericles athens had irritated the other greek states she had made conquests on land but these had been soon taken from her but she clung to her empire for such the confederacy of delos had become the persian power no longer threatened greece and had definitely set free even the greek colonies in asia minor but still athens collected contributions from all the islands in the aegean the money was no longer kept at delos but was sent to athens and much of it was spent on the buildings there and on the amusement of the people athens interfered also in the government of the other states of the confederacy whenever trouble arose and set up democratic governments like their own all important law cases had to be heard in athens when samos a large island which clung to its independence refused to allow its quarrel with miletus to be settled by athens the athenians attacked her destroyed all her walls of defence took away her fleet and made her pay the costs of the war the athenians kept sixty boats always in the aegean sea as though she was afraid of a rebellion for years a great struggle between sparta and athens had been expected with sparta necessarily went the whole of the peloponnesian league of which she was the chief member the third greatest state in greece was corinth which was a sea power nearly as strong as athens it was with corinth that athens first quarrelled but sparta took the opportunity of calling a meeting to discuss a war with athens messages were sent threatening war if the athenians would not send pericles away this of course they would not do but they might have sent peaceful messages back but for a speech which pericles himself made to the people he was a great speaker and when he pointed out that the war was sure to come some day and that the athenians were quite strong enough to face their enemies they made up their minds to fight and to fight as pericles should tell them so in the year four thirty one b c the great struggle between the two greatest states in greece began on the side of the spartans were nearly all the greeks of the peninsula though sparta's old enemy argos in the peloponnesus refused to join and Plataea, the faithful little ally of Athens, fought once more on her side. The war began with an attack on Plataea by the people of Thebes. Three hundred Thebans got into Plataea and kept the people shut up in their houses. 
but the Plataeans broke down the inside walls of their houses, and so were able to talk to each other. They arranged an attack on the Thebans, and a terrible fight took place. The Plataeans killed many Thebans, and many others were driven into a large building where grain was kept. Other Thebans came up to the walls to help them, but the Plataeans got them to go away, and then, in spite of their promises, killed every Theban left in the town. So angry were the people of Thebes that they sent another great army to attack Plataea, and the Athenians, although they were vexed that the Plataeans had broken their word, had to send an army to protect them from the Thebans. Then the Spartans marched into Attica itself. Pericles thought that the Athenians would have little chance on land against the great army of Sparta, so he collected all the people of Attica within the long walls, for he knew that they could get plenty of food by sea. The people of Attica hated to leave their farms and vineyards to be destroyed by the enemy, but there was nothing else to do. The cattle were sent to the island of Euboea, and the people lived in huts and tents put up in haste in the empty space between the long walls. Then Pericles sent ships round to harass the people on the coasts of the Peloponnesus. The great Spartan army, once it had lain waste all the country round Athens, could do nothing more to harm the Athenians. Only a few bands of horsemen went out to hamper them. So the first year of the war ended. There was a great funeral service in memory of those who had been killed, and Pericles made a noble speech, assuring the Athenians that the severity of Sparta could never make men so noble as the freedom of Athens, and begging them not to grieve too much over the dead but to be ready to die in their turn, if need were. The next year things happened in much the same way. In the spring, for ancient peoples never fought in the winter, a great Spartan army ravaged Attica again. The people of the countryside again took refuge between the long walls, but a terrible misfortune fell upon the Athenians. A dreadful sickness called the plague broke out in the Piraeus. It came to Europe from the east, and had broken out in Egypt and also in Italy. It must have been brought by some ship to the Piraeus, and it spread quickly among the people crowded unhealthily together between the long walls. The people suffered terribly, and hundreds died without anyone to bury them. Pericles himself fell ill, but got better. On all sides people began to grumble against him, as though their misfortunes were through his fault. A leather-seller called Cleon, a vulgar and ignorant man, tried to have the rule of Athens taken from him, but Pericles kept it till his death, which came shortly afterwards. In the next year the Spartans took revenge on the little city of Plataea, all its men were killed, its women and children sold as slaves, and the city itself destroyed. After the death of Pericles, power in Athens fell to Cleon the leather seller. He was very violent, and determined to remain at war, although many in Athens would have wished for peace. Just after his death, and after ten years of cruel and foolish warfare, a peace was at last made between Sparta and Athens. It lasted seven years, though it was made for fifty. Life in Athens had quite changed, and so had the spirit of the people. Socrates was still there, a relic of the great age of Pericles, but the new generation was changeable and fickle. Alcibiades even when the fifty years' peace was signed, the best-known man in Athens was Alcibiades, a man thirty years old. His wayward character, his cleverness and courage, and his faults seemed to be signs of the change which had come upon the Athenians. Alcibiades was a young relation of Pericles, and he was a pupil of Socrates, but he was not wise and serious like them. 
knowing as did socrates that the belief in the gods was not true he merely laughed at them whereas socrates had taught men to look to higher things than these and to do good even if they no longer honoured the gods alcibiades was what is called irresponsible he would do anything which came into his head at any moment he often drank too much wine and went noisily about the town with his companions yet it was to such a man as this that the athenians now gave their trust they mistook cleverness for wisdom at the first olympic games after the fifty years peace was signed it was thought that athens would not be able to send any people to take part but alcibiades was there offering sacrifices in beautiful golden bowls and with seven four-horse chariots to run in the races twice he was crowned as victor with the crown of wild olive all the time alcibiades was anxious that athens should fight again with sparta and war did in fact soon break out again the athenians at this time showed the greatest cruelty towards any member of the confederacy of delos which dared to rebel against her unjust empire the island of melos which rebelled was conquered and every man there was put to death the women and children being sold into slavery shortly after this the athenians were induced by alcibiades to send a great fleet and army to sicily where the colonies of sparta were at war with other states the athenian expedition went to help a city called egesta against another called selenus the people of egesta had promised to pay the expenses of the expedition and alcibiades had persuaded the athenians to agree nicias another statesman in athens persuaded the people to send messengers to see if the people of egesta were really as rich as they said it was said afterwards that they showed the athenian messengers plates and cups which were only gilded over and pretended they were made of gold the athenians were deceived and the expedition went off under nicias and alcibiades but the morning it sailed the athenians were shocked to find that all the busts of their god hermes which stood on little square pedestals at the street corners had been thrown over and broken during the night they came to the conclusion that this had been done by alcibiades as a joke it was nothing to him because he did not believe in the gods but to those who did it seemed a terrible sacrilege afterwards it was thought that perhaps alcibiades had not done this thing after all but he had done worse things against the gods so messengers were sent after him to bring him back a prisoner in his own ship but instead he sailed away to sparta and offered his services to the bitter enemy of his country the Sicilian expedition was a complete failure, for Alcibiades told to the Spartans all the plans of the Athenians, and persuaded them to send an army to fight against the Athenians in Sicily. He was full of anger against the men of his own state, and when he heard that sentence of death had been passed upon him, he declared, I will show them one day that I am still alive. The leadership of the Athenians in Sicily was left to Nicias, who had very little heart for it. Alcibiades had wished all the other Greek colonies in Sicily to join with the Athenians in an attack on the Spartan colonies, especially Syracuse, but most of them refused, and the Athenians were left practically alone. A great battle was fought in the immense harbor at Syracuse the athenians had many more ships than the syracusans but the syracusans had placed theirs right across the mouth of the harbour and the two hundred athenian ships were hemmed in all but sixty were destroyed and the men who could escape joined the athenian army on the shore nicias saw that they must give up the ships and try to escape by land to a part of the island where the people were friendly it was a terrible march, 
and the sick and wounded had to be left to die. Nicias, who had hated the whole thing, now showed how brave he was. Although he was very ill and tired, he went about among the men, trying to cheer them. At one place the army had to march through a narrow pass, between high rocks which the Syracusans fortified. For two days the Athenians fought, then had to give up and choose another direction. They were short of food and water. At another place they caught sight of a river flowing in a deep hollow, and they were so thirsty that the whole army rushed forward to drink. Those in front were pushed down into the water, while those behind fell upon them, and were either crushed or pierced by the spears of the fallen. A Spartan army fell upon them while they were in this miserable state. At last Nicias gave himself up with his army, begging that mercy should be shown to the ten thousand men who remained out of the forty thousand who had begun this terrible march. He promised that the Athenians would pay the Syracusans all that they had spent on the war. But the same cruelty was now shown as has been noticed in the later wars in Greece proper. The Athenians who thus gave themselves up were put in stone quarries and left in hunger and cold. Nicias and the other Athenian leader, Demosthenes, were to be put to death, but preferred to kill themselves. So ended in miserable defeat this expedition, planned in all light-heartedness by Alcibiades, and it was largely he who, by helping the Spartans, had ruined it. Meanwhile at home, Sparta was still destroying and burning in the plain of Attica. The Athenians were terribly distressed when they heard the sad fate of the Sicilian expedition. The loss of the ships was very bad for their navy, but they bravely set to work to build more. But the struggle was too severe. Nearly all the members of the Confederacy of Delos rebelled, and all the money of the League, so long stored up in Athens, was spent in fighting them. In Athens itself the people had not even enough food. The Persians once more began to fight against their old enemy Athens, and joined with Sparta in helping the revolt of the Athenian colonies in Asia Minor. Alcibiades had helped too in this rebellion, but the Spartans were beginning to grow tired of him. He had deceived one of their kings, and his liveliness of character prevented them from really liking him. At last they decided that he should die, but Alcibiades then joined the friends of Athens, and fought against the colonies whom he had encouraged to rebel. In the end he won several battles, and then went back to Athens, was forgiven, and even welcomed. His manner was as attractive to the Athenians as it was unpleasant to the Spartans, and all his terrible treachery was forgotten. THE RUIN OF ATHENS Alcibiades was a fine leader, but it was impossible to save Athens. She was ruined on sea and on land. Alcibiades was made head of the fleet, but he left it for a time under another leader. During this time it was attacked and defeated by the Spartan fleet, which was now bigger than that of Athens. Alcibiades was ordered back to Athens to give an account of his conduct, but he was afraid to go, and fled into Thrace. The Spartans soon afterwards won another great victory at sea, and took nearly the whole of the Athenian fleet prisoner. Athens now gave up all hope, and after a terrible siege of four months she was forced to give in to Sparta, who made terribly hard conditions for peace. The Athenians had to destroy the long walls and all their docks and their port at the Piraeus. They were to keep only twelve ships out of their once mighty fleet. They were not to attempt to gain power again over the members of the Confederacy of Delos, and, indeed, were not to have any possessions outside Attica. They must help Sparta for the future against all her enemies, 
the work of destruction of the long walls and the piraeus was done by spartan workmen to the sound of music and rejoicing and with every mark of insult to the athenians so ended the peloponnesian war which had made greece miserable for nearly thirty years it was one of the most foolish and most useless wars in history the athens of pericles was gone for ever and though the athenians were still remarkable for their artists and scholars there was never another chance of their taking the lead among the greeks alcibiades fled once more after the fall of athens to the persians but the spartans persuaded them to kill him they set fire to his house and when he ran out his enemies let fly a shower of arrows at him and so killed him his story is one of the strangest told of the great men of greece his cleverness and beauty do not make up for his selfishness and deceit he was one of the chief causes of his city's downfall though probably if he had been allowed to lead the army in sicily instead of being called back for punishment he would have led it to victory but he was hardly great enough to have conquered the spartans and even if he had done so he could never have made a great greek empire with athens at its head probably no one could have done this though we cannot help wishing that it had been done so that the learning and cleverness of the athenians might have had an even greater influence on the world than they have had as it was alcibiades whom many of the athenians had petted and admired helped more than any other man to ruin the greatness of athens End of chapter six Chapter 7 of The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 7 The Last Days of Greek Independence. It might have seemed that now there was nothing to prevent Sparta uniting all the states of Greece in one empire, but this was not to be. The Spartans were hardly broad enough in the way they looked at things, and the Greek states were growing more and more jealous of each other. In a short time, when Thebes grew as powerful as Sparta, athens was glad to join with sparta against thebes a city which she had always hated because of its tyranny over her old friend plataea as time went on too the greeks nearly everywhere gave themselves up more and more to pleasure yet just at the end of the peloponnesian war some of them showed that they could still fight as well as in the days of marathon and thermopylae the spartans had during the war been friendly with various persian princes and now cyrus the brother of the persian king artaxerxes asked permission of sparta to collect an army in greece to help him in an expedition he did not tell what the expedition was for and many greeks who had been fighting at home and had nothing to do joined him in all there were thirteen thousand and at their head was the spartan clearchus xenophon's great march among them was xenophon an athenian and a pupil of socrates cyrus led them with a great army of his own into the very centre of the persian empire to babylonia to fight against artaxerxes kill him and make himself king the greeks were surprised and angry when they found what he was doing but they fought bravely and chased the persians opposed to them but cyrus himself was killed instead of his brother and his army ran away the greeks were left alone more than one thousand miles from home with enemies all round them the Persians were afraid of them, for they saw that a small army of Greeks was still more than equal to a large army of Persians. Artaxerxes sent one of his officers, who pretended to be their friend, and offered to show them the way back to Greece. 
he got them safely out of babylonia and then asked their generals and captains to a meeting in his tent here men rushed upon them and killed them and the army of ten thousand was left without their chief leaders in a strange land most of them were nearly in despair but xenophon spoke to the chief men left reminding them of the great victories which greece had won over persia and begging them to fight their way home and so they did they had to march all that one thousand miles through strange countries where savage tribes attacked them but they fought with them and took food and went on and at last they came within sight of the sea and the brave men who had suffered so much and so cheerfully gave a great cry of joy for they knew they were now within easy reach of home afterwards when he was safe in greece xenophon wrote down the story of all the adventures he had passed through in the retreat of the ten thousand a curious fact about xenophon is that though he was so brave and clever he never had any love for athens his own city he even once fought for the spartans against the athenians when athens was helping thebes in a fight with sparta the spartans sent an army under one of their kings to fight the persians in asia minor and she also sent out a fine fleet but agesilas the king was called back to fight thebes and athens who had joined her athens had built her long walls again in spite of sparta agesilas defeated the army of thebes and athens but meanwhile his fleet was destroyed by the persians with an athenian to lead them and sparta gave up the idea of becoming a great sea power she also made peace with the great king who was left free once more to take as his own the greek colonies in asia minor sparta had set up in many cities of greece a government like her own and in thebes among others two of the citizens who hated this government had been sent into exile but they made up their minds to upset the government they dressed themselves as hunters and with their dogs came back to their city and to their houses without any one guessing who they were some of their friends gave a feast to the two governors who ruled like the two kings in sparta and the exiles again dressed themselves up this time as women and went into the room where the rulers were eating they were taken by surprise and easily killed by the pretended women so the enemies of sparta came into power athens sent help to thebes and the thebans found a splendid leader in epaminondas one of the greatest heroes of greek history he was a splendid soldier and a very noble character he had not taken any part in killing the rulers set up by sparta he was clever too and had studied philosophy and in some ways was very like pericles as soon as the thebans had become free themselves they helped the other cities which sparta had conquered to set themselves free epaminondas won a great victory over the spartans at leuctra in the battle epaminondas used a quite new way of attacking the enemy's lines and he is considered one of the world's great generals seven hundred spartans were killed and only three hundred thebans but sparta pretended not to care and forbade any public show of sorrow epaminondas the hero of thebes the thebans were now the chief people in greece but the other cities soon became as jealous of them as of sparta and the spartans took advantage of this to make another attack on thebes another great battle was fought at mantinea for a long time it seemed doubtful which of the splendid armies would win but at last epaminondas led a picked band of his best men in a determined dash on the enemy the spartan leader was wounded and the thebans won the battle for soon afterwards the spartans sent to ask permission to bury their dead which meant that they owned that they were defeated 
but Epaminondas, too, was wounded to death. A javelin, a sharp weapon, with a pointed head of iron, and a handle of wood, stuck in his breast. The wooden part broke off, and the doctors said that as soon as the head should be pulled out of his breast, the brave leader must die. But Epaminondas did not care at all, so long as the victory was won. After his death, peace was made, and for a short time no one Greek state tried to conquer the others. Even if he had lived, Epaminondas would never have been able to join all the Greeks together. He was like Alcibiades in that, a great soldier, but not a very clever statesman. So Thebes, like Sparta and Athens, fell once more to the level of the other states. But there was a country to the north of Greece which was not properly Greek, but which succeeded for a time where the Greeks had failed, and joined them together for a while, though against their will. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. By Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 8. Greece and Macedonia. To the north of Greece proper lay a country which the Greeks called Macedonia. Its people were not pure Greeks, but some Greeks had probably mixed with them and married among them in early times. The Macedonian kings declared that they themselves belonged to an old Greek family belonging to the same group of Greeks as the Spartans. Certainly the kings and people of Macedonia had some of the best qualities of both Greeks and barbarians. They were splendid fighters, and though the people were rough and uneducated, the kings had some idea of Greek learning and philosophy. Philip of Macedon, who was king at the time when Sparta and Thebes were fighting, had been, as a boy, for three years in Thebes. He had learned a great deal about Greece, and probably he then first got the idea of how easy it would be for a really strong power to conquer it. When he got back to his own country, there was a great deal of quarreling in the royal family as to who should be king, but Philip made himself king. Macedonia had already a good army, but Philip made up his mind to make it even better. There were some fierce tribes in some parts of the country, but these he marched against and put in order. Macedonia was, of course, bigger than any of the Greek states, and Philip was able to get together an immense and splendid army. Demosthenes, a great Athenian speaker. As soon as he felt strong enough, he began to take for himself some of the Greek colonies on the coast near Macedonia. Several of those belonged to Athens, but the Athenians did not try to prevent it. There was one statesman, however, in Athens who grew passionately angry against Philip. This was Demosthenes, a very splendid speaker. He told the Athenians over and over again that this barbarous king of the north would soon try to conquer all Greece if Athens and the other Greek states would not join to fight him in time. Philip gradually began to interfere in the new quarrels among the Greek states, and especially he helped to defend the temple of Apollo at Delphi, which had been attacked by the Phocians. He called himself a Greek and got some of the Greeks to say that Macedonia was a Greek state. He talked, too, very often of leading an army of all the Greek states, including Macedonia, with himself at its head to fight the Persians, as in the great days of Greece. All the time Demosthenes was warning the Athenians against Philip. So bitterly did he hate him that he said he would rather have the Persians themselves. Even today, when anyone speaks very angrily for a long time against anybody, we call such a speech a Philippic, in memory of the long speeches in which Demosthenes tried to stir up the Athenians against Philip. At last, it became plain that the things which Demosthenes said against Philip were true, and that he really meant to conquer all Greece. At last, the Thebans and Athenians joined and fought a great battle with Philip at Chaeronea. 
The Macedonian soldiers had always been brave, but before Philip had trained them, they had had only shields made of wicker with rusty swords. But Philip had taught them all that he had learned about fighting in Thebes, and the Greeks found that they had to fight against men who were stronger and better trained than themselves. Philip won a complete victory. He was very severe with the Thebans, but quite kind to the Athenians. He was now head of all Greece, but he did not live long to enjoy his power. Philip was a strange mixture of Greek and barbarian. He was, of course, brave and clever, and a great general, but he had some terrible faults. He was very fond of wine and often drank too much. When he was in this state, he did and said very curious things. One day, a woman came and asked him to settle a quarrel for her, and he settled it quite wrongly. The woman quietly said, I appeal. To whom do you appeal? asked the king. To Philip Sober, answered the woman. Philip saw that she was right and now settled the quarrel quite differently. The saying to appeal from Philip drunk to Philip Sober is now a very common one. Philip had several wives, imitating in this the eastern kings. This was not a Greek custom, and in Philip it showed the barbarian side of his character. His first wife was Olympias, who was also half Greek. The people said she was a witch, and she was certainly very passionate, and sometimes seemed almost mad. She and Philip quarreled terribly, and naturally she did not like his other wives. Philip and Olympias had a son called Alexander, who became king after his father, and is famous in history as Alexander the Great. Alexander took his mother's part in her quarrels, and was not very friendly with Philip. It was during the rejoicings over the marriage of his daughter that Philip died, being killed by a young man who belonged to his bodyguard, but thought that Philip had been unjust to him. During the marriage festival, there was a procession to a theater where a play was to be held. Statues of the twelve great gods of Greece were carried in the procession, and behind them one of Philip himself, as though he too were a god. Then came the king, but just as he reached the door of the theater, the young man rushed forward and stuck a sword right through his body. Philip fell dead. The young man ran away, but tripped and fell and was killed by the king's friends. The Greeks rejoiced at Philip's death, but it did not free them from the Macedonians, for in Alexander they had to deal with a king as brave as his father and cleverer, and even more anxious for power. For the next few years, the history of Greece must be told in connection with the wonderful story of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great Alexander, the son of Philip of Macedon, was only 20 years old when his father died. Demosthenes told the people of Athens that when he had seen him a few years before, he was a dull boy. Demosthenes thought that the power of Macedon was at an end, but he can have been only a very poor judge of character. Alexander was a fine, handsome boy with a beautiful fair skin, blue eyes, and golden hair. There is a bust of him in the museum at the Louvre at Paris, which shows him with fine, shapely features and a noble forehead. Some people said that he was not the son of Philip at all, but that the god Jupiter was his father. Alexander had, of course, a remarkable father and mother. In him can be seen his mother's power of imagination without her tendency to madness. He had his father's ambition, courage, and power of ruling in a much higher degree. He soon showed the Greek cities that they could not throw off the Macedonian power. The city of Thebes, which dared to rise up against him, was destroyed. All but one house, that which had formerly belonged to the poet Pindar, for Alexander, like his father, had great respect for the art and poetry of Greece. He was himself a pupil of Aristotle, the greatest of all the Athenian philosophers. It is said that Alexander asked the Greeks in his army who were helping him against Thebes what should be done to that city, and it was by their advice that it was destroyed. Alexander himself was not generally cruel, but among these Greeks were men from Plataea, which had been by this time built up again, 
and they advised the destruction of Thebes in revenge for the destruction of their own city years before. But the conquest of Greece was only one part of Alexander's work. He did not see why a Greek, as he called himself, should not conquer Persia, as Persia had long ago tried to conquer Greece. He got together an army of 35,000 men and marched with them across the Hellespont. When he was halfway across, he killed a bull as a sacrifice to the god and goddesses of the sea and poured wine from a golden cup into the water. When his ship drew near the land, he flung a spear into the earth as a sign that he meant to win the land for his own. The Persian leader who was sent to fight Alexander advised that his army should fall back before the Greeks and destroy everything on the way, so that Alexander and his army would have been without food. But his good advice was not followed, and the Persian army waited for the Greeks to come up to them. In order to reach them, the Greeks had to cross the river Granicus, which was very deep in some places. Alexander's chief captain advised him to wait until the next morning before crossing, but Alexander was too impatient. He said he would not be stopped by a little stream and spurred his horse into the river. The whole army followed, and a great battle was fought on the other side. Alexander himself killed two of the Persian leaders and went into the very thickest of the fight. He would indeed have been killed, but for the quickness of the captain of his bodyguard, named Clitus. One of the Persians was in the very act of bringing his sword down in a deadly blow on the head of Alexander, when Clitus swiftly cut off the hand which held the sword. Alexander won a great victory, and all Asia Minor submitted to him. The men who had fought hardest on the Persian side were some Greek soldiers who fought for money. When these were taken as prisoners, Alexander sent them home to work as slaves in Macedonia, for he said they were traitors to Greece. But he had the enemy's dead buried with all respect, like those of his own army who had been killed. He sent 300 suits of armor taken from the Persians to be dedicated to the goddess Athena in the Acropolis of Athens, and had these words sent with them. From Alexander, son of Philip, and the Greeks, except for the Lacedaemonians, out of the spoil of the foreigners inhabiting Asia. The Lacedaemonians was another name for the Spartans. Alexander made an exception for them because they had refused to join in his expedition. The Gordian Knot. At Gordium, one of the towns of Asia Minor which Alexander took, he was shown a chariot said to belong to the man who had founded the city. It was tied up with cords, which were fastened in a knot, which, it was said, no one could undo. Alexander took his sword and solved the difficulty by cutting the cord across. It was said that the man who undid the knot should conquer the world. A second great battle was fought next year at the river Isis, this time the Persian king was there. He was another Darius by name. The Persian army is said to have had 600,000 men in it, but it was one of the immense useless armies of the unwilling soldiers which the Greeks had met and conquered so often. The dashing attack of Alexander scattered it, and Darius himself ran away. Alexander seized the Persian camp, and among others, the mother, wife, and daughter of Darius were taken prisoners. They were crying because they thought the king had been killed, but Alexander told them that he had got safely away and so comforted them. Alexander was nearly always kind and polite to his enemies when they were in his power. He next took all of the coast of Syria and Phoenicia, but the old city of Tyre, though it would have submitted to him, refused to let him enter the city to sacrifice to one of its gods. Alexander was terribly angry and besieged the city for seven months. He brought the Phoenician ships to help him, and when at last Tyre had to give way, Alexander allowed his soldiers to kill most of the men in cold blood on the seashore. The women and children were sent into slavery. Alexander was terribly angry when his pride was offended, as it had been in this case. He sacrificed at the shrine, but there was little to be proud of in this victory. Darius was not a very strong or brave king, 
He was now thoroughly frightened and sent word to Alexander that he would give up to him all the land west of the river Euphrates if he would only let him live in peace beyond that river. But even such an immense empire could not satisfy Alexander. His chief captain Parmenio said to him, If I were Alexander, I should agree to this rather than rush into further dangers. And so should I, replied Alexander, if I were Parmenio. But he was not. He was full of imagination and seems to have thought it possible to join the East and West in one great empire. It was not possible, for, as can be seen through all history, the people of the East are quite different from those of the West. They have a quite different way of thinking about things. But Alexander did come nearer than anybody to joining the two. At the town of Gaza, Alexander again met with resistance, and he treated it with the same cruelty as Tyre. It is said that he went to Jerusalem and prayed in the temple. The Jews welcomed him, for they had suffered much under the Persian rule, and they showed him the place in the book of Daniel which says that a Greek would conquer the Persians. Afterwards, when Alexander built the city of Alexandria, called after himself, he invited many Jews to settle there. From Asia Minor, Alexander marched into Egypt, which gave in to him immediately. It was on an island at the mouth of the Nile that he built Alexandria, which in time became the second greatest city in the world at the time when Rome was the greatest. From Egypt in the spring, Alexander led his men right across Asia beyond the Euphrates through Mesopotamia and across the Tigris, and there at last met the army of Darius. The battle was fought not very far from the town of Arbela and is known as the Battle of Arbela. Darius had had his army standing all night for it was so large that he was afraid that if the soldiers lay down to sleep, he would never get them into order again. The Macedonians had a good night's sleep and were quite fresh for the fight. The army of Darius was rather different from the usual Persian armies. It had in it 50,000 paid Greek soldiers and men from wild tribes of the very east. There were elephants, too, which the Greek soldiers had never seen. Then again, the land beyond the Euphrates had always been considered dangerous by the Greeks, and here they were beyond the Tigris as well. But Alexander's soldiers had the greatest trust in him, and no one grumbled. The fight was fast and furious, but at last the Persian army fell into confusion, and Darius once more fled from the field. Alexander marched on to Babylon, and then to the great Persian capital Susa, and took it for his own. At Susa, Alexander, having, it is said, drunk too much wine, burnt down the royal palaces. In them were wonderful books full of the writings of the great Persian philosopher Zoroaster and of the history of the Persian Empire. These were lost forever to the world, and many things written in these books can never now be known. Alexander was bitterly sorry afterwards, and indeed it was one of the worst acts of his life, and we find it hard to forgive him for it. He then marched after Darius, who was running away with Bursus, one of his relations. For weeks Alexander followed him, and when at last Darius, who was worn out and weary of the struggle, knew that he would be caught, he told Bursus and his friends that he would give himself up to Alexander. But Bursus was an ambitious man, and as he knew that with Darius as a prisoner, Alexander would be surer than ever of keeping Persia for his own, he turned and stuck his sword into Darius and killed him, and then fled on. Darius was found dying by one of Alexander's soldiers, and he begged him to thank Alexander for being so kind to his wife and daughter. Alexander buried Darius with all honor in the old tomb of the Persian kings. Alexander in India In four years, Alexander had won for himself the great empire of Persia, but he was not yet satisfied. He stayed only to make things orderly and safe, and then marched through mountain passes into the great unknown continent of India. He conquered the land now known as Punjab, and had a famous struggle with a prince called Porus. 
Porus was almost a giant. He had an enormous elephant on which he used to ride into battle. When its master could no longer fight, the elephant would lie gently down, let him slide from its back, and pull the arrows from its body with its trunk. Porus was defeated and taken prisoner. Alexander asked him how he wished to be treated. He quietly answered, like a king. Alexander was so pleased with the answer that he gave Porus his kingdom back, and even some more land to make it larger. But of course Porus had to own that Alexander was over him. Alexander, too, had a faithful animal which he loved very much. This was his horse, Bucephalus, which he had ridden for many years. Alexander always tried to save it from too much work or any pain, but he always rode it in battle. It was wounded in the battle and died soon afterwards. Alexander built a city on the spot where it was buried and called it Bucephalia after the horse. Alexander would probably have wished to add all India to his empire, but at last his army began to rebel and would not follow him any farther. He led them back through the passes of northwest India and across Asia once more to Susa and from there to Babylon. Here he fell suddenly ill of a fever and died. He was only 42 years old. In the 10 years that he had been in Asia, he had won contests such as no man has done before or since. We can only imagine what he would have done had he lived longer. He was one of the greatest men who ever lived. Besides being a wonderful soldier and leader of men, he was generally kind and he admired noble things. Of course, he was sometimes cruel, and when really angry, he was quite as savage and uncivilized as any of his enemies. It is dreadful to think that he killed in anger his great friend Clitus, who had saved his life at the Battle of Granicus. In anger, he was more barbarian than Greek, but he lived in a savage time, and we must remember that the Greeks, who had been civilized for hundreds of years, were almost equally cruel. With all his faults, the name of Alexander the Great and the story of his life will always remain to fill men with wonder. The End of Alexander's Empire As soon as Alexander was dead, his great empire broke up, and his generals made themselves kings of different parts of it. Some of these rulers very soon lost much of their Greek character and became very much like the people they ruled. In time, most of them were conquered by the Roman people, who soon after this became a great conquering nation. The cities which Alexander had built and the colonies of Greek soldiers which he had left everywhere taught the Eastern people something of Greek civilization. Alexandria became almost a second Athens, famous for its learning and its philosophy. Macedonia became a kingdom, and after many quarrels, the family of one of his generals, Antigonus, got the kingship, and it remained in the family for more than a hundred years, when Macedonia was conquered by Rome and made part of the Roman Empire. After the death of Alexander, the Greeks tried to free themselves from the power of Macedonia, but the Macedonian ruler marched against them and made them give in. Demosthenes, who had spent so many years in struggle against the kingdom, which he hated so much, and had hoped that now at last the Greeks would be free, now poisoned himself in despair. After about fifty years, some of the smaller states of Greece, which had never before taken much part in her history, joined together into leagues, and for the first time there was something like equality between the states of Greece. These smaller states were content to be equal with each other and did not try to conquer other states like Sparta and Athens and the great states of earlier times. But they could never make Greece really great again, and even now there were jealousies. At last Sparta, who had always been ready to join with the enemies of Greece when she was angry and jealous, called in the Romans against the Achaean League with which she was quarreling. The Romans came and settled the quarrel by making Greece a province of her empire. This was in the year 146 BC. The history of the next few hundred years is the history of this wonderful Roman people, which had grown up from a city-state in the middle of Italy into a great nation and then into an empire the greatest the world has ever known. 
we must turn back more than 600 years to tell the tale of the Roman people from the beginning. End of chapter 8. Chapter 9 of the Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 9. The Rise of Rome The Romans, in a way, show us a world very much like that which we know today. There are no such things as city-states now as there were in Greece, but the great empires and nations of today are built very much as the Roman Empire was built. The Greeks had never formed a great empire because they were not able to join together for any time. From the very beginning, the Romans were very different. The history of the seven kings of Rome is a story of battles and struggles against various enemies, but the result is always the same. Conquerors, or conquered, they join with their foes, so that while the Roman race was at first Latin, we find some of their kings, Sabines, and other Etruscans. The Romans show us another new thing. The Greeks had been in love with art and beauty and freedom, it would be wrong to say that the Romans did not like these things, but a Roman liked strength and usefulness and order much more. The Romans gave the laws to the world, so that even now when men study the laws of almost any country, they must study a great deal that is Roman law. Everything in the Roman Empire was done by rule. Every one went about his business for a certain time and did it by certain rules and the Romans introduced a new spirit into the world. The Greeks always thought, what is really the best thing? The Roman way of looking at things was, what is the best and easiest thing I can do now? It might not be, it probably would not be on most occasions, the really best thing, but it was the thing an ordinary practical man would do. It was this spirit which helped Rome to rule in time over most of the known world. The Roman was a man of business, and he did just the best thing to settle any question at the moment. In time, Romans were ruling over such different peoples as the British, the Egyptians, the French, and the Greeks, and many others with great success. In each case, the Roman governor set about things in an orderly way. He had men to help him who each did his separate task, and so all the business of the country was gone through. Roman soldiers would be there at first, but by and by soldiers who belonged to the country would be taught to take their part in the army. Great roads would be built, roads which were made so strong that we can still follow them in England today. Courts where people could go and obtain what was owing to them would be set up and the people would be taught useful arts. Wherever the Romans went, some trace of them remains to this day. Many English towns, such as Chester, Lancaster, Winchester, etc., have earned their names from the Roman name for a camp, Castra. And not only in the words, but in roads and buildings, such as bridges, are their traces to be seen. It is time now to look back at the story of the beginnings of this country, which soon took its place as the seat of the chief rulers of the world. In shape, Italy is like a human leg, with the island of Sicily standing near the toes. It is like a leg in another way. It has a hard center running throughout its length. The Apennines, as the mountain ridge is called, do not run through the exact center of Italy. They run to the east, forming in this way a rocky coast there, while the land on the west slopes gradually from them to the sea. It is important to remember this, for it explains the reason why the Greeks never invaded much of Italy. The land nearest to Greece was the same rocky eastern shore of Italy, on which it was not easy to make harbors for ships. 
And so the Greeks, with their eyes on trading, never pushed their way much beyond the southern heel of Italy and the southwest fringe of the coast. For farther north than Naples, where the Greeks settled, there were no good harbors. About the center of the western side of Italy there is a river called the Tiber, and this naturally acted as a line dividing the people on the north from those on the south. On the north lived a race which is one of the oldest in the world. They were called Etruscans. Where the Etruscans originally came from is not certainly known, but it is thought that they grew out of two distinct peoples, one that came from the north and the other which came very little later to Italy and crossed the Apennines from Lydia. The Etruscans were a highly civilized people, we read of a league which they made of twelve cities, not always the same, but cities which were great and important enough to be able to add something to the general defense. The cities were chiefly what we should call country towns, which had grown great from the crops, trees, and cattle produced on the land about them. They were not only towns on the sea coast, though some of them were, and they had good laws and some of the love of color which Rome borrowed from them. The Etruscans who lived in them were great fighters and made the Greek and the people of Carthage fear them. Though they were by trade a farming people and their markets might be found the traders of all the world, the Greek and Phoenician merchants came there bringing their gold and silver and ivory and bronze. Some of these precious metals were no doubt dug from their own mines, but the greater part found its way into the land through the hands of traders, and the Etruscans, who did not know how to make beautiful things themselves, sold their metals, cattle, and crops for such things as Egyptian vases and Phoenician cups. They were a people who loved luxury. Their slaves were beautifully dressed, and at their meals splendidly embroidered tablecloths and fine cups and plates of gold and silver were used. They were good flute players, and flutes, harps, and trumpets were played while they worked. They loved music and dancing, hunting, and the watching of fights in which strong men fought between themselves and against beasts. About 300 years after the Etruscans settled down, we find four great races grouped about the Tiber. To the north and west, the Etruscans. To the east and northeast, the Umbrians. And a little farther south, the Samnites. And to the south, the Latins. These last three peoples belonged to the great Aran race, and they were found already settled when the Etruscans pushed their way over the Apennines. The Latins were settled south in the plains of the Tiber, and from them it earned its name, Latium. Many different races ruled Rome at different times, but it was the Latin language that the people of Rome spoke from the beginning. The plain of Latium had also, like the land where the Etruscans lived, many cities, of some of them we know a little, and several have been made famous by the stories of old. Lavinium and Alba Longa are the best known, and the latter, which was about twelve miles southeast of Rome, will be mentioned again. The Story of Romulus and Remus History can tell us very little of the beginning of Rome. The name Rome is thought to mean river, and as the city stands on the bank of the Tiber this seems probable, but it is quite uncertain. There is a very old story which connects the founding of Rome with twin brothers Romulus and Remus. The story says that they were grandsons of the king Numitor, who ruled over Alba Longa. Numitor's brother took the throne and ordered the baby grandsons of Numitor to be put into a basket and thrown into the Tiber. The waters in the river ran very high at the time, but when they sank lower, the basket was left standing in the Roman marshes, and the children were fed by a wolf as if they had been its own babies. Afterwards, they were found by a shepherd on the Palatine Hill, and were from that time brought up with his children. Sturdy and strong they grew up, and became in time leaders of a band of brave shepherds. In one of their numerous fights, 
they came to know who their grandfather was, and then they fought for him, and set him upon his throne once more. They thought it would be a good thing to build a city in the place where they had grown up, but the brothers now quarreled, and Remus was killed. Romulus then built his city upon the Palatine Hill. This story has been told in many different ways. Sometimes the father of Romulus and Remus is the god Mars. Sometimes he is only a stranger. The wolf who fed the babies is also, in some of the stories, a woman. There are other stories, too, which tell of the history of the Latin people and the towns of Latium many hundreds of years before. But they are only stories, with so much that we know is untrue, although it is very interesting, that it is wiser not to tell them again. All we know for certain is that some shepherds from Alba Longa built the city of Rome on the square-shaped Palatine Hill, which looks down on the river, probably as a fortress or strong place to prevent the Etruscans coming farther south. But it was built long before the time at which the first king is said to have lived. Romulus was probably a leader of the people, and he is supposed to have built the city in the year 753 B.C. This date is one of the most important in all history. It begins Roman history, and the years have ever been reckoned from it, even to this day. Very early in the history of Rome, we find it already strongly defended against its enemies and with wise rulers for its government. The people were composed of three classes, patricians, who are thought to have been descended from the Sabines, a branch of the Umbrian race, the clients, who depended upon the patricians in some way, and the plebeians, who were people the Romans had conquered, or who had come to Rome for protection against some enemy. The patricians alone, at first, could have a share in the government, be fully protected by the laws, and take part in the Roman religion. The clients, some of whom were slaves, were people who wished to have the protection of the laws and be Roman citizens, and they were able to have these by choosing a patrician as a patron who could represent them in any business with other citizens. The patron and clients had very serious duties to each other. The plebeians were at first people who were almost as free and fully protected by the laws as the patricians, but they did not need to have a patron. Of course, it was not long before these three classes became really two, the patricians and the plebeians, the clients becoming really a part of the plebeian class. Although we do not know much certainly of the reign of Romulus, we do know it must have been a very troubled time. The stories tell of fierce battles with the people who dwelt about the Palatine Hill, and all we know of early Rome shows us that though the language of its people was Latin, the divisions, laws, and customs were largely those of other people. An old story tells of battles with the Sabines, and as we have seen, the real ruling people of Rome were of the Sabine race, showing that they must have been readily accepted as brothers by the Latins. The divisions of the people were, on the other hand, Etruscan. The patricians, who it must be remembered were the real Roman people, for they alone had full rights under the laws, were divided into three tribes— the tribes, again, were each divided into ten parts called curiae. There were, therefore, thirty curiae, and these had each its separate religious ceremonies, festivals, priests, and chapels, together chose the king, and settled questions about when people should be put to death. The curiae were again divided into families, not families like those we speak of today, but more like those of the Israelites, which include a man and all his descendants and relatives. A hundred of the older men formed a body called the Senate and helped the king to rule. The number became greater when the first Romans joined with the Sabine people. All these divisions lasted, though changed in different ways, for hundreds of years, the patricians being the rulers, the senate assisting the chief ruler, and the curiae, or wards, choosing the ruler. 
The king was not like our kings. He was not only the head man among the people, but he was the chief man in the religious ceremonies, offering the sacrifices and consulting the gods, and he actually sat in the courts saying what was right and wrong, punishing the evildoers and protecting the weak. The state was looked upon as a great home, and therefore it had a hall and hearth. On the hearth, devoted women called Vestal Virgins kept ever alight a sacred fire, which an old story said had been brought years before from Troy. The time during which the first four kings of Rome reigned was nearly a hundred and fifty years, and during this time many important things happened. Rome was continually growing, and when King Ancus died early, the whole of the seven hills upon which Rome is built had been taken into the city which had started upon one. The religion of the people had become more fixed. Alba Longa had been conquered and destroyed, though its people became Romans. A bridge had been built over the river to a fortress, a building strongly defended against the enemy and a colony, Austra, had been founded at the mouth of the river Tiber. The fifth king of Rome was an Etruscan, and under his rule and that of the two Etruscans after him, Rome begins to have some of the look of the city which is known to later history. Two other hills were taken into the city, and the seven hills were now surrounded with a great high wall. Vast buildings began to rise, such as the huge temple on the Capitoline Hill. Great drains and sewers were built to carry away the stagnant water which lay in the low places. A circus was laid out, and fights like those which the Etruscans loved to watch were arranged. But the Etruscan kings, the Tarquines as they are sometimes called, because Tarquine is the name of the first and last, gave more than this to Rome. They gave her, above all, a great position in Italy. From the earliest times, the small city-states of Latium, like those among the Etruscans, would join together to form a league. Alba Longa had long ago been the head of one of these leagues of thirty cities. In the league which existed at this time, the Tarquines gave Rome a leading position, and it is probable for the first time brought the city into contact with the Greeks. The Tarquines were proud men and great fighters, and when they had won a victory they would come back to the city very gaily, wearing beautiful dresses and driving in carriages drawn by numbers of white horses. This was the beginning of what became a famous Roman custom— Every great Roman soldier who had won a battle looked on it as his reward to enter Rome in triumph, and these triumphs were sometimes almost as picturesque and fine to look upon as a Lord Mayor's show today. Sometimes the leaders of the enemies were dragged along in the procession, and one time it was thought a great thing to have a number of elephants walking together. And once the soldier entered the city between a long line of elephants holding lighted torches. The people came to like these triumphs, for they could see the great soldier and the strange sights and shout, Hail, Commander, as loudly as they liked. These Tarquine kings had not been lawfully chosen as the Roman laws ordered. So far as we can see, they must have been invaders who seized Rome, but they did great things for the growing city. They did not care much about the liberty of the Romans, and the last of them, Tarquin the Proud, came in this way to be driven from the city. The kings before them had been simple, and on the whole, good rulers. The Tarquins brought to Rome the luxury their people loved. They also increased the number of the senators, and the new senators were chosen from the state's conquered by Rome. They changed the way the army was chosen, though this made the old Roman families very angry. Tarquin the Proud was certainly a bad king, but nothing we know of him really tells us the reason why the Romans, for hundreds of years afterwards, hated the very name of king. He made the Romans feared by all the Latin states around, 
and when he ceased to be king, the Roman power for a time became much smaller. But when his son insulted one of the noblest Roman women, Lucretia, the Romans said that Tarquin should rule no longer, that neither he nor any of his relations should be allowed to enter Rome, and that they would never have another king. Tarquin was not in Rome at the time. He was away fighting one of his many battles, but he did not mean to give up being king without a struggle. The battles which followed showed that although the Tarquin kings had made Rome so powerful, the people had the courage and strength to defend themselves if they wished. The people of two other towns joined Tarquin in his first battle and all marched out to the borders of the city of Rome. But here the Romans met them and defeated the great army. The next battle, a year later, was one in which Tarquin was helped by all the Etruscans under the prince Lars Porcina. It is this battle about which the story of Horatius is told. The Story of Horatius The Etruscan army had marched so near to Rome that only a wooden bridge separated them from the city. It is said that the Roman soldier Horatius kept all the enemy from crossing the bridge until his friends had broken down the bridge behind him, when he jumped into the river and swam safely back. Certainly many Roman soldiers must have fought bravely that day, but the story does not prevent us from realizing that Rome was so thoroughly beaten by the Etruscans that she had to give up all her possessions on the north bank of the Tiber and had to promise to make no more fighting weapons of iron. This last condition she did not keep to very long. A third battle was fought against the Latins, this time led by Mamilius, the son-in-law of Tarquin, but the Romans were once more the winners, and Tarquin ran away to a place called Cumae, where he died. There were to be no more kings, and so the Romans chose two chief men to take their place. It was thought that when there were two, neither would be so strong as to cause the people so much trouble as the kings. The new rulers were called consuls, and later on we find that each consul had certain powers which made it impossible for one of them to be very powerful without the other. Most of the great Romans, whose names we know during the next five hundred years, were consuls. The kings of Rome, so far as we can discover, had reigned about two hundred and fifty years. Very few things are sure in these years, but at the end we know there existed a Roman city, strongly built, with some great and beautiful buildings, with wise laws, and a people brave, orderly, and free. The Rome which we hear of afterwards is one that is almost continually growing in power, and it is the Rome which has made the world like it is today. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 10. Rome and the Celts. The Etruscan people seem to have been at the highest point in their history when the last of the Tarquins was put off the Roman throne. They had been able to seize and hold the rulership of the city for a sufficient time for three kings to reign, and even when Tarquin the Proud had been forbidden to enter Rome ever again, we have seen how the great prince, Lars Porcina, was able to make the Romans do just what he wished. It could not have been easy for the brave Roman people to give up all the land they had won on the north side of the Tiber. Still less easy was it to promise never to use iron swords and spears again. But the Romans did not seem to look on their agreement as being very binding, and about a hundred years after they had been so shamefully defeated, they had almost completely and forever put an end to the power of the Etruscans. 
the long struggle between the romans and the etruscans was really a struggle between rome and the strong etruscan town Vie. sometimes they agreed to fight no more for some time this happened on one occasion for over thirty years and on another for about sixteen years but when the time for which they had agreed to be at peace came to an end each side commenced to carry on the war as vigorously as before rome was all this time becoming more powerful it made agreements with the strong cities and peoples nearby that each would help the other both to defend themselves and to make war upon an enemy the enemies increased as the roman power grew but these other towns kept their promise and so rome was protected from many of her enemies it is just as well that this was so for rome was defeated by the vii not once but very many times on one occasion however when she had made peace with the vii rome regained the city fidine and the land which lars porcina had made her give up thirty years before yet although this might seem to be a great victory it was not long before the people of fidine rebelled killed several romans and joined the king of vii this king was quickly killed by the romans and the city of fidine was taken once again can it be wondered that when the peace they had agreed upon after the last battle was ended the romans made up their minds to conquer the people of vii once for all it was almost exactly a hundred years since lars porcina had conquered the romans rome's first conquest now to take vii was quite a new idea in the roman history this was the first time the romans had ever set out to conquer a foreign state it was the first time too that the army ever went out for so long a time and did not return until it had done what it went to do the long hot italian summer faded into autumn autumn passed into winter and spring came again not once but perhaps ten times and found the roman army still shutting in the great city for it is said that it was ten years before the people of vii gave in there were no great guns as there are now to knock down the walls and the city was very strong it was built on the top of a flat hill and round each side but one there was a deep valley a ravine as it is called on the fourth side the people had built a great wall and dug a deep ditch so that the town was like a small island only it could not have been reached by boats at length after ten years the city was taken and destroyed in the year three ninety six by the brave general called camillus the romans could never have taken so strong a city if they had not been helped by their friends and if the people of vii had not been deserted by theirs the reason why the etruscans did not help their own people who lived in vii we shall see in a moment it must have been a very serious reason for when vii was conquered several other etruscan towns had to agree to leave rome in peace in this way the romans in conquering vii had really conquered the southern part of the etruscan people the early celts the reason why their friends had not come to their help is that they were themselves fighting against an enemy who were now first being heard of in the civilized world many of the boys and girls who read this book are probably related to this new enemy for it is the celts who are the forefathers of the french welsh and irish they were then as now very brave and although in some ways they seem to have been just the same as they are at present in some others less important they were very different from this time we find them marching about almost everywhere gay brave careless not caring for work but loving struggles and battles they found their way from their first home in the east to the far west to france and even to the british isles and in fact it was in france they made their headquarters but they never settled anywhere very long and for the next four hundred years they were dreaded by every nation until the great caesar after years of war made them powerless other people have become soldiers to defend their country against the enemy or to increase their power 
the Celts were soldiers just because they loved it. They were big men with rough shaggy hair and bearded faces. They often wore fine clothing and broad gold bands round their necks. When they were horse soldiers, they made a fine cavalry, but when they fought on foot, they were almost impossible to resist. So daring and careless were they that they went into a battle bareheaded, and they did not throw spears like the Romans. They merely rushed straight at the enemy, and with the long sword, dagger, or lance, cut about them, protecting themselves by a big shield. It was this people who changed the Roman fortunes in so remarkable a way by helping them conquer Vii by fighting against the Etruscans in the north. They did so in an even more extraordinary way, too, as we shall see. Five years after Vii had been destroyed, a band of Celts who had crossed the Alps and settled for a short time on the northeast coast of Italy suddenly made up their minds to cross the Apennine Mountains, and they tried to seize the great Etruscan town Clusium. It was the prince of Clusium who had long before conquered Rome, but now when the Etruscans found the Celtic soldiers at the gates of their city, they sent to Rome to ask for help. The Romans saw that this meant a long struggle far from their home, and so they would not agree to help the people of Clusium. But they sent messengers to tell the Celts to go away. Now all people have agreed to leave such messengers, ambassadors as they are sometimes called, free. And the messengers themselves are, of course, bound not to fight against the people who trust them in this way. But the Roman messengers fought with some men of Clusium against the Celts, and this made them very angry indeed. They asked the Romans to send back to them the messengers who had behaved so deceitfully, but the Romans would not. The Celtic army at Clusium then at once set out for Rome. It was a very large army for those days, about 70,000 men, and they were men who did daring things as if they were quite ordinary. Clusium was about 85 miles north of Rome, and before the Romans had time to decide how to defend the city, the Celts had crossed the Tiber and had arrived at a stream called the Allia, only about 12 miles from the city. It was only at this point that the Romans seemed to have realized their danger, and an army of 40,000 men tried to stop the Celts. The brave Camillus was not in the battle on this day, and so the strong Roman legions went out with very little thought to meet the terrible enemy whom they despised as barbarians. But the sudden rushes of the Celts soon put the Romans in disorder, drove them back, huddled them together, and at last drove them away from the battlefield so filled with fear that they actually left their homes behind and ran for safety to the north of the Tiber. The Burning of Rome The Celts apparently did not think very much of their victory. They waited for three days and then marched into Rome. The gates were open and the streets empty. There were not sufficient soldiers to defend the city, but several had gone to the capital, which formed a fortified castle, and had got together large stores of provisions. The Roman women and children had been sent away across the Tiber, but the soldiers inside the capital were besieged for nearly seven months. The Celts, who, when they had entered the city, found many of the noblest old men sitting at the doors of their houses in their dresses for ceremonies, had at first left them alone, but finally they could not resist killing them. Then they stole anything they fancied and at last burned the city. Still the capital held out. The rock on which it was built was steep, but it was only saved on one occasion by the cackling of the sacred geese, which warned the wearied soldiers one dark night when they had fallen asleep. At length, news came to the Celtic general that his homeland was being besieged, and so he was glad to accept a sum of money to leave Rome. So Rome was free once more. The soldiers and women and children returned, and there were some who were so frightened that they wished to leave the city altogether, 
but the brave soldier Camillus persuaded them to stay and build the city again. So very rapidly and with little order, houses and streets sprang up, and it was owing to this that Roman consuls in later times had to pass laws to see that carts and carriages did not cause constant stoppages in these narrow, inconvenient streets. It was a terrible thing for Rome to be burnt, but it affected its history very little except in one way. All the records of Roman history were burnt in the city fire, and it is owing to this that it is very difficult to say what is the true story of Rome before then. The year 390 B.C., therefore, marks the time from which we begin to know more certainly how the city of Rome fared in its growth from a tiny shepherd's town to the chief city of the world. In no other way did the burning of Rome produce any effect which is worth remembering. End of chapter 10. Chapter 11 of The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 11. Rome, Mistress of Italy. The burning of Rome was not the last Italy heard of the Celts. They had invaded Italy before, and for many years afterwards, they continued to make sudden marches against different cities where they thought they could find things to steal. The distances they marched would be wonderful even now for a large army, but for these days when there were no trains and no way to carry their baggage except on horseback, they must have been extraordinary. Twenty years after the burning of Rome, Camillus defeated them at Alba. A few years later, another Roman general marched out against them, but the Celts seemed to have learned to fear their enemies, for they marched past them towards the south. They were again defeated by the Romans a few years afterwards, but in spite of this, we find this extraordinary people only eight years later calmly settling down for the winter at Alba. They enjoyed themselves in their own way by sudden marches on various cities, where they took everything of value and then returned to the Alban Hill. But the next year, the son of the brave Camillus, who was now dead, led a great army against them, and made them go away. There is a wise saying of an old Roman that manliness, upon which every Roman prided himself, grows in opposition. That is to say, when a man has to struggle hard, he will probably become manly. If a nation knows it is in danger of being attacked by an enemy, it must make it watchful, and this is another thing which the Romans liked, watchfulness. One result, then, of these constant troubles with the Celts, and there were troubles from other peoples, too, was to make the Romans ever stronger and more manly. We must remember this, for it helps to explain why the city of Rome became mistress of Italy rather than any other of the cities. Of course, Rome had a very strong position. It was too far from the coast to be attacked by ships of war. It was in the center of Italy, and so could march north or south with equal ease, and thus meet one of its enemies at a time instead of having them all marching against it at once. And also, it was strongly built on hills. The Celts had taken it very easily, but it would have been very different if the Roman soldiers had stayed to defend the walls. We have seen that by the time the Celts took Rome, the Etruscan power had been almost completely crushed. This does not mean that the Etruscan cities could fight no more, or that there were not still some of them which being far from Rome, still remained free. But while the Etruscans had been so strong long ago that they had put Rome to shame after Tarquin the Proud had been put off the throne, now the best they could hope for was to gain a victory for a moment 
over a small band of the Romans. When the great Roman army marched against them, they were beaten. Some years before the son of Camillus drove the Celts from the Alban Hill, the whole of South Etruria, the country of the Etruscans, was Roman, with Roman fortresses on its boundaries and Roman people living in its towns. But a little later the Etruscans, who became more and more angry as they saw the Roman power creeping always farther into their country, rebelled. Three of the great Etruscan towns sent their soldiers against the Roman army, and when they had taken some men in the battle, they cut them to pieces in the marketplace. This horrible act was soon punished, for in the year that the Celts settled on the Alban Hill, the Roman took from one of these cities, Caer, half of its land and put the city under Rome. The other towns were forced to say they would do nothing against Rome for a long time. The Etruscan power sank lower and lower. The Celts were taking part of what had been their land in the north, and the Etruscan rulers of the city, which were free, ruled so badly that the lower people fought against them, and the rulers asked the Romans to help them. They did, but the cities were not free any longer afterwards. THE GROWTH OF ROMAN POWER All this time the Romans were growing in power in the south, too, so that by the time that she was really mistress of Etruria, she was mistress of all Italy. But this was at the cost of many battles. The Latins did not at all like the Roman position in the Latin League. We have seen that it seemed a very fair agreement, but it really came to mean that Rome used all the strength of the Latin cities as if it was her own. The Romans even took care to keep the Latin cities under them, for when they made an agreement with Carthage for the Latins, the Carthaginians promised not to fight against the Latin cities if they remained friendly to Rome, and if any of them rebelled, it would put them again under Rome. This was very bitter to the cities of Latium, but so many of them had attempted to rebel against Rome between the burning of the city and the year of this agreement, and each had been conquered with so little difficulty that it is hardly to be wondered at that they did not rebel at once again. But the ill feeling was there, and apparently the Romans knew it. Before, however, the Latins attempted to fight against Rome, that city went to war with a very powerful race of hillmen who lived to the south of Rome in part of the highland which runs through the heart of Italy. Many years before, bands of these hillmen had poured down into the plain of Campania, south of Latium. They seized the large and important towns Capua, which had before belonged to the Etruscans, and Cumae, which was a Greek settlement. These Samnites, companions as we may call them, settled down in the new country and very soon became less hardy and brave than their relatives who still lived in the hills. But the hillmen came down again and again, and the companions began to fear them so much that at last they sent to the Romans to ask for help. The Romans compelled the Samnites to make peace. Whether they would have been so content to make peace, we do not know, if they had not feared a rebellion of the Latin cities. The storm quickly burst. The companions, jealous of the Roman power, which they had been so glad to call upon when they were in danger, joined the Latin cities, and the position of the Roman army seemed almost hopeless. They had gone south to help the companions, and now the armies of the Latin cities stood between them and home. The Latins, on their side, seemed to feel that, if they were ever to be free, this was their only chance. At the terrible battles of Mount Vesuvius and Trifanum, the great army of the Latins and companions was thoroughly beaten, and in the next two years the Roman army completely conquered all the towns that still held out. The League of Latin Cities came to an end forever. These victories made Rome mistress of the plains of Latium and Campania. In some cases Rome made agreements with the separate cities, but other towns had a far different fate. 
the walls were pulled down and the inhabitants were sent away from their homes or they were made into colonies and these were dotted about over the country so as to protect rome against the attacks of her enemies the colonies were really very often fortresses and they would be used to gather roman armies together thus fragile the name of a colony on the road called the latin way was on the river lyris and therefore would protect an army wishing to cross it on the way to campania this colony would be like a roman sword between latium and the companions the roman army could march swiftly down this road and be quite sure that food and all that was necessary would be ready for them in the colony we can easily see from the wise way rome did its work that there must have been many great and wise men in the city and if the acts of the romans sometimes seem very cruel we must remember that they thought, as the cities around them very clearly thought also, that against such wild and savage fighters as the Celts and Hillmen, not Rome alone or any one city could be successful, but only Rome with the army of the Italian cities faithfully helping them. So the battles in Latium continued until the last resistance was finally broken down, when Pervernum was taken and its leader was executed in Rome. Only a few years after this, war broke out once more with the Samnites. The hillmen had objected to the Romans making colonies on the very borders of their land, but they had not sufficient wisdom to object strongly enough at the right time. The Romans had therefore made themselves very strong in Latium before the second struggle broke out. The story of this war is not very interesting, but the Romans suffered one shameful defeat in it which we must mention. At first, however, they were everywhere victorious, so much so that the Samnites even grew so frightened that they asked the Romans to be at peace. The Romans were fused, and now the Samnites fought even more vigorously, as men will when they have nothing to hope. Misled by false news, the Romans were led to march through a place which was shut in on both sides by high hills. The entrance to this place was very narrow indeed, and so was the outlet from it. It seemed very terrible and mysterious as the army marched quickly through, but they were thoroughly frightened when they found at the outlet a great barrier with hundreds of Samnite soldiers behind it. Quickly they marched back, only to find that the entrance had been stopped in the same way. On the hilltops on both sides they now saw the Samnite soldiers. They could not move backward or forward. They could not fight as they had been used to, and so they were compelled to give in. That was bad enough, but it was not all. The Samnites made the Roman generals promise to destroy the strong town for Jele and another colony, and to make a league with the Samnites. Then the Samnites made the disgraced Roman soldiers put their weapons on the ground and go under the yoke, it asked, creep under a spear which rested upon two other spears stuck upright in the ground. This was the most shameful thing that could happen to any soldier, for it meant that he who went under the yoke owned that the others were completely his master. The conquered generals had promised to do what the Samnites had asked, and so had been allowed to go back to Rome with the army. But when they told the Romans what they had agreed to do, the Romans were very angry and refused to do these things. This was, of course, very dishonorable, for if the generals had not agreed, they would not have been allowed to go home. But the Romans thought that they could not give up all that they had won just because two of their generals had fallen into a trap. They prepared to go to war again. A new Roman army was formed quickly, and the Samnites were defeated, and themselves made to pass under the yoke. The Romans must have enjoyed paying the Samnites back for the shame they had made them suffer. The battle was at Luceria, over the Apennine Mountains, 
in the southwest of Italy, and the town was made into a fortress to protect the Roman power there. Other victories followed, and so the Samnites, by trapping the Romans, had not destroyed the power of Rome as they thought. They had simply made it more powerful still. For she now had a strong colony to the east of the country of the Samnites. A great Roman road at this time was built to Capua. It was the famous Appian Way, good roads joining far-off colonies, colonies in strong towns in a district which had been made Roman. These were the chief ways in which more and more of Italy fell into the power of Rome. When the war with the Samnites was over at length, after twenty years, it might have been thought that the Romans would have been finally acknowledged as rulers of Italy, especially as their wisdom in peace was even greater than their courage and skill in war. For the Romans very seldom were cruel to their enemies. They generally offered to let them enjoy some of the privileges of being a Roman citizen, if they promised to help their conquerors and to be faithful to them. Now, after the war with the Samnites, more fortresses were built, and more of those strong, straight roads to carry the Roman armies swiftly from one to another. Yet the Samnites could not easily give up their freedom and acknowledge the Romans their masters, and this is what those strong towns up and down Italy meant. They were really chains. Whenever and wherever the Samnites wished to leave their hill country, they found a strong Roman colony in their way. The Etruscans had recently rebelled against the Romans, and now they made up their minds to try once more, but this time they intended to join with the Samnites. The Romans found another enemy marching against them. The result of this was that the Romans had to fight armies in the far south of Italy, in Campania and in Etruria. But although there were times when it looked as if the future mistress of the world would be destroyed, Rome came out of this terrible war victorious once more. Again, colonies were settled over the conquered country, one being far south on the Appian Way, and no fewer than 20,000 colonists were sent there. In this way, the south was made Roman. The two large states in the south of Italy, Apulia and Lucania, being put under her. She was not so strong that wars could not arise again, but with the exception of the struggle with the Greeks in Italy, which must be told in the next chapter, almost the whole of Italy had now been conquered by Rome. She had fought for several hundred years, but now, in the year 290 B.C., when strong towns in almost every part of the country reminded men of the Roman power, she was practically mistress of the whole of Italy. The practical, orderly spirit of the Romans had made itself felt. The clever men in the city, ruling while their brothers fought in the distant wars, or wisely deciding what to do in the many difficult questions that arose, with whom they should make friends, whom they should treat mildly, whom they should punish harshly, had really made Rome the great city she was. The Romans had not the imagination of the Celts, nor the artistic feeling and curiosity into the reasons of things which marked the Greeks, but they had a strong practical common sense, a wisdom which was more valuable than either in fitting them to rule over many peoples. Now this strong young nation is to be brought face to face with the old and splendid Greek race. Perhaps one might regret that the Romans won, if it were not that, by that fact, much of the beauty and splendor of ancient Greece has been preserved for all time, for peoples in the most distant ages to enjoy and grow better through them. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of the Story of the World, a Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. The Story of the World, a Simple History for Boys and Girls, 
by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 12, Rome and Carthage. Last of all the people in the south of Italy whom the Romans fought and conquered were the Greeks. For a long time the Romans left them alone, for they guessed that the Greek cities of Italy would ask help from other Greeks in Greece proper or some of the Greek colonies. This is what actually happened. One of the chief Greek towns in South Italy was Tarentum. It was built by men from Sparta in the days when so many Greeks sailed away from Greece proper and settled in Italy. It was a large and beautiful town, but for many years before it actually quarreled with Rome, it had been ruled very badly. It was not like Sparta, an aristocracy, but was a democracy of the worst sort. The people had no idea of keeping their tempers and acting wisely. When they were angry, they would do anything to take revenge on their enemies, and never thought whether it was just or not. They were very jealous of the Romans, and afraid that they would conquer them as they had conquered the other peoples of Italy. But instead of going to war in a straightforward way with Rome, the people of Tarentum did a very mean and wrong thing. A Roman fleet had sailed into their harbor and was lying there peacefully. The people of Tarentum rushed suddenly upon the ships. The Romans were taken by surprise, and five of the ships were easily taken by the Tarentines. The men on them were either killed or sold into slavery. The people of Tarentum, frightened of Rome, sent across the Adriatic Sea to the little kingdom of Epirus to ask its king, who was a Greek and a relation of Alexander the Great, to come and help them against Rome. Pyrrhus was the name of this king, and he was so handsome and brave and such a fine soldier that it has often been said that he was nearly as wonderful a man as Alexander the Great. But this is not quite true. He was a fine soldier and could win battles, but he had not the imagination to make much use of them. He would win at all costs, but often lost so many men that winning did not seem of any use. Even now we speak of a victory or a success of any kind which is not of much use to the winner as a pyrrhic victory. The First Fight Between Greeks and Romans Pyrrhus in his little kingdom of Epirus, which was really under the Macedonian power, was glad of the chance of going over the sea to fight for the people of Tarentum. He collected an army, and he took with him some elephants, and crossed the sea to Tarentum. Near the town he fought with a Roman army under one of the consuls. The Romans had never seen elephants before, and partly because of the strangeness of an army like that of Pyrrhus, they were defeated. It was the first time that a Roman army had fought against Greek soldiers, and the Greeks won. But it was only an accidental victory, and the Romans were much too used to winning and too sure of their own strength to think much of it. When Pyrrhus sent a messenger to the Senate to try to arrange conditions of peace, one of the senators, Appius Claudius, who was old and blind, persuaded the Senate to send a message back to Pyrrhus, telling him proudly that the Romans never talked of peace with foreign soldiers on her land. So next year another battle was fought, and again it was a Pyrrhic victory, and Pyrrhus then left Italy and crossed to Sicily, where the Greek colonies were fighting once more with the Carthaginians. He helped the Greek cities there, but as he himself seemed to treat them as a conqueror, they turned against him, and so he went back to Italy. Once more he fought against the Romans, but this time he was defeated and went back to Greece. Three years afterwards, he was killed in a fight after taking part in several of the struggles which were still going on among the Greek states. After his departure from Italy, Tarentum soon became an ally of Rome, which sounded as though she was still free, 
but she had to pull down her walls and join Rome in her battles if she was asked to do so. In a short time, Rome had conquered the whole of South Italy. She soon began to think about conquering the island of Sicily, too. This island was so near to Italy that it would be very dangerous for the Italian state if it belonged to anyone else. At the time when Rome had won all the south of Italy and began to think about conquering Sicily, the island was still divided between the colonies of Carthage and those of Greece. For seventy years after the Greeks had won the great victory of Himera over the Carthaginians under Hamilcar, there had been peace between the two peoples in Sicily. But the Carthaginians had never forgotten Hamilcar. Seventy years after his death, a quarrel broke out between two Greek towns in Sicily. One of them asked the help of the Carthaginians, and Carthage gladly sent help over to fight against the town of Salinas. The chief ruler in Carthage was Hannibal, the grandson of Hamilcar. He was very pleased at the idea of fighting the Greeks in Sicily and winning, as he hoped, a great victory. He himself collected a great army from Africa and Spain, for the south of Spain had been conquered by Carthage and crossed over to Sicily. With his great army, he destroyed Salinas, killed thousands of its people, and marched on to Hymera to take revenge for the defeat of his grandfather seventy years before. Again, he won a great victory and destroyed Hymera. His soldiers murdered the people in the streets until Hannibal gave the order to stop. But the people who had not been killed immediately were treated even worse. They were taken to the place where Hamilcar had last been seen and there killed as a sacrifice. The Carthaginians, in spite of their wealth and power, were never really civilized. They offered sacrifices of men and women and even children to their gods. Hannibal now went home to Carthage, but four years afterwards was persuaded to go again to Sicily. This time he besieged the town of Agrigentum, even pulling up gravestones outside the town for his men to stand on when they threw their weapons into the city. But the plague broke out among his soldiers. Hannibal thought this was a punishment from the gods for his having touched the graves of the dead, and he immediately offered a sacrifice of a child, hoping that the gods would forgive him. But he fell ill himself and died, and in the fights which followed, the Greeks won. For 150 years after this, the Greeks and Carthaginians were at war in Sicily, though sometimes peace was made for years. Then at last, Rome was ready to interfere and take Sicily for herself. In any case, it was certain that now that Rome had become so strong, she would have a struggle with Carthage, the only other great power in the West, to see which should become, in the end, the greater power. The struggle began over Sicily, but after the island was won by the Romans, it went on for more than a hundred years until Rome had won all her lands from Carthage and completely destroyed that proud city itself. A town in Sicily called Messana, which is now named Messina, had been taken by some rough soldiers from the south of Italy. They were really robbers and had no right to the town. The people in the country near were very much afraid of them, and Hero, the ruler of the great Greek colony in Sicily called Syracuse, made up his mind to fight against Masana and drive the robbers out. The robbers asked help of Rome and of Carthage. The Romans knew that they ought to help Hero, who was their ally, but they were so afraid of Carthage getting power in Masana that they said they would help the robbers there instead. But some of the robbers let Carthaginian soldiers into Masana. These fought against the Roman soldiers, and so the great struggle began. Rome's First Ships 
The Carthaginians were so great by sea that the Romans knew it was on the sea they must fight if they were to win. But so far, Rome had never had a fleet. The Romans knew nothing either about building big ships. The only ships they had were the old-fashioned Greek boats with three rows of oars. The Greeks and Etruscans in Italy did know something about shipbuilding, and as these people were now really part of the Roman state, the Romans got them to help them to build new ships. A Carthaginian ship which was wrecked and washed up on the coast of Italy was examined and copied. A whole forest of trees was cut down, and a fleet of a hundred ships was made. But the Romans did not yet know anything about managing ships, and for many years after this, many of their ships were wrecked in storms because the sailors did not know what to do when danger or difficulty came. But they fought against the ships of Carthage and won great victories. They managed to do this by fighting at sea, much as they would have done on land. Each Roman ship had a kind of bridge with a great sharp hook at the end, and when a Carthaginian ship came near, the bridge was let down over its side, the hook caught it and held it fast, and then the Romans swarmed over the bridge onto the enemy's ship and there fought a hand-to-hand fight. In the first sea fight between Rome and Carthage, fifty Carthaginian ships were destroyed, Then the Carthaginians would fight no more, and the Romans sailed proudly home, carrying the brass figureheads of their enemies' ships, which they fastened to a pillar which was put up in the Forum, the great marketplace at Rome, in memory of Rome's first victory at sea. Many more ships were built after this, and in a later battle we know that there were at least 300 ships on each side. After several years of fighting at sea and in Sicily, the Romans made up their minds to land two great armies in the north of Africa and fight Carthage at home. After another great victory at sea, the armies landed. The Carthaginians then sent messengers to discuss conditions of peace. But the Romans said they must not only give up to them the islands of Sardinia and Sicily, but they must also destroy their own fleet and send ships to help the Roman fleet when required. The Carthaginians were naturally very angry at such a request and determined to fight the matter out. The Romans were so confident that they called one of the armies back to Italy. The other was left under a brave commander called Regulus. He had a large army, but the Carthaginians got together a still larger one and they had large numbers of horse soldiers. Regulus might have got horse soldiers for himself from some tribes which were in rebellion against Carthage, but he did not, and when the fighting took place, the Romans were defeated. Regulus was taken prisoner and later killed. A story is told, and it may be true, that he was sent to Rome with messages for the Senate, but he had promised to give himself up again to the Carthaginians if the conditions of peace which the Carthaginians offered were not agreed to by the Romans. It is told that Regulus himself persuaded the Senate to say no to these conditions, for the people of Carthage were now, in their turn, asking too much. So Regulus kept his word and went back to be killed. After this, too, the Romans were very unfortunate in their fights with the Carthaginians on the sea. The fighting went on for years. Altogether, the First Punic War, as it was called, lasted 17 years. In the end, peace was made, and Carthage agreed to give up Sicily and the small islands near it. Soon afterwards, when Carthage was having a great deal of trouble with some of the paid soldiers who had rebelled against her, the Romans suddenly seized Sardinia and Corsica too. At the time, the Carthaginians could not do anything, but Hamilcar, their ruler, who had made the peace with Rome, was now filled with a deadly hatred. He devoted the rest of his life to revenge. 
he saw that he would have a better chance of getting together an army of splendid soldiers if he went over to Spain. The people of Carthage were rather tired of the struggle with Rome and could not understand Hamilcar's feeling of deadly hatred for her. They were quite pleased when he proposed to go to Spain and devote himself to getting together an army there. There were already many Carthaginian colonies in that country, and Hamilcar conquered more and more of the land until there was a large new kingdom there. He drilled the Spaniards and made them into fine soldiers. For years he did this, content to prepare his revenge and leave it to others to carry out. When his little boy was only nine years of age, he told him solemnly all the wrongs which Rome had done to Carthage, and the boy swore an oath to avenge his country when he had grown to be a man. Hannibal the Great The boy, whose name was Hannibal, grew up to be one of the greatest soldiers who have ever lived. After his father's death, when he himself was a young man of twenty-six, he fought against Rome, and though Rome was now a great nation and Carthage was fast going to ruin, he almost won in the fight by his immense cleverness and courage. But he made two mistakes. He thought that the people of Italy, whom the Romans had conquered, would be glad to join him in fighting them. But this was not so, for the Italians had by this time settled down happily under Roman rule. He thought, too, that the people of Carthage would be anxious to send him help, but again this was not the case. By this time the Roman people had learned all about ships and shipping. They had a great navy, and so when the moment came for Hannibal to attack them, he chose to do it by land. He made up his mind to lead a great army out of Spain and into Italy across the Alps. It was early spring when the army began its march, and in the mountain passes the weather was bitterly cold. The men who guarded them went back to their homes at night, and so Hannibal chose to lead his army across in the darkness. Nearly all his horses and elephants carrying the baggage slipped down the steep precipices and were killed. Before the Alps were crossed, half of the men of his great army were dead, either through falling from the rocks or overcome by the terrible cold. The other half arrived in the plain of North Italy, tired out, but still full of courage and ready to fight. Hannibal was suffering from a terrible soreness of the eyes through great cold, and one eye became blind. The Romans did not know anything of Hannibal's plans until he had nearly reached the Alps. Then they sent an army to Spain to prevent him getting any more men or food from there, and for ten years Hannibal had to depend on what he could get in Italy. For he stayed altogether fifteen years in that country, fighting desperately and always hoping for the help from Carthage, which came at last, but too late. He marched from the north to the south of Italy, winning three great battles, for he was a splendid general, and when he actually got the Romans to fight, he often won. At the Battle of Cannae, it is said that 80,000 Romans were killed, and that Hannibal sent 10,000 gold rings to Carthage, taken from the fingers of the dead Roman nobles, to show how great had been his victory. It was a dreadful misfortune, but the Roman people and Senate never lost heart for a moment. New soldiers were enlisted, and the defenses of Rome itself were made stronger. Hannibal was never able to take Rome itself, and for years he remained in the south of Italy, hoping for help from his brother in Spain and from the people in Carthage. At the same time, Scipio, a brave young Roman general, was fighting the Carthaginians in Spain and took for Rome their capital there the great town called New Carthage. Hannibal's brother had been left to rule in Spain, but Hannibal was always hoping that he would be able to come with a new army to help him in Italy. At last he came, but was met by a Roman army in the north of Italy. His army was destroyed, and he himself killed. 
The first that Hannibal heard of it was when the head of his brother was suddenly thrown into his camp. It was a terrible warning, and Hannibal, full of grief and horror, cried, I see the doom of Carthage. The Romans, too, felt that this was a turning point in the struggle. They went nearly mad with joy, crowding to their temples to praise their gods. The women, dressed in their most beautiful clothes, took their children with them to join in the thanksgiving. Hannibal still waited sadly in the south of Italy until he was called back to defend Carthage itself. Scipio had left Spain, where he had won all the lands belonging to the Carthaginians and had taken an army into North Africa. The Carthaginians begged Hannibal to come back and defend them, and so after fifteen years in Italy, he sailed away to his own country again. It is said that he cried as he looked back on the Italian shore, for he knew that he would never now have the thing which he had spent his life to win. At Zama, near Carthage, he fought against Scipio and lost. At last, Hannibal gave up all hope. He himself advised the people of Carthage to make peace with Rome. He knew that there was now no hope that Carthage should be greater than Rome. Hannibal must have been all the more sad when he remembered that his long and bitter struggle with Rome would make the Roman people harder in their conditions of peace. These were, indeed, terribly hard for Carthage. She had to give up her navy, except a few warships. Five hundred of the ships were burnt by the Romans, under the eyes of the people of Carthage, just outside the harbor. All her land in Spain was now to belong to Rome, and each year for fifty years she must pay a large sum of money to Rome to make up to the Romans for the expenses of the war. The Carthaginians had to give up all their prisoners, too, and though they were allowed to keep their own laws, they were to fight against the enemies of Rome when she asked them, and so they could hardly be called free from this time. Carthage had, indeed, hardly made good use of her wealth and power, but it is impossible not to feel sorry for her fall. So ended the Punic Wars. Later we shall see how Carthage dared once more to rise up against Rome, and how she was burnt to the ground. Hannibal was dead before this. For some time after he made peace with Rome, he stayed in Carthage, and did all he could to bring order and prosperity to the city. He found that when the affairs of the city were properly managed, the money could be paid each year to Rome, and yet less need be taken from the people in taxes. But some of the people said that Hannibal only wanted to make them rich, so that he could make them fight Rome again. They even told the Romans that he was plotting with their enemies, and messengers were sent from Rome to Carthage, asking that Hannibal should be given up to the Romans. But he had made up his mind to escape and sail away to another land. He was afraid that the people in the ships in the harbor of Carthage would stop him, so he invited all the captains to a great feast and begged them first to lend him the sails of their ships to make an enormous tent in which the feast should be held. This they did, and when they were all rejoicing and making merry, he slipped away to his ship, and even when it was known that he had gone, it was many hours before the ships could be got ready to follow him. He fought for some years on the side of first one enemy of Rome and then another, but these were the days when the Romans were winning in all their battles, and at last Prussia's king of Bithynia, whom he was helping, agreed to give him up to the Romans. But Hannibal preferred to kill himself rather than be given into the hands of his lifelong enemy. When he knew that all the doors of his house were guarded by soldiers ready to take him if he should come out, he drank poison and so died. His life story is very wonderful and strange, but it was a pity that so clever a statesman and so brave a soldier should have given his whole life to a hopeless revenge. End of chapter 12
Chapter 13 of The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 13, Rome and the East. The Battle of Zama and the peace with Carthage in the year 202 BC made it clear that no other power could become as great as Rome in the west of Europe. She had now for her own practically all Italy, Sicily, Corsica, Sardinia, the Carthaginian lands in Spain, which stretched over a great space in the north and another in the south. Carthage and the north of Africa were allied with her and must fight against any enemy of the Roman people if asked to do so. It was almost certain that Rome would, when she found herself so strong, try to conquer more land in Western Europe. But immediately after the peace with Hannibal, she naturally turned her attention to the east of Europe, where the states were fighting among themselves, and no one state was strong enough to conquer the others. We saw how after the death of Alexander the Great, his empire was divided into many kingdoms, some of which were governed by Greek rulers and others not. More than a hundred years had passed, since the death of Alexander, when the people of Rome turned their attention to the east. The Macedonian kings since Alexander had always kept their rule over the greater part of Greece, though some of the towns on the coast had set themselves free. But in the days of Philip V, king of Macedon, some of the Greek cities joined together in leagues to try to free Greece from Macedonian rule. As this Philip V, sent help to Hannibal in his fight with Rome, the Romans sent help to a league which was struggling against Philip. And when peace was made with Carthage and Rome had less to trouble her in the west, she sent an army to fight against Philip in earnest. He was defeated in the great battle of Cynocephaly, and so ended the Macedonian rule over Greece. The Romans were always very full of admiration for the greatness and beauty of Greece. They were so practical themselves and had so little of the natural gift for art and beauty that they were filled with a kind of wonder at the beautiful things which had been done and written by the Greeks in the past. It was partly this, and partly perhaps for other reasons, that Rome, having freed Greece from the Macedonians, declared that she would leave her free to govern herself. This proclamation was cried aloud at the Ithmian Games at Corinth, when, as usual, a great crowd of people from all parts of Greece had met together for the festival. The people were full of joy at the good news, and it was said afterwards that they broke out into a great cry of gladness, which could be heard on the seashore miles away. The Greeks, to show their gratitude, set free many Roman prisoners who had been taken by Hannibal and sold to them as slaves. But the old weakness of the Greeks was to bring them, after all, before long, under the rule of Rome. The states were still always quarreling among themselves, and it was natural that Rome should interfere and, in the end, make up her mind to rule Greece herself. Meanwhile, she had to deal with other people in the east. Antiochus, king of Syria, was anxious to gain power in Egypt, and the Egyptians had asked for help from Rome. Antiochus was a friend, too, of Philip V of Macedon, but had not been able to help him against Rome. As soon as the Romans had left Greece, one of the leagues asked Antiochus to help them to fight against Rome. Antiochus was anxious to win some of the lands which Philip of Macedon had lost, but he was defeated first in Greece and then in Asia Minor. He had to give up most of his lands and pay a large sum of money to the Romans. After this, the whole of Asia Minor belonged to Rome. 
Philip V of Macedon was still full of anger against the Romans, and was always planning and plotting to win Greece again for Macedonia. But he could do nothing. When he died, his son Perseus became king, and he was even more anxious than his father to take his revenge on Rome. At last, the Romans sent an army to fight against him, and he was completely defeated. Perseus was taken prisoner to Italy, where he died some years later, and Macedonia now also belonged to Rome. It was the custom for the Roman generals who won great battles to have a triumphal procession through the streets of Rome on their return. The triumph of Aemilius Paulus, the general who had defeated Perseus, was most significant. It lasted three days, and the Romans, dressed in the white robes, which they always wore on days of festival, crowded to see it. On the first day, 250 wagons went in procession, filled up with beautiful Greek statues and pictures which the conquerors had brought from Macedonia. On the second day, wagons carried great piles of beautiful polished armor and swords and other weapons taken from the bodies of the Macedonian soldiers who had been killed, and great piles, too, of silver cups and bowls also taken from the conquered. On the third day, the triumph was most magnificent, but even the Roman people felt how sad it was, for behind a number of young Roman men leading great oxen, decorated with flowers and ribbons, to be killed in sacrifice, there followed all the gold cups and plates taken from Perseus himself. Behind this was his chariot, carrying the armor and the crown which he would never wear again, then came the three children of Perseus, surrounded by their teachers and servants, who held out their hands to the crowd, as though asking for pity. Paulus, in his splendid chariot, came last, but in front of him walked Perseus, clothed in black, looking down at the ground, and seeming so heartbroken that all the people were sorry for him. The End of Greek Freedom Perseus was the last civilized king against whom Rome fought. After this, her empire grew larger and larger, but after the fall of Greece, it was against barbarous, or at least only half-civilized, people that she had to fight. For years before the conquest of Macedonia, the Greek states had been quarreling among themselves and complaining about each other to Rome, who often interfered to put things right. But after the conquest of Macedonia, the Romans became harder towards Greece. Some Greeks had been glad when Perseus fought against Rome, and one thousand of the noblest of these people were carried off to Rome and kept prisoners there for seventeen years. At last, when one of the leagues tried to force Sparta to join them, in spite of Rome forbidding them to do so, war broke out. The Romans, of course, won, and Corinth, a city which had been especially bold in the rebellion, was by order of the Romans burnt to the ground, and at last Greece was made into a Roman province and governed by a Roman governor. It was in the year 146 BC that Corinth was burnt and the freedom of Greece lost forever. The beautiful statues and works of art of which Corinth was full were sent off to Rome. It is said that the Roman commander who sent them off told the owners of the ships that if any were broken, they would have to be replaced by others of the same value. He was a rough soldier and did not understand that these things could never be replaced, for only the great Greek artists of a time gone by could make them. But the more educated Romans did understand this, and from this time onwards they were constantly learning about and imitating the art and literature of Greece, and it is through the Romans that we today have learnt so much from the old Greek civilization. In the same year in which Corinth was burnt, the Romans destroyed Carthage too. They had long wished to do so. There was one man in the Senate named Cato, who ended every speech he made for several years with the words, Delenda este Carthago, Carthage must be destroyed. 
It will be remembered how, by the peace made with Hannibal, it was decided that Carthage might never again fight an enemy without permission from the Romans. The king of Numidia, a country close to Carthage, was very friendly with the Romans, but always annoying Carthage. Rome would never give the Carthaginians permission to fight against him, but at last they could stand it no longer, and did so. Immediately, the Romans made up their minds to punish them. The Carthaginians were told that they must destroy their own city, but they said they would not. They shut their gates against the Roman army which was sent against them. For three years they stood a terrible siege. There was an immense wall all round the city, and inside the women joined with the men making javelins and other weapons to fling at the Romans. When the horsehair which was required for certain weapons ran short, the women cut off their own long hair to take its place. The Carthaginians fought like lions. Sometimes a band of soldiers would come out to the walls and scatter the Romans, but in the end the Romans were able to prevent any food going into the city and later broke in. There was fighting for three days in the narrow streets. Houses were burnt and women and children were buried in the ruins. The town was completely destroyed, and Romans cursed the ruins. So ended the Third Punic War, the last traces of a great empire and of a people who, with all their faults, had done wonderful things on sea and land before the Romans were ever heard of. Rome had now power over practically all the lands round the Mediterranean Sea except Egypt. She soon finished the conquest of Spain and the south of Gaul, which is now called France. Most of these lands were already Roman provinces governed by Roman governors, and those which were not immediately made into provinces very soon became so. It will be interesting to see what changes all these victories had made in the Romans themselves. End of chapter 13. Chapter 14 of The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 14, Last Days of the Roman Republic. Great changes had come over the Roman people during the time they had been conquering the lands round the Mediterranean Sea. In the old days, the Romans had lived very simply, and every member of a family did exactly what the father said. The Roman women had been very serious and very noble. Even now it is considered a great compliment to say that a woman is like an old Roman matron. But when the Romans began to fight farther from home, the fathers of families were often away for a long time, and the old family life disappeared. In the old days, too, the Roman people had lived very simply, but as some of them grew richer, they began to live very differently. Some of the women cared for nothing but amusing themselves, and dressed themselves in fine clothes, and wore a great deal of jewelry. Some of them left their children to be looked after altogether by slaves. The boys in rich households were given lessons by slaves brought from Greece. Often these were not very good men, and though they taught the boys to read and write and to understand the wonderful writings of the Greeks, they did not teach them how important it is to be good and truthful and unselfish as the Roman fathers had taught their children in the old days. Of course, there were some exceptions, and we shall hear about two noble Romans who had a splendid mother who brought them up in the good old way. The fact that some people grew very rich while others became very poor was another great change from the days when every Roman had a little land of his own and none was either very rich or very poor. 
Now the rich people all over Italy bought great quantities of land, and the poorer Italians gave up their lands. Some went into the towns and others to the wars, and many soldiers, when they came home from the wars, had nothing to live on. The rich new landowners had many foreign slaves who could take care of the sheep and cattle on the lands, and who were often treated very much like animals themselves. They were often driven to their work with a master standing over them all day, and then locked up at night, great numbers together, for fear they should escape. Land, which had been used by the farmers in the old days to grow corn, was now left to feed the sheep and the corn was brought in from other countries. So Italy soon began to have three classes of men, the rich landowners, the poor Italians, and a number of slaves, many of whom were in the greatest misery. Sometimes the slaves in one part of the country or another would rise up and attack their masters, but they were always put down, and it was a long time before anyone thought of doing anything for them. Then, too, the government of Rome had changed by degrees. It was now the Senate which really settled everything, and the people no longer had any power. The people were supposed to choose the consuls and other rulers, but as no ruler held power except for a short number of years, and as the consuls were nearly always away fighting, the Senate soon got all real power. The senators belonged to just a few families among the rich people, and though they knew all about fighting, they had no idea how to make things better for the poor people and slaves, and did not even think about it. Then again, in all the lands under the rule of the Romans, only those people who were Roman citizens were really safe, and could get protection for their lives and their property from the government. Long after this, we shall see how St. Paul, because he was a Roman citizen, got the right to be taken to Rome to be judged by the ruler there. There were many of the Italian allies who thought that, as they had helped Rome in her wars, they should have the same rights as her citizens. It was a long time before the Senate would grant this. Such was the state of things in Rome in the last hundred and thirty years B.C. But during this time, some Romans began to see that there must be a great change in Italy and in the Roman state. One great man after another appeared to try to put things right. It is the time in which the greatest men in Roman history lived, and at the end of this hundred years, the greatest of them all did at last put things right. We shall see now who those men were and what they did. Many of them belonged to the same rich families as the senators, but were different from them in understanding something about the troubles of the other people. Two Noble Romans The first of these great Romans were two brothers, Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus. They belonged to a noble family in Rome, but their father died when they were quite young. Their mother was a noble Roman matron of the old sort. She was beautiful, and many nobles asked her to marry them, and so did at least one king. But she always said no, for she wanted to give herself up altogether to taking care of her boys. When other Roman matrons would show their beautiful ornaments and jewelry, she would smile and show them her sons, saying that they were her jewels. Tiberius was nine years older than Gaius. Their mother had them taught by Greeks in the new Roman way, but she herself taught them to be good and kind and to think of others more than themselves. They grew up splendid men and lived and died for their country. Tiberius became a soldier and fought in Africa and Spain, while Gaius was still having lessons at home. But he was not content, like other soldiers, to fight and win for Rome. He saw the misery all over Italy, and he saw, too, how the soldiers who came back from the wars had no land on which to grow things, as in the old days of Rome, and how they stayed in the town, where the people were becoming poorer 
and more ignorant and rougher every day. The consuls, or chief rulers of Rome, had always been patricians, and had not always thought enough of the happiness of the plebeians, as the people who were not nobles were called. At one time the plebeians had threatened to leave Rome and set up a new city for themselves, but it was then agreed that they should have magistrates of their own, called tribunes of the people, to see that no wrong should be done to the people by the other rulers. Tiberius Gracchus was one of these magistrates. Tiberius became a tribune of the people. He tried to get a law passed to take some of the land away from the rich people and to give it to the soldiers back from wars so that they could become farmers and live happy and useful lives in the country. The rich people were very angry, and they got the other tribune, for there were always two, to veto the law, that is to say, he was against it. In the old days, if a tribune vetoed a law in this way, that was the end of it. But Tiberius saw that the Roman government had become very bad indeed. Instead of the old Roman people, farmers and soldiers who used to choose the tribunes, here was now a crowd of rough people spending their days lying about the streets of the city. Tiberius thought that tribunes chosen by such people did not matter much. He knew that his law was good, and he tried to force the Senate to do what he wanted. Those lands which really belonged to the state were indeed taken away from the rich men, and men were appointed to arrange how they should be given out to the poorer people. But before this was done, Tiberius Gracchus was murdered in the streets of Rome by a crowd of angry and terrible people who had been told by his enemies that he was really trying to make himself king. The name of king had been hated by the Romans ever since the early days, when the last of the Tarquines had been chased from the city. A few years afterwards, Gaius Gracchus began over again the work his brother had tried to do, and began it in a wiser and better way. Gaius was an even finer man than his brother. He was as full of pity for the people and as eager to make them happy but he had learned from his brother's mistakes that it would not do to go against the Roman government, so he did his best to make that government better. For a long time, although the land had been taken from the rich people, it was not divided among the others, and many of the rich men hoped it would never be given up. But Gaius Gracchus became tribune and at once began to try to settle about the giving out of the land. As he knew the Senate was against him, he tried to put new men into it, but the old senators would not have them. He also wanted to give the Italians in all parts of Italy the rights of Roman citizens. This would have been a very good thing, but it made the people of Rome very angry, and Gracchus tried to please them and make them agree with his plans by doing another thing which was not very wise. We have seen how rough and ignorant the people of Rome had become. Gaius thought he could get them to agree to his plans by giving them very cheap food, and so they were allowed to buy corn and bread from the state for less money than it cost the state to buy it. When the people in the country round about Rome knew this, they too crowded into the towns, and there were soon more rough and idle people than ever there. For years after this, every Roman ruler had to try to please the people by giving them cheap bread. In the end, they did not pay anything at all, but demanded as their right, panem and circenses, bread and circuses, for in the end the rulers had to give them free amusements as well as free bread. The people of Rome liked Gaius Gracchus for his own sake, too. He was a splendid speaker, and when he made speeches, he would walk restlessly up and down, speaking in a quick, eager way which the people liked. But his enemies were too many for him, and the Senate set up another tribune who promised the people even better things than Gracchus had given them. He was chased like Tiberius through the streets of Rome, and when he saw that he was to be killed, 
he told a faithful slave to kill him. The slave did so and then killed himself. His body was found beside his master's. So both these noble sons of a noble mother died in the attempt to make their country happier and better. The Gracchi were only the first of a great number of men who were to give their lives in the attempt. Although the Senate had overcome the two Gracchi, they themselves were never again so much respected by the people. Their government became worse and worse. In the conquered countries, the Roman governors often ruled very badly, although things had been made better by Gaius Gracchus. He had passed a law by which governors were to be tried at home if the people they governed accused them of having taken money from them wrongfully. But though this law did some good, it could not altogether put things right. Sometimes these governors even took money from the enemies of Rome. Another very bad thing for Rome was that the soldiers had become very different from the soldiers of Rome's early days and were now very hard to manage. As a matter of fact, the only thing which could save Rome and bring order into her vast empire was that some strong man who could manage both the soldiers and the state should seize power. Over and over again in this hundred years, it seemed that this man had come, but there was always something weak or wanting in the character of each, until in the end, the great Julius Caesar, one of the greatest men of all time, rose to do the work. It is true that he was killed as his task was finished, but Augustus, who came after him, had the way made ready for him. In the days just after the death of Gaius Gracchus, there were two men, great soldiers, who tried to put things right. One was Caius Marius, a young man who was born and brought up as a peasant, but who rose to be one of Rome's greatest soldiers and statesmen, and Lucius Cornelius Sulla, a man of noble birth and very rich. The two men were very different. Marius was rough but honest. He had very little education, but he was a splendid soldier, and he was anxious to make the lives of the people happier and better. He hated the rich and noble men who often lived very bad lives and cared only to make themselves richer, while the people of Italy and in all the provinces of the Roman Empire were growing more and more unhappy. Sulla was an example of the things Marius hated so much. He was well educated and knew a great deal about Greek art and literature, but he did not make good use of his knowledge. He gave himself over to pleasures of the worst sort. He was horrible to look at. Naturally, he was not very healthy, as he lived so irregularly, sitting up drinking and feasting through the night. He had blue eyes, but they had a curious stare, and his face was covered with ugly spots. A Greek gesture spoke of Sulla as a mulberry sprinkled over with meal. Marius fought in a war with Jugurtha, the ruler of Numidia in North Africa. Jugurtha had tried to make his country, which had been an ally of Rome ever since the days of Hannibal, now independent of Rome. The first man sent to fight him had been bought off, and Jugurtha was said to have spoken contemptuously of Rome as a city for sale, ready to fall into the hands of the first bidder. The way in which a small country like Numidia was able to defy Rome shows how bad things had become. It was Marius who, in the end, conquered Numidia and forced Jugurtha to give himself up to the Romans. Sulla was fighting under Marius at the time, and he and his friends said that it was he who had captured Jugurtha. Sulla had a ring made with a picture on it of Jugurtha giving himself up to him. However, Marius was allowed a splendid triumph on his return to Rome, in which Jugurtha walked as a prisoner before he was dropped down into the terrible Mamertine prison, which was really a damp pit with water at the bottom. There he was left to starve to death, for the Romans had no mercy for an enemy like this. The Barbarians Against Rome 
Meanwhile, new dangers from new peoples were threatening Rome. There was a fresh movement among the barbarian peoples of Central Europe. Here, some Celts and many Teutons, both people of the great Aran race to which the Greeks and Romans belonged, were beginning to move west and south in search of new lands and new homes. At one time it seemed that they might conquer Rome itself. Many Roman armies were sent across the Alps to fight them and prevent them crossing into Italy. There were now regular passes across the Alps into Italy, and the march was not difficult as in the days of Hannibal. The Roman armies were destroyed time after time by the barbarians until Marius led an army into Gaul and won a great victory over the barbarians there. When he got back to Rome, he heard that another great barbarian army had crossed into the northeast of Italy. He marched against this, too, and won another great victory. He saved Italy from the barbarians, and after this, it was the Romans who went against the barbarians and won lands from them, so adding new provinces to the empire. For five years, one after another, Marius was elected consul, although he was away from Rome fighting. This was a new thing, and it showed how the people were beginning to feel that the man who ruled the soldiers was the really important person in the state. By this time, of course, Marius had put order into the army. There was no longer any question of the soldiers disobeying their officers, and they all adored Marius. They were no longer men who became soldiers for a short time and then went back to their homes, as in the early days of Rome, but they stayed with the army for many years, and they would do anything their general told them, obeying him rather than the state. Marius had not much idea of how to make things better in Italy itself, but both he and Sulla did their best in fighting against the Italians, who suddenly demanded those rights of Roman citizenship which they had wanted for years. As the Romans still refused to give these to them, they said they would have nothing more to do with Rome. The Italians, except the Romans, were to form a separate state with a new capital called Italica. They also made up their minds to destroy Rome. Marius and Sulla easily prevented this, but in the end the Italians won their right to citizenship, though only those could vote who could and would go to Rome to do so. In a few years, however, the citizenship was really given to all Italian free men, and so the whole of Italy became the real center of the Roman Empire. In the end, this made things much better for Rome and Italy, but things could never be really right until the strong man should come who could settle Rome's troubles once and for all. Marius and Sulla were becoming more and more jealous of each other every day. Marius was now growing old, and when Mithridates the Great, king of Pontus in Asia Minor, began to attack the Roman allies in Asia Minor, it was Sulla who was appointed to lead an army against him. Marius was very jealous and tried to please the Italians by some new laws and so get them to give him the leadership of the war instead of Sulla. But Sulla marched with an army against Rome and Marius had to run away. He was caught and put in prison and was even condemned to die, but the slave who was to kill him would not do it and the judges let Marius go. He fled to Africa, and then Sulla went off with his army to the east. But as soon as he had gone, one of the consuls named Cinna tried to get together a number of men to vote that Marius should be called back in spite of the Senate. On the day of voting, fighting broke out, and thousands were killed in the streets of Rome. Then Marius came back with an army, joined Cinna, and together they killed without mercy every man, sick or poor, who had been against Marius. Then the two named themselves consuls without any election, but Marius died in a few days. The people were glad, in spite of all that Marius had done for them in his early days, 
for they were full of horror at the terrible bloodshed which he and Senna had caused. Sulla, meanwhile, had put things right in the east, and now sent word that he was coming back, and would take vengeance on the people who had murdered his friends. Cinna meant to fight against him, but was killed by his own soldiers. The Samnians and other Italians joined the enemies of Sulla, for it was the popular party of Marius and Cinna which had given them the rights of Roman citizens. Sulla came back and won victories everywhere. The Samnians marched to take Rome, but he defeated them also, and the 8,000 whom he captured were not even kept as slaves, but were killed on the campus marshes. Days of Bloodshed Sulla was determined to get rid of the whole popular party. He drew up long lists of the richest and most important men on that side and had them hunted out and killed. These lists were put up in the forum and the people crowded to read them. No one knew what name might next appear. The near relations of Marius were first on the list. Sulla had had himself made dictator, the first for over a hundred years. He added new men to the Senate and passed laws giving it all power in the state. The tribunes and the popular assemblies, which had done so much for the Romans in the past, had no longer any real power. With all power in his own hands, Sulla showed no shame in taking his revenge. The body of Marius was taken from his grave and thrown into the river Anio. New lists were drawn up one after another, and often they had in them the names of men who were not really enemies of Sulla, but whose lands or money he wanted for himself. It was now that the young Julius Caesar showed something of what he was to be later. Marius had married an aunt of Julius Caesar, although he himself was but a peasant, and she belonged to one of the oldest noble families of Rome. Julius Caesar, in his term, was married to Cornelia, the daughter of Cinna, so he was related to both the great leaders of the popular party. Sulla ordered him to leave his wife, but Julius Caesar loved Cornelia dearly, and he said he would not, although he knew that Sulla might kill him, as he had killed so many other people. However, this did not happen, for his friends protected him. Sulla let him off, though he said that Caesar would one day ruin the nobles, for he was more than a Marius. But for a time, Caesar kept quiet, and Sulla had things all his own way. When he had made the Senate quite strong, he gave up his power and went to live in his country house near Rome. He called the people of Rome together to tell them that he was going to give up his power, and he had great quantities of food given out to the poor so that they might feast in his honor. There was so much food that some had to be thrown away. He then sent away the soldiers who had guarded him as ruler and walked through the streets of the city, although he knew that there were many people who hated him and he might be killed at any moment. The people were too surprised to attack him, and he went off to live his curious life in his own way, drinking and feasting night after night for weeks, and then suddenly giving up all his time to hard study and reading. When he died in a few years, his body was given a splendid funeral by the Senate. He had ordered that his body should be burnt, for he was afraid that some enemy might treat it later as he had treated the body of Marius. Some of the Romans preferred to be buried, and others cremated or burned, but the family of Sulla had previously always been buried. Sulla is one of Rome's great men, but there is very little to like or admire in him. He fought for the Senate and the noble families to which he belonged, but he was a bad, selfish, and proud man, and though he brought some kind of order into the state, he did it with a terrible cruelty that was quite unnecessary. Sulla had only been able to settle Roman affairs for a time. So long as he lived, no one dared to go against the government of the Senate, which he had tried to make strong. But when he died, 
a change was at once felt. The Senate soon found that its powers were taken from it in the same way as before by the strong men who ruled the army. The Great Julius Caesar One of these was newest Pompeius Magnus, or as he was afterwards called, Pompeius the Great. Another was the great Julius Caesar. Each of these did great things for Rome, and in the end there was a great jealousy and struggle between them as there had been between Sulla and Marius. Both men were fine soldiers. Julius Caesar, of course, was one of the finest generals who have ever lived. Both were handsome men. Pompeius was six years older than Caesar. Both were born about 100 years B.C., from the first, Caesar shows himself a stronger man than Pompeius, for when Sulla told them both to give up their wives, Pompeius did so, but Caesar refused. At first, Pompeius took the part of the Senate, but later he went over to the popular party, and the people almost adored him. Caesar, from the first, took the people's part. He also was much loved, and in time the people forgot Pompeius and thought only of Caesar. Caesar was a tall, handsome man with dark hair and black eyes, which lit up his pale, rather thin face. He looked, above all things, very noble and distinguished. His family, which was one of the oldest in Rome, was said to be descended from the goddess Venus. Caesar always thought a great deal about dress, and he wore his girdle around his tunic in a very loose way, which was the fashion among the noble young men of his day. When he was quite a young man, Caesar took part in the pleasures and feastings, for which the Roman nobles were being so much blamed at the time. But he was never really frivolous. He seems to have done these things more in a spirit of mischief than anything else, he always meant to do great things, and he did them. For some time after the death of Sulla, Caesar was content to help Pompeius to gain power in the state. But the great statesmen of the time had to be great soldiers, too, and soon Pompeius had to leave Rome to fight her enemies far away. Rome was then being threatened by three sets of enemies. The Mediterranean Sea was full of pirate ships, which often took for themselves the ships carrying corn to Italy. Sometimes, too, they would attack a ship and take as prisoners any rich men they found on it and refuse to let them go until their friends paid large sums of money in ransom. Caesar was once taken prisoner in this way by the pirates. He spent his time reading to them some speeches which he had composed. At the same time, he told them that he would kill them when he got the chance. And so he did. When his ransom was paid and he was free, he fitted out a ship and went against these same pirates, captured them, and killed them every one. Pompeius determined to chase the pirates from the sea, so he got ready a great fleet of ships and went out to fight them. He divided his ships into thirteen sets and sent them out to different parts of the Mediterranean. After some fierce fighting, the sea was quite cleared of the pirates, and Pompeius came back to Rome in triumph. Pompeius helped, too, in putting down the famous gladiators' revolt. This broke out a few years after the death of Sulla. Pompeius was in Spain, and it was Crassus, the richest man in Rome, who put down the revolt, but Pompeius came back in time to help at the end. The gladiators in Rome had been, at first, prisoners taken in war. They had been made to fight until one or other was killed. At first, these shows only happened at funerals, but later on they became the greatest amusement of the Roman people. The strongest prisoners and slaves were chosen and trained in schools to be used merely to amuse the people. In every fight, one or other of the gladiators fighting must be killed, and the stronger the men and the more desperate the fight, the better pleased the people were. No wonder the gladiators were miserable, and now at least two hundred of them from a big school at Capua tried to escape. 
80 did get away, and they chose for their leader a big barbarian from Thrace called Spartacus. He was a brave and wise man. Other slaves joined him, and there were risings all over Italy. But in the end, Spartacus was killed, and 6,000 of his followers were crucified along the Appian Way, the great street leading out of Rome into the plain of Campania. The rising of the gladiators is but another example of the disorder and unhappiness in Italy at this time. But in the Far East, another enemy had to be faced. Mithridates of Pontus had been defeated by Sulla, and his soldiers chased out of Greece and the other parts of the Roman Empire which he had attacked. But he was now giving trouble again, and was being helped by Tigranes, the king of Armenia, who had even conquered Syria and Judea. It was not for some years that the Senate sent out an army against them, and when they did so, though it conquered Mithridates, who fled to Tigranes in Armenia, the soldiers would not obey their commander. Pompeius now went out and soon conquered both kings. Mithridates died, and his kingdom was joined to Bithynia, and the two became a Roman province. Tigranes was driven back into Armenia, and Syria became another Roman province. From this time, the land in Asia, as far as the Euphrates, belonged to Rome either directly as provinces or as kingdoms governed by kings dependent on the Romans. When Pompeius got back to Rome after being away four years, he was granted a triumph. Great slabs of bronze were carried before him on which were engraved the story of the great things he had done in the East, how he had conquered kingdoms, set up new cities, and captured 800 ships, and made treaties which it was hoped would give peace to the Roman Empire in the East at last. In the procession walked 300 princes of the East whom Pompeius had brought back as prisoners. But in spite of all this, the people were not so glad to see Pompeius as he had expected them to be. Caesar was now first favorite with them. Another trouble to Pompeius was that the Senate refused to agree to the settlements he had made in the East. This was foolish, for Pompeius had done things very well, but the Senate was growing ever weaker and more foolish. However, Caesar agreed to help Pompeius, who was married to his daughter Julia, whom Caesar loved very dearly for her own sake and that of her mother Cornelia. The two great men agreed to join with a third, a very rich man named Crassus, to take the government into their own hands. The Senate was too weak to prevent this. Caesar got the people to approve Pompeius's doings in the East. He himself became consul for one year, and then got himself made governor of the Roman provinces in the south of France, or Gaul, as the country was then called. Caesar's chief reason for wanting this was his wish to drive off the barbarian tribes, which were now ever threatening to swarm over into the Roman Empire itself. A tribe from the country which is now called Switzerland was pressing towards the Roman province of Transalpine Gaul, the part of France on the other side of the Alps from Italy which belonged to Rome. That part on the side of the Alps nearer to Italy was called Cisalpine Gaul. Caesar immediately led his army against them and conquered them, and this was but the beginning of wars which lasted nine years, and in which Caesar conquered all the land which we now call France and Belgium and part of Germany across the Rhine, and added them to the Roman Empire. The story of these wonderful wars was written down by Caesar himself, very simply, and without any sign of pride. The books he wrote are called The Commentaries on the Gaelic War, and the story is so simple and yet in such good and pure Latin that it is one of the first writings to be given to boys and girls to read when they are beginning to study the Latin language. The story is very exciting of how Caesar fought with his legions, and especially his favorite 10th legion, 
against great hordes of barbarians who, in spite of their bravery, were in no way equal to the splendidly trained Roman soldiers with their splendid arms and weapons. If any one could have conquered Caesar, it was the heroic leader of the Gauls, named Vercingetorix. But in the end, he was captured and taken to Rome to be led in triumph and then killed. It was while he was conquering Gaul that Caesar crossed over to Britain in the year 55 BC. The Britons had somehow heard of his coming, and their soldiers, with their blue eyes and fair hair, and their bodies painted all over with blue, were ready to meet him. The sea was not deep enough for the ships to sail right to the shore, so the Romans had to wade to the land. We are told that they did not like this, and some of them held back, but the standard-bearer of the Tenth Legion dashed into the water and called to the soldiers to follow him unless they wanted to see their standard taken by the Britons. This would have been a great disgrace. So the Romans fought their way to the shore, but they did not stay long in Britain. Next year they came again, and this time had some real hard fights with the Britons. The Romans won, but again sailed away, taking only a few British prisoners to show the people at Rome that Britain was conquered. But this was not really true, for it was a hundred years before the Romans came again and began really to conquer Britain as a province of their empire. It has often been asked why Caesar was so anxious to win Gaul for Rome. There must have been many reasons. He was anxious to do great things because he felt he alone could do them. It was said that when he was quite a young man, he was one day reading the story of Alexander the Great and suddenly burst into tears. Someone asked him why he was weeping, and he answered that it was because Alexander had conquered many nations when he was his age, and he as yet had done nothing great. Perhaps, too, Caesar was anxious to show the Roman people that he could do even greater things than Pompeius. Even during the years he was in Gaul, he would come down to the south to consult with Pompeius and Crassus about the affairs of Rome, or to meet senators who came to show him honor, for the Senate was becoming more and more afraid of the great soldier and statesman of the time. Crassus went off to the east, hoping to do great things there, and so make himself seem equal to Caesar, but he died and then there were only Pompeius and Caesar left to fight for power in Rome. Julia, the wife of Pompeius, died too, and so he felt less bound to Caesar than before, and he was dreadfully jealous of him. When Caesar's work in Gaul was done, the time had come for him to return to Rome, and he offered himself as consul for the next year. Some of the senators, and especially Cato, a descendant of the Cato who had hated Hannibal so much, were dreadfully afraid of his return. They were afraid that he would do away altogether with the old Roman government, the Senate, and consuls and tribunes, and all the things that had become useless, since, as we have seen, it was the great generals like Pompeius and Caesar who really ruled the state. But there was one great difference between Pompeius and Caesar. Pompeius never quite made up his mind to do away with the Senate, whereas Caesar, they knew, would have no pity for it, but would try to give good government in his own way. These men did all they could to prevent Caesar being consul, but when he saw this, he led his army into Italy, saying as he crossed the little river Rubicon, which divided Gaul from Italy, Alea jacta est, the die is cast, as though he was playing a game of dice and had taken the throw, and so knew he could never turn back. Both this expression and to cross the Rubicon have become proverbs. When the Senate and his enemies heard that Caesar was marching upon Rome, they fled in terror, and when Caesar arrived, there was no form of government left. The people, however, made him dictator. He knew that Pompeius, who had fled to the east, could get together a great army there, and that he already had one in Spain. 
So Caesar did not stay long in Rome, but went off to Spain to conquer the army of Pompeius there. He conquered them, and then let them go free, for Caesar was not cruel when fighting against his countrymen, though he had not shown much mercy to the Gauls. Then he hastened after Pompeius to the east, where he defeated him. Pompeius, now feeling very tired and old, fled to Egypt, but as he stepped on shore, his head was cut off by one of the generals of the king of Egypt. His body was thrown into the sea, but afterwards taken out and buried by a faithful slave. Caesar followed Pompeius to Egypt, and the head of his enemy, once his friend, was shown to him in triumph. But Caesar was shocked and surprised and burst into tears at the sight. Caesar stayed some months in Egypt, and it is said that this was because he had fallen in love with Cleopatra, the sister of the young Ptolemy, as the ruler of Egypt was called. But he had work to do elsewhere, for in different parts of the empire the friends of Pompeius were still ready to fight. But Caesar conquered them all, and then went back to Rome as dictator once more. He had already, in the short time he had stayed in Rome, tried to settle the affairs of the country and the empire, and he now turned his attention altogether to this work. He had not many months to do it in. He did not try to make a new way of government, but he kept all power in his own hands. In Rome, he said that only a certain number of people, and these the very poor, should receive free bread. He made the number of slaves in Italy much smaller. He raised the number of senators to 900, and the Senate now had in it men from the middle as well as the higher class. But it could never again have any real power. Above all, Caesar himself appointed the governors of the provinces of the empire, and they had to account to him for their government. From the time of Caesar until the great Roman Empire broke up, the government remained in one man's hands, and this man was the emperor. Caesar himself was sometimes, but not always, called by the name of Imperator, but after his day it became the regular name of the ruler. Several times attempts were made to crown him king, but Caesar knew that the name had been hated for centuries by the Romans, and he was afraid that they would turn against him, although they treated him almost as a god. He was careful to please the people, and had great festivals prepared for them at which gladiators would fight against each other in the theater. Caesar would be present, but only to please the people, for often he was quietly writing his letters and not looking at the performance at all. Once, when he was sitting at the games in his chair of gold, dressed in purple and with a golden wreath of bay leaves on his head, Anthony, one of his friends, suddenly came up to him and placed a crown on his head. As he did so, he said, The people give you this. But Caesar took the crown from his head and said in a loud voice so that everyone could hear, I am not king. The king of the Romans is Jupiter. And he sent the crown as an offering to the temple of Jupiter. All the same, there were many people who said that Caesar was a tyrant. They wanted what they called liberty, forgetting all the terrible things which had happened when the government of Rome had grown old and all the good things Caesar had done for the state. So it was that even the friends to whom Caesar had been most loving and kind had a certain feeling of enmity against him and joined in a plot to kill him. The Death of Caesar Among the great men of that time was Cicero, the great writer whose splendid speeches are often given to boys and girls to read when they have learnt enough Latin to read Caesar easily. Cicero was not a great statesman and never really knew which side to take, but although he too was sorry that the days of liberty were over, he could not help seeing how much good Caesar had done for Rome. He knew how many dangers threatened Caesar, and at least once, warned him in a splendid speech in the Senate to take care of his life, which was so valuable for the state. Caesar was naturally without fear. 
He had no patience to be always on his guard against danger, and made his wife and his best friends anxious, because in the end he went about without the guard of soldiers which he had had at first. Of course, he could not guess that even some of his friends had joined with his enemies in a plot to kill him. He was warned by an old man who was supposed to be able to tell things which were going to happen to beware of the Ides of March, that is, of the 15th March, the very day he died. The night before, his wife Calpurnia could not sleep, being full of strange dreams and fears. In the morning, she begged him not to go to the Senate house, but he would not stay at home. As he stood that day in the Senate, without sword or weapon, a number of men pressed around him as though they were going to ask him some favor, when suddenly he saw that they were going to strike him with their swords. There was no chance for him, but he was going to try to fight when he caught sight of Decimus Brutus, a man who had fought against him for Pompeius, but who had since been his friend. Caesar had treated him like a son, and the shock of seeing him among his enemies was very terrible. He said three words, Et tu, Brute! You also, Brutus? And then, seeing that he must die, he drew his toga over his face and fell at the feet of the statue of Pompeius, which he had had put in the Senate house. There, as he lay, they stabbed him to death, and then stole away while the news went through Rome that the tyrant was dead. There was one man, Marcus Antonius, who did justice to Caesar's memory. He was not so much a friend of Caesar as ambitious for himself, and he hoped that by showing the people how cruel and mean the men were who had killed Caesar, he would be able to get the power of the state into his own hands. A few days later, the body of Caesar was carried into the forum to be publicly burned, and there Antonius, who was a splendid speaker, made the people weep with the story of Caesar's wrongs. He told them, too, how Caesar had left all his gardens and some of his money to the people. He asked them not to be angry with the murderers, but he showed them Caesar's blood-stained clothes, and pointing to the holes in them, said the names of those who had struck the blows. The people became almost mad with anger and sorrow, and old soldiers threw their armor and women their ornaments and jewels into the funeral fire. Marcus Antonius became the hero of the moment. He was named Dictator, and war broke out between his party and those of Caesar's murderers. But there was another man anxious to avenge Caesar's murder who was to show himself greater than Antonius. This was the young Octavius, the nephew of Caesar. Caesar had adopted him as his son and left him most of his money. It was almost certain that he meant him to rule the Roman Empire after him, and so he did. Octavius became emperor of Rome and was called Augustus. From his time, there was never again a chance of the old senatorial government coming back. Julius Caesar had made the empire, and Augustus inherited it. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 15 early days of the Roman Empire. The way in which the young Octavius took up Caesar's position and began to act at once as though he had a claim to be emperor shows how strong Caesar had already made his position. Octavius was a very handsome young man. There is still a bust of him in the British Museum in London, which shows that he had the features of Julius Caesar, but with a much softer and younger look. He showed himself a great man in the way in which he took up Caesar's work. Antonius did his best to keep him from seeming too important to the people, 
and for a time Octavius had to divide the empire with him. The murderers of Caesar and their party were hunted out, and hundreds of them killed. Octavius was far less merciful than Caesar to his countrymen. But when this was done, the jealousy between Octavius and Antonius showed itself plainly. Antonius, thinking all was safe, gave himself up to pleasure. In Egypt, he met Cleopatra, who had charmed Caesar some years before. But Antonius fell so much in love with her that he could not leave her, even when he knew Octavius was coming to fight him. He spent his days with Cleopatra, who sailed in the eastern Mediterranean in a ship coated with gold and with purple sails and oars of silver. When at last Antonius and Cleopatra did prepare a fleet to fight with that of Octavius, it was easily conquered, and the two fled back to Alexandria, Cleopatra's home. Octavius followed them, and Antonius, in despair, killed himself. When Cleopatra heard that Octavius meant to take her back to Rome to lead her in triumph through the streets, she too tried to kill herself. But Octavius was very anxious to show her in his triumph, and she was not allowed to have any weapon. She managed, however, to get a basket of beautiful ripe figs sent to her. This seemed quite harmless, and she was allowed to have them but underneath them was an asp, a kind of small snake. Cleopatra knew that if it bit her, she would surely die, and when the time came, she put it on her bare arm and so killed herself. Two of her women slaves, who were their mistress's favorites, killed themselves too. Octavius now made Egypt a Roman province. The First Roman Emperor When he got back to Rome, there was no longer anyone to take his empire from him. It was now that he was first called Augustus, and under him, now for the first time for years, there was peace in all parts of the great empire. Augustus loved peace, and he loved learning and poetry, too. He gathered scholars and poets round him. The greatest of all was the poet Virgil, who wrote the great poem called the Aeneid, one of the most wonderful poems ever written. The people who lived in the days of Augustus and the emperor himself were full of admiration for the great history of Rome. It was the emperor who asked the poet to write a long poem on the beginnings of its greatness. The Aeneid tells the story of the adventures of Aeneas, who the Romans believed was the son of the goddess Venus and Anchises and the ancestor of Julius Caesar and Augustus. Augustus, like Caesar, was head of the state and head of the army. The great empire, divided into provinces, was ruled by governors appointed by him, and every Roman citizen could appeal to the emperor. Julius Caesar had given the rights of Roman citizens to some of the people of Gaul, and later they were given to specially favored cities throughout the empire. The great roads which the Romans knew so well how to build had already begun to stretch out across the empire. The Roman legions were always marching along these roads. Colonies of Romans were sent to distant provinces, and messengers were constantly going to and from Rome and the provinces to let the emperor know what was happening in all parts of the empire. Roman civilization spread through the empire. Where there were already towns, the life there became Roman, and in a country like Britain, where there were hardly any towns, the Romans built new ones. All the towns in England, which have names ending with Chester, were built by the Romans. Chester is the later way of writing castra, the Roman word for camp. London was already in existence when a hundred years after Caesar's invasion, the Romans came really to conquer Britain, but York was founded by the Romans. When the emperor Claudius sent soldiers to conquer Britain a hundred years after Caesar's invasions, 
The Britons fought fiercely, and it was many years before the whole of Britain was conquered. Everyone knows the story of Caractacus, the brave British chief who was taken prisoner to Rome and spoke so bravely that the emperor set him free. Everybody knows, too, the story of Boadicea, the British warrior queen who fought as bravely as any man against the Romans, who had whipped her and insulted her daughters, and how, when she knew she could not win, she poisoned herself and her two daughters, and so escaped from the Romans whom she hated. But Britain became a Roman province and was covered over with the strong walls and the towns which the Romans knew so well how to build. In most of these towns set up by the Romans, they built great baths and theaters so that they might live and amuse themselves as their countrymen did in Italy. Even though the world was growing more civilized, the old terrible fights between gladiators or the hunting of wild beasts to death in the circus were the chief amusements of the Romans, and they spread them all over the empire. For hundreds of years, nothing changed very much in the empire except that sometimes bad emperors came after good ones. But even this did not make a very great difference except to the people in Rome, for there were now a great number of officers and servants who did the emperor's work for him. It was while Augustus was still emperor that Jesus Christ was born in the kingdom of Judea, ruled by King Herod, but dependent on Rome. At the time, no one noticed it except a few poor shepherds and the wise men of the east. King Herod, who had been warned of the birth of a king, thought he was killed with the other babies of Judea when he ordered all the boys under two years old to be killed. But later, men knew that this was the greatest thing that has ever happened in the world, and all the things which have happened since are counted from that date, so that the letters A.D., meaning Anno Domini, or the Year of Our Lord, are used instead of B.C., which stand for Before Christ, in giving dates after this time. The Coming of Christianity When the Christian religion began to be preached by the apostles and those whom they taught about our Lord, the fact that all parts of the Roman Empire were so united made it possible for the faith to spread more quickly. It was along the great roads of the empire that the preachers traveled, and it was chiefly in the towns that they stayed to convert and baptize the people. St. Paul traveled on these roads in Asia Minor and Greece, preaching the gospel to Jews and Gentiles, as the Jews called those who were not Jews, too. Everyone knows how Paul had first been against the Christians and then had been converted, and how he understood much better than the other followers of our Lord that the gospel was to be preached to all nations and not only to the Jews. St. Paul spent his life, as he tells us himself, in journeying from place to place, telling about the teaching of our Lord. In Athens and Corinth, which are still great cities, but where people now lived bad lives, he made converts to Christianity. In Ephesus, he was nearly killed by the crowd when he preached against their idolatrous worship of Diana of the Ephesians. In the crowd were many men who lived by making images of the goddess, and they were angry for fear the people would no longer want those images. At Jerusalem, the Jews who were still against our Lord complained that Paul brought Greeks into the synagogue. The Roman governor was told that he disturbed the peace, but Paul, being a citizen of Tarsus, a place which had received the rights of Roman citizenship, appealed to Caesar. The emperors who were still of Caesar's family still kept this name. The emperor who was ruler after Augustus was his stepson Tiberius. Then came Claudius, and now Nero, the last emperor of this family, was ruling. St. Paul was taken to Rome, and though a prisoner, he was allowed to preach. 
He was given a house in Rome, but always had to go about, chained by one hand, to the soldier who had charge of him. The Cruel Emperor Nero St. Paul was very unfortunate in coming to Rome during the reign of Nero, who was one of the cruelest and most terrible men who have ever lived. When he was a young boy, he was bright and handsome, and a great favorite with the Roman people. He became emperor when he was seventeen years old, and in the next year he poisoned his brother Britannicus, for fear he might try to make himself emperor in his place. Later, when he wanted to marry a woman whom his mother Agrippina did not like, he made up his mind to kill his mother, too. He presented her with a beautiful ship with sails of silk, but it was so made that when it got out to sea, it would split in two. When his mother went on the ship, Nero kissed her with every sign of love, although he hoped he was sending her to her death. She was nearly drowned, but was saved by some fishermen, and then Nero had her stabbed to death. Nero spent his time in luxury and most terrible wickedness. He loved to hurt people. Suddenly, in the midst of all this, a great fire broke out in Rome, and almost the whole city was burned to the ground. People said that Nero had set the city on fire for his own amusement, and that while it burned, he stood on one of the hills outside Rome and sang verses from Homer on the burning of Troy. The tale may be true, for Nero seemed quite mad at times. But afterwards he grew frightened lest the people should turn against him, and so he said that it was the Christians, the people with the strange new religion, who had done this thing. And so he had the Christians of Rome hunted out from their quiet homes where they lived good and holy lives, spending much of their time in prayer. Nero thought he would kill the Christians and amuse the Roman people at the same time, so he had them tied to poles in the theater, wrapped in cloths, dipped in oil, and then set fire to them so that they burned like living torches. It was a dreadful sight, but Nero rode round the circus enjoying it, until at last even the Roman people, used as they were to terrible sights of bloodshed, begged that it must stop. Paul was not among the Christians who were burned, but both he and St. Peter were killed soon after. St. Paul, because he was a Roman citizen, was allowed the honorable death of being beheaded, while St. Peter was crucified like his master. But before long, everyone grew tired of Nero. He was terribly vain and thought himself a great artist and poet. He became terribly ugly through eating and drinking too much, and all near him trembled at his anger, for it might at any moment mean death for them. He preferred to stay at Naples rather than Rome, and it was here that he heard that the generals of the army had risen against him, and that the Senate had condemned him to die. The Senate, of course, had now no power, but it suited the leaders of the rebellion to make use of them. There was nothing for Nero to do but kill himself. For a long time he held the dagger to his throat, too frightened to strike the blow, but a faithful servant, who saw that it was the easiest death for his master, gave his hand a sudden push, and so Nero died. In the next year, four emperors succeeded one another, being put forward by the different parts of the army. Vespasian, the last of the four, was followed by his son Titus, who was famous for his great siege of Jerusalem, which destroyed that great city and put an end to the life of the Jews as a nation. The Jews had always hated the Roman rule, partly because, although the Romans tried not to interfere with the Jewish religion, yet they could not help doing so to a certain extent. But it was a mad thing for the Jews to rebel. Jerusalem was a wonderfully strong city with wall within wall, but Titus was determined to destroy it, and after a terrible siege, the town and the temple were burnt to the ground. 
a million Jews were killed, and a hundred thousand sold as slaves. After this, the Jews were scattered all over the world and have never since had a country of their own. It was in the time of Titus, too, that the great cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum, two of the richest towns of Italy, were destroyed, but in another way. Pompeii stood at the foot of Mount Vesuvius and was like a smaller Rome with baths and theaters and many shops. The Romans used to go there to make holiday. Suddenly, with very little warning, the volcano became active, the earth shook, and then the burning lava poured out from the mountain and buried the cities. Some people got away, but many were buried under the lava. Some years ago, men began to dig out the buried cities and found them very little different from what they were in Roman days. Even the bodies of the people may be seen preserved by the layer of lava poured over them and lying in the positions of fright in which they died. After the death of Nero, the Christians had been left alone for a time. As a rule, the Romans did not interfere with the religion of the peoples they conquered. They set up temples to their own gods in the provinces, and very often the people worshipped them as well as their own. But the idea spread that the Christians were against the state, and then they would, from time to time, be asked to show honor to the gods of Rome as a proof that they were not. This they could not do, as they knew it was wrong to pretend to believe in these gods. Some emperors left the Christians alone, and they went on quietly converting others, some rich and some poor, bringing happiness for the first time into the lives of slaves, who now found a religion which said that all people were equal in the sight of God. In days of persecution, the Christians had to worship in secret. In Rome, they made those underground passages, which are now called the catacombs, and which we can still visit and see the graves of some of the martyrs. For here the Christians of Rome buried their dead and held their services, especially in times of persecution. The bodies of the dead were placed on shelves opening into the wall, and a slab of stone or marble was then placed in front. Sometimes there is not any name or mark on these slabs, but often there is painted or cut the name of the person buried, and sometimes there are drawings or images such as the early Christians used. Sometimes there will be seen a palm, which may mean that the person buried there is a martyr. Often there is a fish, which was a sign much used by the early Christians. Often little vases or bottles, which have in them a red liquid dried up, have been found. People used to think that this was the blood of the martyrs, but it is now thought that it was the red wine used by the priest in saying mass at the tombs. The story of these martyrs makes us understand better than anything else the great change which the Christian religion had made in the lives of people everywhere. While many of those who were not Christians, especially the rich people, still lived the terrible lives of which Nero's gives us the worst example, and while many of the poorer people who were not Christians led bad lives too, the Christians showed a beautiful example of love and peace and courage. The Early Christian Saints and Martyrs It was a time of great saints. We can only mention one or two of these saints. There was St. Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch in Syria. Under the Emperor Trajan, an order was given that everybody in all the provinces should make a sacrifice to the gods in honor of his having conquered and added Dacia, a new province across the Danube, to the empire. When the Christians of Antioch refused to do this, Trajan ordered that their bishop should be brought before him. He hoped to persuade him to worship the gods, but Ignatius refused and was sent to Rome. Here he was taken into the Colosseum, the great theater where the Roman games were held, 
and there he was torn to pieces before all the people and eaten by two hungry lions who were let loose upon him. Yet Trajan was not a bad man. Indeed, he was the first of five emperors who ruled from 96 A.D. to 180 A.D. and were called the good emperors. One of these, the great Marcus Aurelius, was so good and wise that in some ways he was almost a saint. He wrote a book of thoughts, which is read and considered very wonderful even now. But he did not understand the Christians, and the persecution went on under him also. It was under him that St. Cecilia, the patron saint of music, was put to death. She was a noble lady of Rome or Sicily, who had become a Christian, and persuaded her husband to do so too. It was said that the executioner, who was to behead her, seeing her so good and beautiful, trembled so much that he only wounded her, and she lay for three days before she died, singing all the time her praises to God. It was said afterwards that St. Cecilia was the first to invent playing on the organ, and in pictures she is generally seen with organ pipes in her hands. A splendid church which was built in her honor may be seen in Rome today, and in it is a beautiful statue in white marble of the saint as she lay when the executioner had done his work. After the death of Marcus Aurelius, his son, a very bad man, ruled for a few years and then was murdered. After this came another long time during which one emperor after another was set up by the legions. One of the great things which the early emperors had done was to strengthen the frontiers or boundaries of the empire to keep the barbarians out. Even in Britain we can still see the wall which Hadrian built between England and Scotland to keep out the barbarous Picts and Scots. But in the third hundred years after our Lord's birth, the barbarians were becoming too strong and were beginning to burst over the frontiers. Emperor after emperor themselves led the soldiers against them, but it was of no use. The emperor Diocletian chose another emperor to help him to govern, and two under-emperors who were called Caesars. The empire was, for a time, divided between these. It was under Diocletian that the last and most terrible persecution of the Christians took place. While the barbarians threatened the empire from outside, it was felt that the Christians were a danger inside, and thousands everywhere, but especially in Rome, were flung to the lions. St. Agnes, the patron saint of young girls, died in this persecution. The story is that she was a Roman girl 13 years old and belonged to a noble family. A rich Roman who was not a Christian wanted her to marry his son, but she would not, and so he had her killed as a Christian. At first they tried to burn her, but the fire would not burn, so they took her outside the city and cut off her head. One of the two Caesars whom Diocletian had chosen to help him was Constantine, who afterwards became head of the whole empire and was called Constantine the Great. He was a handsome man and a fine soldier. Under him, a wonderful thing happened for the Christians. Constantine was fighting in a battle against a man who wanted to take part of the empire for himself. When he saw a great cross of fire in the sky, and across it was written the words, Under this standard thou shalt conquer. Constantine won the battle, and after that he said that the Christian religion should be the religion of the Roman people. So the great fight was won. Henceforward the Christians could not only worship freely, but people were encouraged to join them. In a very short time, the whole empire was Christian. When the barbarians broke in and swarmed over the empire, this is what they found, and they, in their turn, became Christians too. It seemed as though the way was suddenly made clear very wonderfully for the spread of the Christian religion. 
but it was the quiet work and prayer and the noble deaths of the martyrs which had prepared the way. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill Chapter 16 The Barbarians and the Empire For many years before the time of Constantine, the city of Rome was becoming less and less important in the empire. The emperors often preferred to live somewhere else, and especially when Diocletian broke the empire up under four rulers. Constantine liked the ways of the eastern empire better than the west, and he made up his mind to make for himself a new capital there. He chose for it Byzantium an old Greek colony, beautifully situated on the shores of the Sea of Bosphorus, and the bay called the Golden Horn. Byzantium was only a little city, but Constantine had houses and churches, theaters and baths built round about it, and made it into a new Rome. The name of the city was changed into Constantinople, or the city of Constantine, and so it is called to this day. Rome, however, became important in another way. Its bishop was the chief bishop of the Christian church. He came to be called the Pope, and in time became much more powerful than any emperor or king. If the emperor had stayed in Rome, it would not have been so easy for the Pope to become so great, and this is one important result of Constantine choosing a new capital in the East. Another important result was that it made it easier for the barbarians, who, as we have seen, were ready to break into the empire to do so. In a hundred years from Constantine's time, the Roman Empire had become an Eastern Empire only, and swarms of barbarians were settling down on the western part, ready to break it up into new nations, each under a different king. Ever since the days of Caesar and Augustus, the rulers of Rome had known that there was a great movement going on among the barbarian peoples, from time to time the emperors had found it necessary to drive some tribes back as they crossed into the empire itself. Always they had had to keep a good watch on the frontiers, and in the end they allowed some of these peoples to settle down in the Roman provinces round the Danube, which was always the hardest frontier to keep safe. In time, too, the emperors began to take men from the peoples who had settled down to fight in the Roman army. This was a mistake, for when the time came for these soldiers to fight the barbarians, they did not care to do so. The chief among these barbarian peoples who were threatening Rome were the Goths, the Vandals, the Burgundians, and the Franks. They were all of the Teutonic race, to which the English who conquered Britain also belonged. They were big, fair men, seeming almost like giants to the Italians and the other peoples already living in Spain and France and Africa and all the lands of the western part of the Roman Empire. Behind the Teutons there were other peoples belonging to the Slavonic race. These pushed the Teutons before them, but in the end settled down in the east of Europe. The people of the countries which are now called Hungary, Servia, and Bulgaria came from this race. They were smaller, darker, and more like the peoples of the east than the Teutons. 
Behind them again pushed a terrible people called the Huns. They were small savages and came from the wildest parts of Central Asia. They were fierce and good fighters, but they could not keep together as well as the Teutons or make use of a victory when they won it. In the end, they were driven right out of Europe again. The moving about of all these peoples is now called the wandering of the nations. People have often wondered how it was that the great Roman Empire came to be overrun by the barbarian peoples. It has been said that it was because the people in the Roman Empire were weak and wicked, while the new peoples were brave and honest. But we must remember that now nearly all the people in the empire had become Christians, and most of them lived good lives. One reason, perhaps, was that the empire was too big, and it was impossible for any but very clever rulers to rule it properly. We have already seen how it was, as it were, falling to pieces when it had to be divided among several rulers. Then again there were great numbers of the barbarians, and generally the armies which fought against them were much smaller, but quite as brave. The people of the empire, too, had not so much interest in fighting for the empire as people today in fighting for their own countries. But the barbarians themselves saw that the empire was not weak and bad, and were glad to learn many things from the people they conquered. One thing which they learned was the Christian religion, and all these people who settled down in the empire became Christians in the end. No sooner had Constantine made the whole empire Christian than the Christians began to quarrel among themselves. A priest of Egypt called Arius taught that our Lord was not quite equal to God the Father, and a great many people believed this. His followers were called Arians, and many of the barbarians, as they were converted by Arians, became Arians too. Constantine was very sorry to see the Christians quarreling among themselves, and he called a great council, that is, a meeting of bishops from all parts of the church to discuss the question. They met at the town of Nicaea, some having traveled thousands of miles to be present. This council of Nicaea, the first great council of the church, said that Arius was wrong. One of those who spoke most against Arius at the council was a young priest named Athanasius, who came from Alexandria. After the council there were many people who still were Arians, and Athanasius spent his long life in preaching and writing against them. It was he who wrote the famous Athanasian Creed, which is still read in the churches. Julian the Apostate. Athanasius was a saint, but he was only one of many who lived in the hundred years after the time when Constantine made the empire Christian. There were Basil and Gregory, who were companions with the emperor Julian when they were students in the schools of Athens. For Athens was still a great place for learning. Julian was a nephew of Constantine the Great, and afterwards became emperor himself. He is famous because he tried to destroy the Christian religion and make the empire pagan again. In spite of being a great friend of St. Basil and St. Gregory in his young days, Julian had never really believed in Christianity. When he was emperor, he did all he could to hurt the Christians, though he did not persecute them like the emperors in the old days of paganism. He built again the pagan temples, and he would not let the Christians study the old writings of the Greeks and Romans. He said that if they did not believe in the gods, they should not read about them. 
He really hoped that the Christians would become ignorant and uneducated. But Christianity was too strong for him, and it is said that on his deathbed he cried in anger, Galilean, meaning our Lord, thou hast conquered. Meanwhile, his two school companions had been living holy lives. Basil had become the head of a monastery in an eastern desert, spending his time in prayer and work and fasting with other holy men who joined him. He had wanted Gregory to go too, but he had become a priest and then bishop of Caesarea and afterwards of Constantinople. Another great saint of this time, and one of the four great doctors of the church, was St. Ambrose, the Archbishop of Milan. He, too, spent his life fighting the Arians. He was a very noble and charitable man. Once, when the Goths carried off a great number of Christians, for all this time the barbarians were attacking the empire, St. Ambrose sold all he could find, even the beautiful gold cups belonging to his church, to buy them back. He showed how brave he was when he once refused to allow Theodosius, the emperor, to go into his church. At least so the story goes. In any case, St. Ambrose wrote a letter reproving the emperor and Theodosius, in his turn, did penance in the church. He had indeed done a very wrong thing, and the story shows how beside the great holiness of the saints of the time there was still a terrible amount of cruelty and bloodshed. In the town of Thessalonica, one of the emperor's officers had been killed by the people. The emperor pretended that he was not angry, and invited the people of the town to see some games in the circus, and when they were all there, Theodosius sent in his soldiers and killed them. St. Ambrose wrote some beautiful Latin hymns which we can still read and sing, and one of the oldest churches in the world is the church built in his honor at Milan. In those days, when, on the death of an emperor, several men often fought to be made emperor in his place, and when the barbarians were continually breaking in and fighting, many men fled to the desert to become monks and say their prayers in peace. One of the greatest men of this time who became a monk was St. Jerome, who put the Bible into Latin, for these old monks worked as well as prayed. He lived the last years of his life in a monastery which he made at Bethlehem, which he loved because our Lord was born there. St. Jerome is generally seen in pictures with the Bible, which he translated into Latin, which was the language which all scholars then read. He is sometimes seen, too, with a lion, and the story is that he once saw a lion with a thorn in its paw, and instead of being frightened, St. Jerome took the thorn out and bandaged the paw. After that, the lion followed the saint everywhere like a dog. There were saints, too, like St. John Chrysostom, or the golden-mouthed bishop of Antioch, and then of Constantinople who won his name because of the beautiful way in which he spoke and preached to the people, and St. Simeon Stylites, who thought that the best thing to please God was to mortify himself, and who lived for years and then died on the top of a stone pillar stretching up into the sky in the Syrian desert. But perhaps the greatest saint of all at that time was St. Augustine of Hippo, a town in North Africa. St. Augustine wrote himself in a book called His Confessions, the story of his life. He tells how he was brought up tenderly by his mother Monica, a saint herself, and anxious that her son might grow into a good and holy man. But when he was a boy and a young man, Augustine was not very good, 
and his mother wept often and bitterly over his sins. But at Milan he met St. Ambrose and listened to his sermons. He was suddenly filled with hatred for his past life and changed it completely. He went back to Hippo, became a priest, and later bishop of Hippo. His writings were read then and are read now by Christians everywhere. His greatest book, the Civitate Dei, or the City of God, was written at the time when a barbarian army had entered Rome itself, and he died when he was seventy-six years old, when a barbarian army had been besieging his city of Hippo for three months, and just in time to escape seeing it taken. For the barbarians were now spread all over the western part of the empire, and we must now turn to the story of their conquest. The emperor Theodosius the Great died in the year 395 AD, and the empire was divided between his sons Arcadius, who ruled the east, and Honorius, who ruled the west. It was now that the Visigoths, or Western Goths, who had settled in the provinces round the Danube, first went forward into Italy itself. They had, as their leader, a brave chief called Alaric, but they had to fight hard battles against Stilicho, the general of Honorius in Italy. He was a vandal, one of those barbarians who had been taken into the Roman army but he fought well for Rome. He defeated Alaric in three great battles, but the enemies of Stilicho persuaded the emperor that he was a traitor, and Honorius allowed him to be put to death. Two years afterwards, in the year 410, Alaric led his victorious army into Rome itself. It was the first time since 800 years before, when the Gauls had burnt the city and marched away, that any enemy had got within the walls of Rome. The Romans tried to frighten him by telling him how great were their numbers, but he only answered, The thicker the hay, the easier moan. And when they asked him what he would leave them, he answered, your lives. The Goths broke into the beautiful buildings of Rome and took for themselves the treasures which the Romans had collected from all parts of the world in the days when they were winning their empire. Honorius, the emperor of the West, was a weak and foolish young man. While the barbarians were pouring into Rome, he was in the country looking after the hens which he kept and of which he was very fond. A messenger came to tell him that the end of Rome had come. Now Honorius had a hen to which he had given the name of Rome. How can that be, he said, when I have just been feeding her? He seemed almost pleased to hear that it was his empire and not his hen that he had lost. Alaric meant to keep Rome, but he could not help admiring the civilization which he saw everywhere in the empire, and he said he would like to be appointed an officer in the service of the empire. Many of the barbarian chiefs after Alaric did the same. This did not mean that they obeyed the emperor, for they did not, but they liked to feel that they had a share in the greatness and civilization of the empire. About the same time as Alaric was conquering Italy, the Vandals were overrunning Gaul and Spain, but three years after he had taken Rome, Alaric died, and under their next ruler, the Visigoths marched out of Italy, followed the Vandals into Gaul and Spain, and drove them out of those countries into Africa. It was while these vandals were taking Africa for themselves that the siege of Hippo took place, during which St. Augustine died. The vandals were one of the roughest of these barbarian peoples, 
and they soon made the north of Africa, which ever since the days of Alexander had been a place of civilization and learning, almost savage again. Meanwhile, the Visigoths had made a kingdom stretching all over the southwest of France and the greater part of Spain, with its capital at the Roman town of Toulouse. It seemed almost as though the Visigoths might form a new empire in the west, but in the end they did not even hold together as a nation. They were Christians, but Arians, and it will be seen later that the barbarians who were Arians were nearly always conquered by those who were Christians proper. For one reason, the people whom they conquered were not, as a rule, Arians, and therefore disliked them more than if they had been of their own religion. Another Teutonic people, the Franks, who became later a very great people indeed, now overran nearly all the north and central part of France. They were not yet Christians at all. The Burgundians made themselves a kingdom in the southeast of Gaul, so all the provinces of the west, except Italy itself, were now in the hands of the new peoples. It was at this time that the Roman legions left the province of Britain. Britain was one of the latest provinces won by the Roman Empire, and in spite of the great Roman roads which may still be seen in this country today, and the many towns and colonies which the Romans had set up, Britain does not seem to have become really Roman in its civilization, like France and Spain, which have been so much longer under Roman rule. So that when the Angles and Saxons and Jutes, who were only other branches of the Teutonic race, came and conquered this country, while the Goths and Vandals and Franks were conquering the other provinces, these people learned very little of Roman life and civilization, and did not become Christians like the barbarian peoples who conquered the other provinces. They still went on worshipping their own gods, Woden, the god of war, Thor, the god of thunder, and many others, until monks were sent from Rome long after to teach them the true faith. The reason that Italy was not conquered and kept by the barbarians was that the emperors were more anxious to keep it, and the barbarians were frightened by its past greatness. For many years after the other kingdoms were more or less settled, the barbarians and the followers of the emperor still struggled in Italy. Then there was the great power of the pope growing there. Italy, in fact, was never joined as a nation under one king until the second half of the 19th century. Attila the Hun About the year 433 AD, Attila, a fierce chief, became king of the Huns, who were still living in the land north of the Danube to the east. There their king had built himself a wooden palace and from there he led his great army of savages, each seated on a shaggy pony, right over Europe. Attila, we are told, was a short, square man, curiously shaped, with a large head, dark skin, eyes set deep back in his head, and with a flat nose and very little hair. He was cunning and fierce, and like all the Huns, he hated the civilization of the West. The people called him the Scourge of God. He first attacked the Eastern Empire, destroying one city after another until he got to the walls of Constantinople. The emperor paid him a large sum of money and gave him an enormous piece of land along the Danube before he would go away. But the next emperor refused to pay the tribute and Attila then decided to attack the Western Empire. He rode across Europe, destroying cities and killing the people everywhere, until he was stopped at Orleans, 
where the soldiers were encouraged by the brave Bishop Anianus to resist him. While he was here, an army came up to fight him. It was the army of Theodoric, king of the Visigoths, joined with the army of the brave Roman general Aetius, who was trying to rule Italy for the weak and useless emperors who now had their capital at Ravenna. On the plains of Chalons, not far from Orleans, Attila was completely defeated. The Visigothic king was killed, but Europe was saved. If Attila and his sons had conquered Europe, the civilization which Rome had spread and which the Teutonic races were learning would have been lost, and Europe would have become savage again. Attila had to draw back from Gaul, but the next year he marched into Italy itself. Aetius marched after him, but was not in time to prevent many cities in the north of Italy from being destroyed. Many of the people fled to the islands and lakes in the north of the Adriatic, and it was from the homes they built themselves there that the famous and beautiful city of Venice had its beginnings. The Emperor Valentinian sent messengers to Attila, begging him to go away. With the messengers went the great Pope Leo, and it was said that Attila was much struck by the noble and beautiful face of the great Pope. But it was probably because his soldiers were tired and ill, and because he was offered a princess of the emperor's family as one of his wives, and much money, that he agreed to go away. Fortunately, the princess was saved from this fate, for Attila died shortly afterwards after a feast to celebrate another of his marriages. His sons were not so cunning and clever as Attila, and the Huns after this moved eastward again, and practically disappear from history. Just as Stilicho had been put to death by the jealous and foolish Emperor Honorius, for whom he had done so much, so now the equally foolish Emperor Valentinian killed Aetius with his own hand. Shortly after this, Genseric, the fierce Arian king of the Vandals in Africa, sailed across to Italy and attacked Rome itself, carrying away many treasures, among them the golden table and the golden candlestick carried by Titus from the temple at Jerusalem when he destroyed that city. The western emperors at Ravenna were becoming weaker and weaker, they were often chosen by the general of the barbarian armies in Italy. The eastern emperor was supposed to give his consent, but in the end this was never asked. At last, in 476, Odecker, the Herulian, a great barbarian general in Italy, made the last emperor of the West give up his throne. This emperor was a young boy, the son of another barbarian adventurer. He had been given the grand old names of Romulus, the founder of Rome, and Augustus, its first emperor, but he soon came to be called in mockery Romulus Augustulus, or the little Augustus. For a wonder, Odecker did not kill him, but let him live quietly in one of the Italian towns. He sent the emperor's crown and robe to the emperor at Constantinople, telling him that the Roman Senate wished that the Western Empire should end, and declaring that they would honor the one emperor at Constantinople. Of course, this did not mean anything. Odecker took the name of king, meaning to have Italy for his own. The giving up of the name of Roman Emperor by the boy Romulus Augustulus in 476 AD is often spoken of as the moment when the Roman Empire in the West broke up, but we have seen that it had broken up long before, and that the barbarians had been fast taking the lands of the Western Empire and making them their own for a hundred years before. End of chapter 16 
read by Carrie Adams, your book boys, at Mesa, Arizona, on the 28th of January, 2022. Chapter 17 of The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls, by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 17. The New Nations. We have now reached the story of that time in history which is known as the Middle Ages. We give it that name because, in many ways, it stands halfway between our times and the Greek and Roman times of which we have been speaking. The first few hundred years of the Middle Ages are often called the Dark Ages because there was so much ignorance and bloodshed and because though the church did much to civilize the barbarians yet the art and civilization of the roman empire disappeared and though the barbarians were always learning from what remained it was a long time before the new and wonderful civilization of the middle ages appeared the history of the early part of the Middle Ages in the west of Europe is the story of how the barbarian tribes settled down on the lands of the Roman Empire, how they fought between themselves, and how some won and some disappeared, how new nations appeared when the conquering barbarians married and mixed with the peoples they conquered, how all were Christian how after a time of much ignorance and disorder and bloodshed a new civilization grew up which if rougher in some ways than the roman and greek civilizations yet was better than them because it was christian the eastern empire too has a wonderful history of its own in the early middle ages and we must now turn to the story Odecker, the barbarian soldier who had made Romulus Augustulus give up his name of emperor, and now called himself king of the nations in Italy, did not enjoy his position long. The famous Theodoric, king of the Ostrogoths, or Eastern Goths, another group of that people who had been allowed to settle in the Roman provinces on the Danube, suddenly made up his mind to take italy for his own he was a fine soldier and his family known as the amali had ruled the ostrogoths for many years the ostrogoths had learned more from rome than any other of the barbarians and theodoric had made up his mind that if he won italy he would rule it in a wise and civilized way in the year 489 a d he led a great army into italy and made odecker give up his kingdom soon after odecker was murdered at a feast probably theodoric had him killed thinking it would be safer to have him out of the way. Even the best men of the time, at any rate soldiers like Theodoric, thought much less about killing people than we do now. But when he had won Italy, Theodoric did his best to rule it well. He tried to join the Goths and the Italians together to form a nation. He ruled Italy for thirty years, having Goths for his soldiers and officers, but choosing the wisest and cleverest of the conquered Italians to help him rule the country. He lived chiefly at Ravenna, for Rome was beginning to belong more and more to the Pope, who was growing more powerful as time went on. Theodoric built beautiful churches and a palace at Ravenna, he married members of his family into the families of the other barbarian kings, for he hoped to hand on his kingdom to his family, 
and knew that it would be stronger if it had the help of other royal families. But Theodoric was an Arian, and like all the other barbarians who had become Arians, the Ostrogoths found that the conquered peoples would not mix with them. If Theodoric had been a Christian proper, he might have made a kingdom of Italy which would have lasted. But this was not to be. At the end of his reign, Theodoric had his friend Boethius, one of the Italians whom he had had to help him to rule his kingdom, cruelly put to death because he thought he was plotting to help the eastern emperor to get Italy back again. Boethius was a very good and holy man, and had not done this thing. While he was in prison, he quietly gave his time to writing a book called The Consolations of Philosophy. When he was dead, Theodoric was sorry for what he had done, and it is said that it was partly through this that he himself fell ill and died soon after. Then the eastern emperor did try to win back Italy. The Great Emperor Justinian The new emperor, Justinian, was a very clever and great man. It is thought that he belonged to a Slavonic family, but took a Roman name, when he was adopted by his uncle, the emperor Justin. Justinian was the greatest of all the Roman emperors in the East. He was ambitious, and was one of those strong men who are always working and yet are always healthy. He could do with very little sleep, and spent most of the night reading or writing. He often went for days without food, and yet always looked bright and well, and had a red color in his face. Justinian had to fight hard against the Persians who had risen up again as a great power, and were threatening all the Roman provinces in Asia Minor. He kept them back to the Euphrates, but wasted years in fighting them. It would have been better if Justinian had given all his strength to the struggle with the Persians, but he could not bear to think that the empire had lost Italy. After the death of Theodoric, the Ostrogoth, Justinian sent a great general called Belisarius to conquer the Goths. The Gothic kings, after Theodoric, were not such great men, and in the end Justinian's generals won but Italy did not remain long under the eastern emperor, for when Justinian and Belisarius died, both in the same year, new barbarian peoples swarmed into Italy. The officer of the eastern empire remained at Ravenna, and was called the Exarch, but he never had any real power in Italy and only helped to prevent that country becoming a nation like France and Spain and the other lands of the Western Roman Empire. No sooner was Justinian dead than the Longobards, another Teutonic people who had been allowed to settle near the Danube, rushed down upon the north of Italy. They set up their capital at Pavia, and under the name of Lombards, which was the Italian way of saying it, they ruled North Italy for the next two hundred years. But all this time there were two other capitals in Italy, Rome under the Pope and Ravenna under the Exarch, who still pretended that he was ruling all Italy for the Eastern Emperor. Justinian had attacked the Vandal Kingdom in North Africa, and he did win this back for the Eastern Empire, until it was taken by a new and terrible enemy whom we shall have to speak about later on. But the name of Justinian is famous for another work which he did, the results of which have lasted down to our times. The barbarian peoples had laws of their own, but the Roman laws were much better, and most of the new nations, when they settled down, began to use these laws as well as their own. 
Justinian had the Roman laws written down and clearly arranged. It was a great work, and we do not know how much of it Justinian himself did, but in any case it was his idea. All the nations of Western Europe except England lived by these laws all through the Middle Ages, and even England began to use some of them later on. Meanwhile, the Visigoths in Gaul had been driven farther and farther south by that other Teutonic people which had at first settled only in the north of France. These were the Franks. When they first took part of Gaul for their own, they were still pagans. They were much fiercer and less civilized than the Goths, whom they hated. About the same time that the Ostrogoths were ruled by their great king Theodoric, the Franks too had a great king called Clovis. He was the first great king of the Franks, and the only one for many years. He led his fierce soldiers against the Visigoths and drove them before him out of Gaul into Spain, and then the whole of Gaul belonged to the Franks and in time took the name France from them. The wife of Clovis was a Christian, and Clovis had made a promise to God that if he won a certain battle, he would become a Christian too. He did so, and all his people did the same. The Franks were Christians proper, and so had a much better chance of making friends with the conquered people than the Visigoths had had. In a very short time they settled down, and took the language and laws as well as the religion of the conquered people. We must remember that the Latin language remained in all the western provinces of the empire except England. Though the conquerors were Teutonic, they gave up their own language and spoke that of the people round them. Of course, some changes were made in the language, but Italian, Spanish, and French are only new forms of the beautiful Latin language which the Teutonic conquerors learned from the people they conquered. The Visigoths were driven into Spain until they, in their turn, were conquered by that same enemy which overran North Africa and which for a time threatened all Western Europe. But before that time, the Visigoths in Spain had been converted from Arianism to Christianity proper, and like the Franks, married and mixed with the people they had conquered, so that the Spanish nation today, like the French, is descended from both peoples. In this, they are very different from the English people, for as far as we can tell, the Angles and Saxons and Jutes drove most of the Britons out of England into Wales, except the few whom they kept as slaves, so that the English today are descended from these purely Teutonic peoples. While the nations were settling down, great changes were, of course, taking place. There was still much fighting and bloodshed. The church and the bishops did what they could to civilize the people, but they were still very rough. Very few children went to school, and there was very little learning. The old Roman buildings fell into ruins, though their roads were still used everywhere. The great theater, called the Colosseum at Rome, was used as a sort of quarry all through the Middle Ages as the people of Rome carried off the stones to build their houses and churches. The Early Monks The new barbarian peoples knew nothing about art or building, and for the first few hundred years their churches were quite small and plain. During all this time, monasteries were being set up all over Western Europe and in these the best men of the time lived, and sometimes set up schools for boys. The monasteries were often set up in wild and lonely regions, 
but the monks work hard and cultivated the land. Their houses became places of peace and prosperity and served as an example to the people in those rough times. Many of these monasteries used the rule of St. Benedict. St. Benedict was an Italian monk who wrote down the way of life which he had found good for several monasteries which he had set up in Italy. It was a very wonderful rule, and for many hundreds of years after, the monasteries, which spread all over the west of Europe, used it. St. Benedict wanted his monasteries to be like families, where all should work for the good of the others, and all obey the abbot, the head monk, who was to be a sort of father to the others. The name abbot means father. The monks were called Benedictines, or as they wore a plain black habit or frock, they were later called the Black Monks of St. Benedict. It was one of these monks, St. Augustine, who came first to convert the English to Christianity, and he was sent by another Benedictine monk who had become Pope. This was St. Gregory the Great. Gregory was a boy belonging to a rich and noble family at Rome. He was very clever and handsome, and he was given a high position in the government of the city but he gave it up to become a monk at the great monastery of St. Andrew at Rome. And later, when the Pope died, all the people begged that Gregory should be made Pope in his place. It was before he was Pope that one day, as he walked through the marketplace at Rome, he saw some beautiful children standing there with blue eyes and fair hair very different from the Italian children round about. They were little slave children who had been taken prisoners in the wars in England and were now being sold. For in those days, prisoners were nearly always sold as slaves. Gregory asked who these children were. He was told that they were Angles but he said they looked like angels, and as he knew that the English were still pagans, he made up his mind to do all that he could to teach them the Christian religion. When he was pope, he sent the monk Augustine with some others to teach the English the true religion. St. Augustine landed in Kent because Ethelbert, the king of Kent, had married a Frankish princess who was already a Christian. Ethelbert and all his people became Christians, and Augustine built a church at Canterbury. But there were many other kingdoms in England, for Britain was not conquered by one people like France or Spain, but by several tribes, and it was many years before all the little kingdoms were joined together to make one nation. One of the kingdoms, Mercia, in the middle of England, had a savage king called Penda, who hated the Christians and fought against them for many years. In the end, he was killed, but all the preaching and teaching had to be done over again. This time, other monks, who were not Benedictines but came from Ireland, did the work. Ireland had never been part of the Roman Empire. Its people were Celts, but they had been made Christians by the great St. Patrick, another Celt who left his home in Britain to convert the Irish. Britain had, of course, become Christian under the Romans. About the time that St. Benedict was setting up his monasteries in Italy, other monasteries were growing up all over Ireland, and a great Irish monk, St. Columba, set out from his own country to teach Christianity to the people in Scotland. He built a great monastery on the island of Iona, and it was said from there 
that St. Aidan and other monks came into the north of England to help to make the people Christians. The missionaries from Iona did not altogether agree with the missionaries from Rome. The Irish church had been cut off from the other churches of the west through being so far away, and some differences had grown up. They kept Easter at a different time, for one thing. So Oswy, king of Northumbria, called a synod or meeting of bishops and priests at Whitby in 664, and there it was decided that the Roman way of doing things should be taken, and from this time onward the English church was closely connected with the popes. Later, another great man was sent from Rome to put order into the English church. This was Theodore of Tarsus, who became the first archbishop of Canterbury. He set up bishops in different parts of England, all under the archbishop of Canterbury. And when the English people were joined in this way by the church, it became easier for them to join together as one nation. England, too, was soon covered over by monasteries, and her first historian, Bede, and her first poet, Cadmon, were both monks. In the 8th century, that is, between the years 700 and 800 A.D., English monks and nuns were going out in their turn to convert the heathen peoples of Germany beyond the Rhine. The greatest of these English missionaries was St. Boniface, who spent the greater part of his life in the work. But we must now turn to tell the story of a new danger which was threatening Christianity and the civilization it was helping to make. End of chapter 17 Read by Kerry Adams, your book voice, at Mesa, Arizona, on the 15th of February, 2022. Chapter 18 of The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 18. The Beginnings of Mohammedanism. The land of Arabia, a square peninsula lying, as it were, on the corner between Asia and Africa, with the sea on three sides of it, and the desert on the fourth, had never been conquered by any of the big empires of the east or by Rome. It was a difficult land to get at, and it had not much to give to the conqueror. The Arabs are a Semitic people, and related to the Jews. They have always lived much the same lives as they do today, being shepherds or merchants, living in tents, and carrying the things they had to sell to the coasts in caravans with long strings of camels. The Arabs were at one time worshippers of the stars, but knew that there was only one God. Later on, they began to worship idols which they set up in temples. It was near one of these temples in the holy city of Mecca that the famous Muhammad lived as a boy. His father was dead, and the boy lived with an uncle who was a priest of the temple. Muhammad lived a quiet life near the temple, and as he grew up, sometimes traveled with the caravans which went from Mecca to the seacoast. There were many Jews in Arabia, descended from some who had fled there when Titus destroyed Jerusalem. It was perhaps from them that Muhammad got the idea that there was only one God, and that it was wrong to worship idols. But he thought that this was taught to him by God himself, and that he was meant to preach a new religion. He used to have attacks of sickness and convulsions, in which he thought that God showed him wonderful things. 
he tried to write them down afterwards, and later they were made into a book called the Koran, which Mohammedans to this day believe to be a holy book like the Bible. Muhammad was married and soon converted his wife and her relations to his religion. His religion was that there was one God, and Muhammad was his prophet. At first the people of Mecca were very angry when he spoke against their idols, for the black stone called the Kaaba, which was built into the wall of their temple, was visited each year by numbers of pilgrims from all parts of Arabia, and this made the city rich. The story was that this stone was really the angel who had been told to look after Adam in the Garden of Eden, and that it had been changed into a stone as a punishment for neglecting its duties. Meanwhile, it was counting the kisses of the people who came to worship at the temple, and when it should be changed into an angel again at the last day, it would give an account of them. So the people of Mecca did not like Muhammad's teaching at all, and Muhammad thought it best to run away. His flight, as the Mohammedans called it, was in the year 622 A.D., and they count that as their year one, just as we do the year in which Christ was born. Muhammad fled to the city of Medina, and there a great number of followers joined him and listened to his preaching. There were so many of them that in a few years Muhammad led them to Mecca, ready to fight and take the holy city. The people of Mecca had to give way, and after this the temple became the center of the new religion, Islam, as it was called. Mecca was still a holy city and a place of pilgrimage, and people from all parts of Arabia still flocked to it. When Muhammad died, all the people of Arabia were Mohammedans. One of Muhammad's followers became head of the new religion and was called the Caliph. And now, suddenly, the Arabs, who had always lived so quietly in their own land, were filled with a wish to spread their religion. The Caliph led great armies to conquer other lands, and the people who were conquered were offered the choice of three things. They could become Mohammedans or pay tribute. If they refused these things, they must die. To the people of the East, the Mohammedan religion often seemed good. It was better than the worship of idols, which was the religion of most of these people. But to Christians, it seemed a terrible religion, and the Mohammedans terrible people. When the caliph led his armies out of Arabia, he went first against the great Persian Empire. In a short time, it was conquered by the Arabians, or Saracens, as they were called, and they now ruled the land even past the Euphrates. Soon, too, they conquered Syria, which belonged to the eastern emperor. Then they turned to the north of Africa took Egypt, where they destroyed Alexandria, and built the city which is now called Cairo. A Saracen fleet was built and sailed the Mediterranean, and soon the whole of North Africa was taken, and they crossed into Spain. It seemed that this strange, fierce people, with their curious, half-savage religion, might go on to conquer the empire in the east and overthrow the new nations in the west. But this was not to be. The great emperor of the east, Leo the Iconoclast, went out to fight them when they were attacking Constantinople itself. He won a great victory in the year 718 A.D. and drove them out of Asia Minor. They did not attack the Eastern Empire again for many years. 
This Emperor Leo was called the iconoclast or image breaker because he took the part of some of the people in the Eastern Empire who did not like the use of pictures or images of Christ and the saints. They thought that to use them was like idolatry. For a time, the iconoclasts had their way, but soon the images were brought back. Not many years after the Saracens had been driven back from the walls of Constantinople, they had conquered the whole of Spain. The Visigoths were driven back into a corner of the northwest of Spain, and now the Saracens prepared to cross the Pyrenees and conquer the kingdom of the Franks. But they were defeated by the Frank Charles Martel at the Battle of Tours in 732, and so driven back into Spain. The Franks had become, by this time, the greatest people in the west of Europe. They were splendid fighters. Their soldiers went on foot, but were protected by mail shirts and shields. They stood close together their shields making a sort of wall. Time after time, the Arabs dashed themselves against it until they were tired out, and then, for the first time, the Franks moved, chasing the enemy across the Pyrenees, the mountains between France and Spain. So the Arabs were held back in both east and west, but they kept Spain and Africa. All through the Middle Ages, the Christians in Spain were fighting against the Arabs. Bit by bit, the Spanish people, which was formed by the mixture of the races which lived in Spain under the Roman Empire and the Visigoths, who had conquered them, drove the Arabs south. But it was not for 700 years that the last of the Moors, as the Spanish Arabs were called, were driven out of Spain into Africa. The north of Africa, though it was conquered by other nations later, is quite Mohammedan in its people to this day. When the Saracens settled down in a country, they often became very civilized, and the greatest scholars of the early Middle Ages belonged to this people. They studied the philosophy of the Greeks, and put together a philosophy of their own. They studied science, too. We can best understand what the Arabian civilization was like by a study of their beautiful buildings, which may still be seen in the south of Spain. The most beautiful of all, perhaps, is the wonderful palace called the Alhambra, with its marble pillars and painted walls. The Moorish poets called it a pearl set in emeralds, referring to its whiteness among the green trees of the woods around. Charles Martel, the great Frank soldier who drove the Arabs out of France at the Battle of Tours, was not the king of the Franks. After the death of Clovis, the kings of his family who followed him were very weak and stupid. They left the government of the country very much to their officers, called the mayors of the palace. This position was kept for a long time by one family, and handed down from father to son. They became a sort of royal family themselves, and certainly had all the power. The Franks by this time had conquered a great deal of the land to the east of the river Rhine, so that their kingdom was made up of the country which is now France, and also part of the country which is now Germany. They were always conquering, too, the German tribes further east, and it was while these conquests were going on that English monks, like St. Boniface, went among these people to make them Christians. As the Franks became more and more powerful, they became more friendly with the Bishop of Rome, who was now generally called the Pope, and who was head of all the churches in the West. 
The church in the East sometimes obeyed the Pope too, but there were always quarrels between them, and in the end the Eastern Church became divided from the Western, and only the Western Church obeyed the Pope. This state of things has remained until now. The Russian and Greek churches believe in very much the same things as the Catholic Church, but they will not have the Pope as their head. In the West, however, the Pope was growing more and more powerful. Kings and bishops from all the nations soon had to do what he told them. When Charles Martel died, he left his power to two sons, Carloman and Pippin. But Carloman chose to become a monk, and went off to Italy and became a Benedictine in St. Benedict's own great monastery at Monte Cassino. So his brother, who was called Pippin the Short, was left to rule the Frank kingdom. Charles Martel had been king in everything but the name, and now Pippin took the name of king too. He asked the Pope to help him in this, and the Pope, who was named Zacharias, did so. He said that it was only right that he who had the power of a king should have the name too. The king himself was a weak, stupid man who lived in a kind of farm in the country with very few servants and no riches or magnificence. Pepin now told him that he must give up the throne, and, to make things quite safe, he made him become a monk. Meanwhile, the Pope was having a great deal of trouble with the Lombard people in the north of Italy. They had given up their Arianism long before but they had never really settled down and mixed with the Italians. They hated the Pope because they wanted Rome as their own. The Lombard king was threatening to attack Rome when the Pope asked Pepin to go to his help. Pepin marched over the Alps, defeated the Lombards, took from them a large piece of land in the middle of Italy which they had conquered from the exarch of Ravenna, and gave it to the Pope. Before this, the Pope had only had Rome, but this land, with others which were added to it, afterwards became a little kingdom by itself, ruled by the Pope, and called the Papal States. Once these states were taken in this way by the Pope, there was no chance of Italy becoming a nation under one king, like England or France or Spain. The Lombards had to pay tribute to Pippin for their lands in the north of Italy. Some years afterwards, Pippin died. He too divided his kingdom between two sons, Carloman and Charles. But Carloman soon died, and Charles became king of the Franks. He is one of the greatest men of the Middle Ages, and famous in history under the name of Charles the Great. End of chapter 18 Read by Carrie Adams Your Book Voice At Mesa, Arizona On the 19th of February, 2022 Chapter 19 of The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill Chapter 19, Charles the Great and the Holy Roman Empire Charles the Great is often called Charlemagne, which is a French way of saying his name, but it must be remembered that the Franks in his days were still more German than French, and soon Charles conquered so many lands that France was only a very small part of his empire. Charles was not a little man like his father, Pepin the Short. Indeed, it was said after his death 
that he was seven feet high. He was very handsome and very clever, and in a few years he won for himself an enormous empire. The Lombards, under a new king, were worrying the Pope again, and Charles marched across the Alps to help him. The Lombards were conquered, Didier their king was forced to go into a monastery, and Charles the Great became king of the Lombards. Then Charles turned against the Saxon tribes between the rivers Rhine and Elba, and conquered them too. He made them all become Christians, and added their land to his empire, but it took thirty years of terrible wars to finish the conquest. Charles conquered also the terrible Avars, a people related to the Huns and very like them. They had overrun the country of Bavaria, but Charles practically destroyed them, and added Bavaria to his empire, so that it now stretched right across the middle of Europe. He also crossed into Spain, and drove the Saracens south as far as the river Ebro. There is a famous French poem written in the Middle Ages called The Chanson de Roland, which tells the story of Charles's war against the Saracens in Spain. The story tells, but we are not sure how true it is, that Roland was the nephew of Charles and fought with him against the Saracens. As they were crossing the Pyrenees back into France, Roland was at the very back of the army. Charles had gone on before when suddenly a great army of Saracens appeared on a mountain top between them. Roland had only a few men, and his friends advised him to blow his horn and bring Charles back to help him. But he was too brave to do this, and made up his mind to fight the great Saracen army with his few men. He did so, and all day they fought, killing many Saracens, but being nearly all killed themselves. At last, Roland blew his horn, and Charles heard it far away and wanted to turn back, but an enemy of Roland told him it was only the sound of the wind. Twice more Roland blew, but the last time it was when he was dying, and all his men were dead. Charles turned back to help him, but found him dead. He loved Roland dearly, and was almost heartbroken. There was another enemy whom Charles dreaded more than any others. These were the terrible Northmen, or Vikings from Norway and Sweden and Denmark. They were Teutonic people, too, and now, when the Teutons and the rest of Europe had been settling down for hundreds of years, they suddenly began to move, and for the next two hundred years were constantly attacking the countries of Western Europe. We shall see later how dreadfully these Northmen, or Danes, attacked the English. In Charles's time they were already attacking the northern coasts of his empire, and after his death they conquered and settled down on parts of it. Charles was a very good and holy man. He was anxious that all the people of his empire should be good Christians. He made good laws and tried to keep order through all his empire. He was always a great friend of the Pope, and was called the Most Christian King and Defender of the Church. At last he received the highest title of all, that of Roman Emperor, which, as we have seen, had been given up more than three hundred years before. Charles had now an enormous empire, and perhaps he himself was anxious to have the name of Emperor. We do not know but this is how he got it at last. On Christmas Day in the year 800, the emperor was kneeling, saying his prayers before the tomb of St. Peter in the church of St. Peter at Rome, when Pope Leo III suddenly placed a golden crown on his head, and all the people cheered and cried out the name of the emperor. There was no emperor of the East at that time, but an empress. However, Charles and the emperors in the West who came after them were never emperors in the old way. Sometimes they were powerful, and sometimes they were not. Later on in the Middle Ages, there were terrible struggles between the Holy Roman Emperors, as the emperors of the West came to be called, and the popes, as each wanted to be more powerful than the other. 
It was a very difficult question to settle. The emperor could only be crowned by the pope, and yet when he was crowned, the pope had to bow before him. The proud popes of the later Middle Ages would do no such thing. Some of the emperors expected the pope to do just what they told him to, and so there were terrible struggles between them. But this was not so with Leo and Charles. They worked together for the good of the people and the good of the church. Charles lived to enjoy his empire until he was seventy years old and was then buried sitting on a marble throne in a vault beneath the beautiful church he had built near his palace in the city of Aachen, or a la chapelle He had ruled so well and lived so simple a life that the people looked on him as almost a saint. When he was not fighting, he gathered scholars around him in his palace. While he was at meals, he would have someone reading or playing to him. He ate well, but drank very little, and cared nothing at all for luxury or magnificence. His whole life was given to the service of the church, and the people of the great empire he had built up. He has always been one of the great heroes of the Middle Ages. Charles the Great died in the year 814, and his son Louis the Pious became emperor after him. Louis was a very good and holy man, and tried to rule the empire well. But he was struggling during the whole of his reign with the people who wanted the empire after him. At first he had three sons and one nephew, and he arranged for the empire to be divided between them when he died, the first son to be emperor. But his nephew, a young man named Bernard, wanted to have Italy for himself, even while his uncle was still alive. He rose in rebellion against Louis but was defeated, and by order of the emperor he had his eyes put out and soon afterwards died. This shows how cruel even a good man like Louis could be in those days. Afterwards, Louis knelt humbly at the feet of the pope and asked pardon for this sin. Later, Louis married a second time and had another young son. His elder brothers did not want this boy to have any of the lands of the empire, and when their father arranged a kingdom for him, they gathered an army to fight him. Before the battle, many of the emperor's friends went over to fight on his son's side against him, and afterwards the meeting place was called the Field of Lies. The emperor was taken prisoner and shut up in a monastery. The sons tried to make him give up his throne, but he would not. After a time, Louis got free again and defeated his sons before he died, but it was a very sad ending. After his death, and after many quarrels between the sons, the great empire was broken up into three kingdoms, which were really France, Germany, and Italy, with a small part of southern France. This division did not last long. There were many more changes, but in the end France became a separate kingdom from Germany. Generally, whichever king had Italy as part of his kingdom was called the emperor. Sometimes there was no emperor at all. Meanwhile, great changes were taking place all over Western Europe. End of Section 19 Chapter 20 of The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill The Days of the Northmen In the days after the death of Charles the Great, while his grandsons and their sons were fighting over his lands, the Northmen, or Danes, whom he had dreaded so much, were sailing the seas and attacking the countries of the west in greater numbers than ever. They would sail up the mouths of rivers, attack the cities, carrying off all the best things from the houses and the richest treasures of the churches. Then they would sail away again. In this way they sailed up the mouths of the French rivers and the rivers of the north of Germany. They came to England, too, and robbed and burned for many years. 
then there came a time when these fierce men of the north came and conquered and did not go away again they were great tall men fierce and uncivilized and still of course pagans in fact they were very much like the franks and the angles and saxons who had overrun gaul and britain four hundred years before in france the northmen nearly took paris for their people but they were driven back by count robert the strong the french kings the descendants of charles martel and pepin and charles the great had become weak and stupid just as the family of clovis had done one of them who ruled both germany and france for a time was called charles the fat and he went mad before his death another of this family who was king of france was called charles the simple a king like this was of no use against the fierce northmen but the counts of paris helped these weak kings just as the mayors of the palace had ruled for the family of clovis under rolf or rollo a fierce chief the northmen were allowed to settle down in the land round rouen which they had seized and which became the duchy of normandy rolf was called rolf the ganger or walker because he always went on foot as no horse was strong enough to carry him the northmen showed themselves very clever in learning the ways of the new countries they settled and in normandy especially showed themselves a brave and brilliant people meanwhile other northmen or danes as they were generally called had settled down in england the great king alfred when they began to attack england in earnest the kings of wessex had for the first time joined all the little kingdoms into which england had been so long divided into one kingdom there were still kings of northumbria and mercia but they were under the king of wessex when the danes came it was the king of wessex who had to fight them it was as king of wessex that the great king alfred fought the danes and kept them from conquering the whole of england after many years of fighting alfred made peace with the danish king guthman but even then he had to give up the whole of the east of england to the danes it was called the dane law and in it the danes settled down and lived at peace with the english just as the other northmen had done in normandy guthrin the danish king had been baptized and alfred was his godfather all the danes of course became christians like their king alfred was able to rule his own people in peace in some ways he was very much like charles the great but he was a better man in many ways especially in his own private life like charles he made good laws and tried to keep his people safe and happy he himself wrote things in english which they might read it was he who began the english chronicle in which the history of england began to be written down for the first time like charles he set up schools and monasteries he built ships too to keep england safe from any more attacks alfred was the greatest of the early english kings the kings who came after him tried to go on with his work and in time they conquered the whole of england even the part which had been given to the danes the last of these great kings was edgar the peaceful and it is told of him how six under kings rowed him up the river dee to the church of st john at chester but after edgar came the weak king ethelred the unready the danes who had now settled in kingdoms of their own in norway and sweden and denmark began to come again and ethelred instead of fighting them gave them money to go away then he did a very dreadful and foolish thing he had many of the danes who were already in england murdered on st bryce's day in the year one thousand two the danes from denmark came to punish ethelred and he was driven out of the country danish kings now ruled england the most famous being the great king canute who was almost a saint but not many danes came with him and they did not alter the english ways of doing things or the english language after a time england got english kings again 
the last of them being Edward the Confessor, who was a saint, but a weak king. After him, Earl Harold took the throne, but was killed by the Norman Duke William at the Battle of Hastings. So the Northmen again ruled England, but the story of William the Conqueror will come later on. While the Northmen were attacking the West Countries, the Magyars, a wild tribe like the Huns, were attacking Germany on the east, and the Saracens were overrunning Sicily and Italy. One result of all this danger, and also of the disorder after the empire of Charles the Great was divided up, was the growth of what is called the feudal system. In the feudal system, all the land of any country belongs to the king. He gives large pieces out to his nobles, who must do him homage for them. They, in their turn, give their lands out to other men, knights and others who become their men, and have to do them homage and fight for them, just as they have to do homage to the king and fight for him. The poorest people of all under the feudal system were serfs. They were not exactly slaves. They lived in a small piece of land on which they could grow things for themselves, but they also had to work on the land for their lords. They could not be sold like slaves, but they were not free to go from one master to another, but had always to stay on the land and work for the lord who owned it. They could not do anything, such as get married or sending their children to school, without permission from their lord. There were not many schools then, of course, but sometimes even the sons of serfs were chosen to go to the schools at the monasteries. Generally they would become monks, but this could only be done with the permission of the lords. In the days when enemies like the Danes were threatening the lands, it often seemed safer for free men to put themselves under the protection of some great lord who lived near. They would give their land up to the lord and receive it back as his man. It was in this way that the feudal system grew. Although the king was supposed to be at the head of all, for many years it was the great lords who had all the power. This was so in France, and also in Germany, where some of the counts, whom Charles the Great had set up to rule different parts of the country, took the lands for themselves when he died. In England, when William the Conqueror came, the feudal system had begun to grow chiefly through the power which the great nobles got during the weak rule of Edward the Confessor. All through the early Middle Ages, when the great nobles everywhere were fighting against each other, the poor people suffered very much. The church did all it could to make things better for them. When on their deathbeds, men were persuaded to set their serfs free. Feudalism was useful in the days when it first grew up, and when the rich men fought for the poor against the enemies of both. But it meant that every great lord was a soldier and in some ways a king. He could always call his knights to fight for him against some other lord, and the people were made miserable by the continual fighting. The church tried to make things better by getting the great nobles to agree to a truce of God. This meant that they would stop fighting for some fixed time. It might be from Wednesday evening to Monday morning in each week, or from the beginning of Lent until after Easter. Or again, the lords might be asked to promise that they would not attack priests or merchants or Jews or women. It must have been a great relief to the people when the lords agreed to a truce of God. In the early Middle Ages, every gentleman who was not a priest was a soldier, and many were called knights. Though they were often cruel to each other and to the poor people, the best of them were kind and good, especially to women. The church tried to teach the knights to do what was right, and sometimes a knight was given his sword and armor with the blessing of the church. Often he had knelt through the whole of the night before praying in the church. The worst sides of feudalism were put down later in the Middle Ages, when the kings grew stronger, especially in England and France. In France, Hugh Capet, the Count of Paris, became king in the year 987. 
at first he had very little more power than the duke of normandy or the other great feudal lords in france with their strong castles and their armies ready to fight for them but in time the french kings grew stronger and stronger and were able to keep the great lords in order and join the whole of france into a strong and great kingdom the end of the dark ages in germany the descendants of charles the great were dead and one of the dukes of the four great duchies into which his german lands were divided became king of germany one of the greatest of these was otto son of henry the fowler of saxony it was he who in the great battle of lechfield at last conquered the magyars who settled down and mixed with the people in hungary which now became a kingdom the magyars became christians and fifty years later had a saint for their king new kingdoms were being made all over the north and east where at last the people were settling down as they had already done in the west we have seen how the danes had made the kingdoms of norway sweden and denmark the slavic kingdom of poland was made in the tenth century then northern pirates attacked the country we now call russia and mixed with the slavonic tribes to form a great kingdom there and all these new peoples became christians in a very short time for missionaries from east or west went to convert them russia was converted by the eastern church to which it has belonged ever since with the settlement of all these peoples one of the great dangers which had threatened the nations of the west all through the early middle ages was over all this time italy had been full of disorder the north had been broken up among several dukes the popes ruled rome and the middle of italy while the south was divided between the greeks and saracens after the death of charles the great the popes had seemed more powerful than ever pope nicholas i especially was very much like the popes who came later in the middle ages and who claimed power over kings and bishops alike but by the time of the emperor otto the great the popes had become very weak and wicked and otto made up his mind to go into italy and put all things right again he first interfered in the north where a great struggle was going on for the lombard crown otto went to the help of a young and beautiful woman adelaide of burgundy whose husband had died while he was trying to have himself made king Adelaide was put in prison by one of his enemies. Otto now went into Italy, took the crown for himself, and being a widower himself, he married Adelaide. Ten years later, in 962, when he had gone to Italy for a second time, he had himself crowned emperor by the Pope, John the Twelfth, who had begged for his help against his enemies. Otto was anxious to set up good popes again, and did so he was the friend of the monks of the new order of cluny which was doing its best to make the church and the people better and holier the monastery of cluny in the middle of france had been set up by william the pious a french duke and under its abbot otto had been made very strict many of the benedictine abbeys had by this time forgotten to do most of the things which they were told to do in the rule of saint benedict but the abbot of cluny set up new monasteries and got some of the old ones to join him all the monasteries belonging to cluny had to obey the abbot of cluny the old benedictine monasteries had been quite independent from each other so that if an abbot was not good or did not mind the rule there was no one to keep him in order the monks of cluny did not work in the fields like the benedictine monks had done but they had longer time for prayers and lived very simply the setting up of this new order of monks shows that there was a new feeling for religion growing up at the end of the dark ages the spread of the order helped to make the feeling stronger in a short time the church everywhere became stronger and better the new popes were quite different from the popes before otto the great was crowned emperor with the cluniac reform as it was called a change seems to have come over the times and we find ourselves in the middle ages proper 
with their great soldiers and saints and wonderful churches and castles and schools and monasteries it is a time above all of wonderful adventure and romance and we must now tell something of its story end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the story of the world a simple history for boys and girls this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by andy glover the story of the world a simple history for boys and girls by elizabeth o'neill chapter twenty one the great pope hildebrand the greatest time in the middle ages was the thirteenth century that is the time between the years twelve hundred and thirteen hundred a d it was the time of great popes and great kings and saints but for two hundred years before this people had been becoming more civilized and times were changing these changes took place in all the countries of western europe but perhaps they are more easily noticed in england in the year 1066 there happened in england a great thing which helped to bring these changes about this was the norman conquest when the great william duke of normandy came over to england and had himself crowned king of england edward the confessor the last real english king had been brought up in normandy and loved the norman people and the norman ways he was a very good man a saint in fact and had a very gentle face and a long white beard he was a friend of duke william of normandy and promised that he should be king of england when edward died as he had not any children to reign after him duke william was a tall dark man with a handsome but stern face and strong like a giant when the news came to him that edward of england was dead he cried out then england is mine but the english had chosen for their king an english earl named harold he was a short fair man with a handsome face and smiling blue eyes he had long fair hair hanging in curls to his shoulders for that was how the young englishmen wore their hair at the time they had sometimes beards too but the normans had short hair and shaven faces when william heard that harold had been chosen king of england he was very angry and made up his mind to come and take england from him he was especially angry because a short time before harold had been wrecked on the coast of normandy and william had made him promise to help him in making himself king of england if he had not made this promise william would not have let him go so harold promised but he did not feel that he was bound to keep his promise and now he had been chosen king himself william got together a fleet and went over the sea to fight harold harold was fighting another enemy in the north of england when he heard that william with a great army of norman soldiers was at hastings in the south he at once marched south and the great battle of hastings was fought both sides fought splendidly but the english were tired with their long march at the end of the day only the soldiers of harold's guard were left fighting around him beside his standard where he had set it up at the top of the hill then at last william told his foot soldiers to shoot high above the heads of the englishmen so that the arrows might strike their heads and faces an arrow pierced harold's eye and he fell at the foot of his standard he was killed immediately and his friends with him and so william won england for himself he had the body of harold put under a heap of stones on the cliff at hastings but it was afterwards taken away and buried by the priests of the church of holy cross at waltham which harold had built for harold was a good man and brave the norman conquest of england william the conqueror was a religious man too and he made great changes in the church in england the archbishop of canterbury stigand had his church taken away from him and a holy monk named lefranc from the abbey of b in normandy was made archbishop instead he was very strict and made all the priests in england live better and stricter lives a great many norman priests and monks came to england too 
and did great good for the people. But there were other changes, which made the English people very unhappy. Nearly all the great English nobles were killed, and their lands were given to William's Norman friends. For two or three hundred years, all the rich people in England were Normans and spoke French. A great many French words, changed a little, were added to the English language. The Normans had much finer manners than the English, whom they looked down on. But after a time, the Normans began to mix with the English and learn their language, and in the end, the Norman settlers and the English they had conquered became one people. The Normans were much more civilized than the English, and they taught the English many things. They were great builders and built beautiful stone churches all over England, some of which remain to this day, for they were very strong as well as beautiful. One way of telling a Norman church from those built in the later Middle Ages is that the arches of the Norman churches were round, and later they were pointed. Great feudal castles, too, were built all over England, but William the Conqueror was one of the first kings in any country to keep the feudal lords in order. They dared not rebel against him, as the feudal lords in France and Germany were always rebelling against their kings, nor would he let them fight among themselves and disturb the people. William tried to rule the English people well, but he could be very cruel. When the English in the north of England rebelled against him, he marched against them, and killed all the people, and burned every house, and destroyed every living thing, so that for years the whole country of Yorkshire was as bare as a desert. William the Conqueror, when he came to England, brought with him a banner, sent to him with his blessing, by the great Pope Gregory the Seventh, who is generally called Hildebrand, and was one of the best and greatest of all the popes. Since the days of Emperor Otto, there had been several popes. Sometimes the emperors had chosen them, and sometimes they had not taken any notice of them. But when Hildebrand became pope in 1073, the emperor Henry III had got much power over the popes. Hildebrand, who was a monk, was very anxious to make the church better, but he did not think it was right that even a good emperor should be more powerful than the pope. He thought, indeed, that the pope should be the head of all Christian countries, and that kings and people should do what he told them. This was why he thought he had the right to take the kingdom of England from Harold and give it to William the Conqueror. But when William became king of England, although he was very good and helped the holy Lefranc to make the church better, he did not think he was bound to obey the Pope in every way. But with the emperors who thought themselves greater than the Popes, there were struggles for many years. The first great struggle between an emperor and a Pope was between Hildebrand and the Emperor Henry IV. Hildebrand was a little man and rather fat. He stammered when he spoke, and he had a rather dull face, except for his glittering eyes. He was not a great scholar, but he was a great ruler. His one idea was to make the world better, and he thought that only the Pope, as head of the church, could do this. All over Europe, the feudal lords were fighting one another, and kings and princes were often not much better. Hildebrand offended Henry IV when he said that bishops should not receive the ringer crozier, the crook which was always given to a bishop, from princes or nobles, but only from the pope or somebody in his place. In those days the bishops were really great nobles too, and received lands like the other great nobles. The kings thought that it was only right that, as the lands came from them, so should the ring and crozier, to show that the bishop owned the king as feudal lord. So, the Emperor Henry IV was very angry when Hildebrand forbade this. Henry was a young man, tall and handsome. He had become king of Germany when he was only a boy, six years old. His father, Henry III, had died then. Henry III was one of the greatest of the emperors, and in his time, the different peoples who lived in Germany had been kept well in order, and the people of the north of Italy, which still belonged to the emperor also. But while Henry IV was a boy, disorder had come again. Henry belonged to the Swabian people in South Germany, 
and the Saxons of North Germany tried to break away from his rule. Henry was still having trouble with these people when the Pope gave his order about investiture, as the giving of the ring and crozier to the bishops was called. Henry sent an angry letter to the Pope, saying that he would not obey him in this, and telling him that he was no Pope but a false monk. Hildebrand then declared that Henry should no longer be emperor, and so war broke out between the two. But the Saxons again rose up against Henry, and the German nobles said that Henry must give in to the Pope. The Pope had excommunicated Henry too, which means that he said he could not belong to the church until he was forgiven. At last, Henry saw that he would have to ask pardon of the Pope. He was told that he must remain quietly at a place in Germany until absolution was sent by the Pope. Meanwhile, he was almost an outcast, with no honors shown to him as a king, and not even allowed to go to church. For many weeks he waited, and then could bear it no longer. He made up his mind to go over the Alps, although it was winter time and very cold, and beg pardon from the Pope. The Pope was at Canossa, and the story used to be told that outside the gate of the castle, there, Henry had to stand three days with bare feet in the snow, until at last the Pope forgave him. In any case, we know that Henry had to beg hard for forgiveness, and it was three days before the Pope would agree. Even then, he still said he had the right to take Henry's kingdom from him, and shortly afterwards, the messengers, whom the Pope had sent to Germany, did choose another king. Henry fought against the new king, Rudolf of Swabia, and got the bishops of Germany and Italy, who were friendly to him, to elect a new pope, who was called Clement III. So now there were two popes and two emperors. Then Henry marched into Italy and into Rome, where Hildebrand shut himself up in the castle of St. Angelo. He sent for help to a great Norman prince, Robert Giscard, who had conquered the south of Italy and made it a kingdom for himself. The Saracens had to give in to him, and at last, the Greek exarch of Ravenna had to give up that city. From this time, the eastern emperor had not even one city in the west. At the same time that Robert Giscard was winning South Italy, his younger brother Roger conquered Sicily and ruled it till he died in 1101. His little son Roger ruled after him, and when he had grown to be a man, and his cousin, the son of Robert Giscard, died, Roger II got South Italy too, and joined them together as one kingdom. Roger won more land still in South Italy, and among other places, he won the beautiful city of Naples. Later, his kingdom was called the Kingdom of Naples and Sicily. The Normans had always been very friendly to the Pope, and Robert Giscard went to Gregory's help. A Norman army marched to Rome, and instead of attacking, Henry burned the city and killed many of the people, and then marched away again. It was the third time in history that the great city had been attacked and burnt by enemies. But the Normans, who were of course Christians, did far more harm than the Gauls so long ago, or the heathen Goth Alaric. Hildebrand followed the Normans to Salerno, and there died soon afterwards. As he lay dying, he said, I have loved God and hated iniquity, therefore I die in exile. And it was true. Hildebrand only behaved as he did to Henry, because he was anxious to have good bishops, and so make the church better. But he did not understand that it would have been much better to try to do this in some other way, by helping the Cluniac monks and the other new orders of monks which were growing up. For good men everywhere were, like Hildebrand himself, anxious for a new time, when men should be better, and there would be an end of bloodshed and misery. And all priests and peoples and kings, and nobles too, should join together to lead good and peaceful lives. Hildebrand did not understand that the kings and princes of Europe would never agree to hold their kingdoms from him. He made a great mistake, but all the same, he was a very good and noble man, and one of the greatest of the popes. The popes who came after Hildebrand were good men too, and the work he had begun went on. 
They were not so fierce as Hildebrand, yet Henry the Fourth was never forgiven. His eldest son, Conrad, was encouraged to rebel against him, and when Conrad died, his other son, Henry, did the same. He raised the Saxons in rebellion against his father, and was called king by the Pope. Henry was growing old and tired. His life had been one long struggle. In his younger days, he had not lived a very good life, but he had grown better as he grew older. His sons and many other people thought that it was not wrong to rebel against him because he was excommunicated and therefore an outcast. Henry had struggled against his elder son, but when the younger turned against him, he threw himself at his feet and begged that at any rate his sin should not be punished by his own child. He tried hard to get the Pope's forgiveness, but would not give up his kingdom. And so at last he died and was buried with his ancestors in the beautiful church at Liege, which he himself had built. But the Bishop of Spire ordered that his body should be taken up again, and for five years it was kept in a chapel at Spire, and then at last buried in the cathedral there. But before Henry's death, great things had been happening in Europe, which showed, even more than his sad life did, the great power of the popes. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of the story of the world, a simple history for boys and girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Stephen Rue. The Story of the World, a simple history for boys and girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 22. The Crusades. Chapter 22. The Crusades. It was in the days of Pope Paschal that the Emperor Henry IV died. But before him there had been the great Pope Urban II, and under him began the most powerful thing that happened during the Middle Ages. This was the beginning of the Crusades, when knights and soldiers from all of the countries of Western Europe joined together and went to the east to fight the Muhammadans and win back from them the Holy Sepulchre, or Tomb of Our Lord which they had taken. At first, all the countries conquered by the Arabs had been governed by one ruler, but afterwards there had been two caliphs, one in the east at Baghdad, the beautiful city on the Tigris which the eastern caliph made his capital, and one in the west. Then, after many years, the caliphs began to lose power, and many Muhammadan kings made little kingdoms of their own, and forgot to obey the caliphs any more. Soon after the year 1000, some Turks from the middle of Asia poured in great numbers into the lands of the Muhammadans in Asia and soon conquered them. These Seljuk Turks, as they were called, because they told tales of a great heroic leader they once had whose name was Seljuk, were a very fierce people related to the terrible Huns who had tried to destroy Europe in the days of Attila. The Turks became Muhammadans but were much fiercer than the Arabs had ever been. They conquered Palestine and Syria, and this was how they took the Holy Sepulchre from the Christians. Before this, Jerusalem had belonged to the Muhammadans of Egypt, who had allowed the Christians to pray at the Holy Sepulchre. In the Middle Ages, people very often made long journeys or pilgrimages to pray at the graves of saints and martyrs and pilgrims went in great numbers especially to the Holy Sepulchre of Christ at Jerusalem. But the fierce Seljuk Turks were very cruel to the pilgrims and very disrespectful to the Holy Sepulchre. When the people in the west of Europe heard of these things, they were very angry, and it was this which brought about the Crusades. The first crusade was in the year 1096, and for 200 years after this, from time to time, new crusades were preached and fought. The great preacher of the first crusade was a Frenchman called Peter the Hermit. He was a priest who lived a very strict life, and about the year 1093, he made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and there saw how badly the Christian pilgrims were treated by the Turks. He came back to Europe and told Pope Urban II all about it, and asked his permission to preach to the people and get the soldiers of Europe to go and save the sepulchre from the Turks. 
The Pope gave him permission, and Peter traveled all over Italy and France telling the people the things he had seen. He was a little man with a thin, pale face, but bright, eager eyes. He wore only a shirt and a pilgrim's cloak, and he rode on a donkey, holding in his hand a cross. People gave him money and presents, but he gave it all to the poor again, and ate just enough to keep himself alive. The people grew very excited when he talked to them, and every man who made up his mind to go to the east to fight the Turks wore a badge in the shape of a red cross on the right shoulder, and he was called a crusader, or a soldier of the cross. The Pope himself went to a place in France called Clermont, and there he called a great meeting, called a council, of bishops and princes and nobles, to whom he talked about the crusade, He spoke to a great crowd of the poor people, too, asking all who could join the crusade. The people shouted as he finished his speech. It is the will of God, great nobles, and captains offered themselves for the crusade, and the soldiers chose which leader they would follow. But before the real crusaders were ready to start, an impatient crowd set off to the Holy Land under Peter the Hermit and a captain called Walter the Penniless. They had no order, and they did much harm and destruction in the countries they passed through. They never reached even Constantinople, but were killed by fierce tribes in the east of Europe. Only Peter the Hermit lived to tell the tale. Meanwhile, on the 15th August, 1096, the army of the First Crusade set out for the east. Among the great nobles who led their soldiers on this crusade was Robert, Duke of Normandy, the eldest son of William the Conqueror. The conqueror was now dead, but Robert had not been made king of England. He was Duke of Normandy, and William the Red was king of England. But Robert was a soldier more than anything else, and had practically sold Normandy to William to get money for the crusade. Many of the princes and nobles were good and religious men, but many, too, went on crusade because they loved fighting and adventures. These were Norman nobles from the south of Italy, and French nobles, like Raymond of Toulouse and Godfrey de Bouillon, Duke of Lower Lorraine. Godfrey de Bouillon, the hero of the Crusades. Godfrey was the real hero of the Crusade. The Crusaders marched through Germany and Hungary to the gates of Constantinople, where the Eastern Emperor wanted them to help him win back some of his land, which the Turks had taken from him. But the Crusaders were thinking of quite other things. For nine months, they besieged the city of Antioch, but took it at last. Then they marched on to Jerusalem, and as they came in sight of the holy city, which they had come to win, the Crusaders fell on their knees. Then they took off their armor and walked with bare feet like pilgrims to the city. But it was a month before they could break their way in, and then the Crusaders showed no mercy. They were cruel enough in their wars with each other at home, but with the enemies of Christ, they were more cruel still. The Mohammedans were cut down and killed in their streets, and the horses of the Crusaders were up to their knees in blood as they went to the Holy Sepulcher. There, the leader prayed, with hands and feet bare and Godfrey dressed in a robe of white linen. The nobles now had to choose a king to rule over Palestine, with his capital at Jerusalem. Robert of Normandy was chosen first, but he loved better to fight than to rule, and so refused. So Godfrey was chosen and agreed to do the work of a king, but he would not wear a crown, he said, in a city where his king had been crowned with thorns. Then most of the knights and soldiers went home again, while Godfrey stayed to rule his kingdom, and so ended the First Crusade. Godfrey de Bouillon died before a year was passed, and his brother, Baldwin, became king of Jerusalem in his place. Godfrey and his friend Tancred were the greatest and best of the knights who fought in the Holy War. Many of the others were not good men, but the lives of men like Godfrey show us the better side of the times. Not very many knights remained in the East after the First Crusade, but the new ones were always going out. Baldwin ruled Jerusalem for 18 years, and after him, his nephew, another Baldwin. All this time, there was fighting with the Muhammadans, but the kingdom of Jerusalem was well and strongly governed. But after the death of Baldwin II, when the Counts of Anjou got the crown, things were different. 
One of these kings was a leper, and the others were only children, and the feudal lords, among whom the land had been divided, became very disorderly. Many of these lords had married women of the east, and lived in luxury which they learned from the eastern peoples. Their children and their children's children forgot the ways of the west, and were very different from Godfrey and Tancred and the knights of the First Crusade. In fact, the defense of the Holy Sepulchre and the fighting against the Muhammadans was now chiefly done by some knights who really became monks. That is to say, they lived the lives of monks during times of peace, not marrying, but living together in a monastery and spending most of their time in prayer, while in the time of war they lived as soldiers. There were two orders of these knights at Jerusalem. The knights of one order were called the Templars because they made their first monastery near the place where the great Temple of Solomon had once been. The other was the Order of St. John, or the Hospitallers, who were so called because they set up a hotel or hospital where poor pilgrims to the Holy Sepulchre could eat and sleep. In the year 1145, the Turks attacked the city of Edessa, in the northeast of the kingdom of Jerusalem. Edessa was ruled by one of those feudal knights who had given themselves up to pleasure, and he did not even try to save the town. But when the news came to Western Europe, the Christians were very indignant, and so the Second Crusade was made ready. The man who did most to persuade princes and people to join this crusade was the great monk St. Bernard, who was the most important man of his time. The two chief leaders in the Second Crusade, which started for the East in 1146, were the Emperor Conrad and the French King Louis VII. But the Second Crusade was quite a failure, and Louis and Conrad soon came home again. The Kingdom of Jerusalem grew weaker and weaker, while the Turks grew stronger. At last there arose a great hero among the Turks called Saladin. In some ways, although he was a fierce Mohammedan and hated Christianity, Saladin was very like the best of the Christian knights. He was very fond of children and gentle to women. Though he was fierce in fighting, he was not cruel to his prisoners. His soldiers loved him and would do anything for him. The people of Western Europe were shocked to hear, in the year 1088, that Saladin had conquered the Christian kingdom and taken Jerusalem himself. It was this news which brought about the Third Crusade. King Richard of the Lionheart the Third Crusade was almost as great as the first, though it did not win much in the end. The Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, or Frederick with the Red Beard, who was one of the greatest of the emperors, joined it. So did Philip Augustus, one of the greatest of the French kings, who had by this time become strong rulers, able to keep the French feudal lords in order. The great hero of the crusade on the Christian side was the King of England, Richard Cesar de Lyon or Richard of the Lion Heart, as he was called, because he was so brave. Many dukes and nobles joined the crusade too. Frederick Barbarossa had been crowned emperor when he was about 30 years old by Pope Adrian IV, the only Englishman who was ever a pope. Adrian's name, before he became pope, was Nicholas Breakspear. He had been a poor student at one time. Frederick was one of those emperors who thought that the emperor should be above the pope, and he nearly quarreled with Adrian by saying that he would not hold the Pope's stirrup to help him get off the, his horse, but in the end, he did it. But later on, the Pope and the Emperor had many quarrels. A great many important towns had grown up in the north of Italy, and some of these, especially Milan, did not want to be under the Emperor, who still kept the north of Italy as well as Germany. But Frederick took a great army into Italy and practically destroyed Milan. He quarreled too with the new Pope Alexander III, and soon after his friends tried to set up another Pope, who was called the Antipope. Once during the quarrel he marched to Rome, had the Antipope set up in the palace of the Popes, and got him to crown his wife Beatrix. After many years the other cities joined together into a league called the Lombard League and helped to build up Milan again. When the emperor came again on one of his many visits from Germany to fight them, there was a great battle. The men of Milan fought round a sacred car on which was a figure of Christ. The best soldiers had been picked out to defend the car, and they were called the Company of Death. 
This time the towns won, and the emperor had to give them a great deal of freedom, though he still kept a sort of power over them. Frederick then gave in to the pope and was received again into the church, for he had, of course, been excommunicated. In the great piazza, or square in Venice, he knelt at Pope Alexander's feet, and the pope raised him up and gave him the kiss of peace. It was just 100 years since Henry IV had asked for forgiveness at Canossa, so again the Pope had won. Frederick, then, had a stormy life, and was an old man when he joined the Third Crusade. He led his great army by land, while Philip and Richard took theirs by sea. But as the German army reached a stream just before crossing into Syria, the brave old emperor was drowned. The river was flowing very quickly, but the emperor spurred his horse into it, and was carried away and drowned. The people of Germany were full of sorrow, for he had ruled them well, and they had loved him. He was a very handsome man, with long yellow hair curling over his ears and with a long red beard, from which the Italians called him Barbarossa. He had a clear white skin and bright eyes and a merry smile. Long afterwards, the German people looked back on his reign as a time of great peace and joy. They said, indeed, that he did not die, but was only sleeping, and would come one day to rule them again. The other leaders stopped before the town of Acre, and besieged it for two years. There was fierce fighting, and Richard of the Lionheart, who had come late, showed his great courage when, although he was ill, he had himself carried among the soldiers, so that he could give them orders in the fight. The black standard of Saladin waved proudly above the city, though Saladin was not there at the time. With Richard's help, Acre was soon taken, and the crusaders were now free to march to Jerusalem. But Philip Augustus was anxious to get home again and give himself up to the work of making France stronger. Most of the French soldiers went home with their king. Richard led the rest of the crusaders after this and won many battles against Saladin, but he could not win Jerusalem and at last he made peace with Saladin. The Christians had lost the kingdom which they had won in the First Crusade, but were allowed to keep a little land on the coast round Jaffa, and pilgrims in small numbers were allowed to visit the Holy Sepulcher. Before he turned homewards, Richard was taken to the top of a hill, from which he could see the white buildings of Jerusalem glistening far off in the sunshine. But Richard put his shield before his face. He could not bear to look at the Holy City, which he had hoped to win again for the Christians. For a hundred years after this, there were other crusades, though not so great as the first and third. But Jerusalem was never really won back, and is in the hands of the Mohammedans still. Richard started for home, but it was a long time before he reached England, for he had many adventures on the way. Saladin died the next year. One reason why the Third Crusade was not a great success was that the leaders were jealous of each other. Although Richard was so brave and splendid a knight, he was not easy to get on with, for he wanted to have things all his own way. One of the leaders who had quarreled very bitterly with Richard was Leopold, Duke of Austria. Richard had to pass through Leopold's country on his way home. He dressed himself up as a pilgrim, but someone found out who he was, and he was put in prison by the Duke. After a time, Richard was given over to the new emperor, Henry IV, the son of Frederick Barbarossa. The emperor kept him in prison for two years. A story is told that no one in England really knew what happened to Richard until his minstrel Blondel found out where he was. A story is told of how Blondel traveled from castle to castle all over Germany, and at last, he rested outside the castle where Richard was shut up. He heard his master's voice singing an old French song. Blondel, in great excitement, sang a verse of the song, hoping that Richard would hear him, and he did. Richard was glad, for he knew that Blondel would go back to England and tell the English people of the troubles of their king, and so he did. Richard's wicked brother John was looking after England and did not want the king to come back, but in the end he had to pay the ransom of a great sum of money which the emperor asked for and Richard was at last set free. He did not live long after he got back to England. For years after his time, the Mohammedans told tales of his great courage and strength, and in Syria, if an Arab's horse jumped or seemed frightened, the Arab would say to it, Why, do you think it's King Richard? 
At the same time that the Christians and the Mohammedans were struggling in the east, a great struggle was going on too between the Christians and the Moors in Spain. We have seen that Spain was the only country in Western Europe, except the south of Italy, which was won by the Mohammedans. The Normans had conquered South Italy again, but for hundreds of years nearly all Spain belonged to the Moors. Charles the Great had, however, driven them as far south as the Ibro, and little Christian kingdoms had grown up there. In time, these began to grow stronger, and by degrees to push the Moors farther and farther south, so that by the end of the 13th century, they only had a little strip of land in the south, and nearly all Spain was Christian again. The great hero in this struggle between the Moors and Christians in Spain was a man named Ruy Diaz, but who has always been called by the Spaniards the Cid, which means the Lord. He was born not many years after the year 1000 and spent his whole life in fighting. The people of Spain tell that he always fought for the Christians, but other people have said that he sometimes fought for the Moors. At any rate, he won many marvelous victories over the Moors, and he died still fighting them, when he was an old man about the time of the First Crusade. The Spaniards tell that their hero was kind and gentle, as well as brave. Once, they say, he was returning after a victory, which he had won over five Moorish kings. He saw a poor man suffering from the dreadful disease of leprosy, which so many people had in the Middle Ages. The leper was lying on the road begging for pity, but the Spanish knights passed him by, all except the Cid, who lifted him up and took him home on his horse, fed him, and put him to sleep in his own bed. In the night, the Cid awoke, and the leper was no longer there, but a beautiful figure stood beside him and spoke to him, telling him that he was Saint Lazarus, and had only appeared to him as a leper, and he promised him that he should win in his battles against the Moors. The Spaniards told, too, how when the Cid lay dying, he heard that a great Moorish army from North Africa was coming to Spain. He told his soldiers that when he died, they must not cry out or mourn, so that the enemy would know what had happened. But they must dress him in his armor, put a sword in his hand, and tie him sitting on his horse, and he would once more lead them to victory, though he was dead. And so he did. His soldiers fought around their dead leader, and the Moors were defeated in a great battle. And after this, the Christians went on conquering until the Moors were driven out of Spain. End of chapter 22. Chapter 23 of The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Andrew Frame. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 23. The Monks and the People in the Time of the Crusades. In the early days of the Crusades, when the soldiers of the cross were fighting in the East, many interesting things were happening among the people left at home. We've seen that in all the countries of Western Europe, there were people who were anxious to live better lives. New monasteries and convents were built where men and women who wanted to pray and live in peace could go. Especially in France this happened, partly perhaps because the feudal lords were so powerful in France while the king had not yet got much power. Great new orders of monks rose up, for sometimes a monk, seeing the faults in the older monasteries, would set up a new monastery with new rules by which to keep from these faults. One of the greatest of these new orders was one founded by St. Bruno. At first, Bruno was head of the school belonging to the cathedral at the French town called Reims. In those days, there were no schools, except those belonging to the cathedrals and monasteries, and as a rule, only boys who were going to be priests or monks were taught to read and write. Bruno was very good and pious, and when the new archbishop of Reims, who was named Manassas, did wrong things, Bruno scolded him. But the archbishop was very angry, and Bruno had to go away from Reims and hide for a long time. Then, when Manassas died, the priests at the cathedral chose Bruno to be their archbishop, but the French king, Philip I, would not agree to this. Reims was in that part of France where the French king had real power. Philip was a very wicked king, and Pope Hildebrand had told him so plainly, while later Pope Urban excommunicated him because he sent away his queen Bertha after he had been married to her for twenty years, 
and took another wife. Naturally, Philip did not want an archbishop who was a saint like Bruno. However, Bruno did not mind at all, but went into a wild part of the country near a town called Grenoble and built there a new monastery. He made quite a new rule for his monks. Instead of doing everything together, like the earlier monks eating in a large room called the refectory and sleeping in another large room called the dormitory, St. Bruno and his monks each had a little house of his own. Each monk lived and ate and slept in his own house and only went with the other monks at those times when they prayed in the church. The monks never spoke and lived the very strictest of lives. The monastery which St. Bruno built near Grenoble was called the Grand Chartreuse. Afterwards, he went to Calabria in Italy and built two more charter houses, as monasteries of this order were called. The order was called the Carthusian Order, and soon it spread over the countries of Western Europe. It never became less strict like many other orders. There is a Carthusian monastery in the south of England even now, where the monks live exactly the same kind of life that St. Bruno and his monks lived 900 years ago. There were lay brothers, also in the order, who did not spend so much time in saying prayers, but did the work of the monastery and grew things on the land. The monks of the Grand Chartreuse found out how to make a certain kind of wine, which is called Chartreuse, and nobody else has ever found out exactly how it's made. There was another great order of monks, which was begun about the same time as the Carthusians. This was the great Cistercian order, which also began in France. A holy monk named Robert set up a Benedictine monastery at Molem in the north of Burgundy. He tried to make his monks keep the rule of St. Benedict properly, but they thought he was too strict and would not. So, very sadly, Robert left them with just a few of the monks and went to a lonely place called Cito in the south of France. He began another monastery there. The Great St. Bernard At first, there were only Robert and his few friends. One of these was named Stephen Harding and was an Englishman. Afterwards, he was made a saint. Soon people began to hear about the splendid lives which the monks of Cito lived, and one day there came to the monastery a young French nobleman named Bernard. He had with him thirty of his relations, and he begged that they might all become monks. This Bernard was the great Saint Bernard, who became the most important man of his time. So many men came to be monks at Cito that the monastery would not hold them, and so little bands of monks were always going away to set up new monasteries in other places. St. Bernard himself did this and became head of a monastery at Clairvaux. He is often called St. Bernard of Clairvaux. But all the monasteries of the Cistercian order were under the abbot of Citeaux, and he in his turn had to take the advice of the abbots of the four other chief monasteries of the order. One of these was Clairvaux. The Cistercian monks gave up the black robe of the Benedictines and wore white habits. They are often called the white monks, though the Carthusians and some others of the new orders wore white too. The Cistercians always built their monasteries in wild country places far from the towns. For instance, when they came to England soon after the year 1100, they set up many of their monasteries in the wild districts of Yorkshire, and soon they turned these places into the most beautiful spots in the country. For the Cistercians were always very clever in growing things, and in many places, too, they covered the land with sheep. The wool of the sheep was sold to be made into cloth. The Cistercians often became very rich, but they were very kind to the poor and were not allowed to spend much money, even on their churches. At first, especially, their churches were built very plainly and were not allowed to have towers or spires because these were not necessary. There were no silver or gold crosses in their churches, but only painted crosses made of wood. But though the Cistercian monks lived such strict and quiet lives, they soon spread all over Europe. St. Bernard was greater, indeed, than any pope, and the popes and bishops of the time were glad of his advice on all sorts of things. He lived a very strict life indeed, and ate so little food that after a time he became so weak that he was sick every time he took any food at all. But this did not prevent his praying and preaching. He traveled through France and Italy, preaching to the people who crowded to see and hear him. When once more an anti-pope was struggling with the real pope, it was St. Bernard who got the anti-pope to give in, and so made peace in the church. St. Bernard was very severe with anybody who was against the church in any way. 
In his time, when people were thinking more and more about religion, there were some men and women who began to believe things which the church said were wrong. These people were called heretics and were sometimes punished and even killed. St. Bernard had no mercy on such people and was always anxious to have them punished, for he thought that they did much harm to the people by teaching them the wrong things. There were many heretics in the south of France. There was one man called Pierre Dubris, who was a priest, but had done something very wrong and so was not allowed to live any longer as a priest. He wandered about the south of France preaching against the priests and saying that what they taught was wrong. He made a great bonfire of crosses and statues which he said it was wrong to use, but the people were so angry they took him and burned him alive. There was another man, too, named Peter Valdez, a rich merchant belonging to the French city of Lyon. He was excommunicated, but long after his death his followers wandered about France and Italy preaching against the church. These heretics were sometimes called the poor men of Lyon. The chief heretics in the south of France were called the Albigenses because Albi was one of their chief towns. St. Bernard was full of sorrow and anger against the heretics, and he blamed it all on one man. This was the famous Abelard, whose life story is one of the saddest and strangest in all history. He was born in Brittany, and like St. Bernard himself, he belonged to a noble family. While he was still a young boy, people saw that he was going to be very clever. In those days, the schools were still joined to the monasteries and cathedrals, but some of the schools had become more famous than others, and when the news spread that a good teacher was to be found at any particular place, scholars would crowd to his school. Abelard, when he was a young man, went from one great school to another. Before he was twenty, he was at the school belonging to the Cathedral of Notre Dame at Paris, listening to the lectures of a famous teacher called William of Champeaux. But Abelard soon showed himself much cleverer than his master. He asked questions which William could not answer, and soon the students left their old master and followed Abelard from place to place. At last, he set up his school on the Mont saint Genevieve, the famous hill in Paris looking down on the cathedral. Abelard's teaching was very clear. He said that people must not believe what they were told just because they were told but that students should see the reasons of the things they believed. He said that the older teachers had not really tried to make things clear, but lighted a fire not to give light, but to fill the house with smoke. After a while, William of Champeau found that he had no pupils at all, and so gave up teaching in disgust. Abelard was afterward made a canon, as a priest belonging to a cathedral was called of Notre Dame at Paris. One of the older canons named Fulbert had a young niece living in his house. Her name was Heloise, and she was very beautiful and very clever. She could read Latin and even Greek, and Abelard used to help her in her studies. After a while, Abelard and Heloise loved each other very much, and in the end, they were married to each other. Fulbert was very angry about it all because a priest was forbidden to get married. He was still more angry when Heloise told people that they were not married. She did this because she was afraid that it would do harm to Abelard if people knew that he had married her. In the end, Eloise became a nun, and Abelard fled away from the anger of her uncle to a monastery. He left the monastery of St. Denis outside Paris because he quarreled with the other monks. Even now that he was a much sadder and wiser man, he could not help teaching what he thought was the truth. He made the monks very angry by saying that some of the things they said about their patron saint were not true but only old tales. He still gave lectures, and crowds followed him. After a while, he set up another monastery in a lonely spot, but left it again, and Heloise then went with some nuns and lived the rest of her life in this convent of the Paraclete, as it was called. She always loved Abelard, and wrote the most beautiful letters to him, which we may still read. St. Bernard hated the teaching of Abelard, not so much for the things he said as for the independent spirit which he encouraged. To St. Bernard, his questioning and arguing about the things which the church taught seemed little better than the teaching of heretics like Pierre Dubris or the poor men of Lyon. At last, St. Bernard got a council of bishops to meet at the town of Sens in France, and they said that Abelard's teaching was heresy. Abelard appealed to the Pope, that is, he would not agree that he was wrong, and offered to go to Rome and let the Pope judge the case. On his way, he stopped at the monastery of Cluny, 
which then had for its abbot a great and good man called Peter the Venerable. Here Abelard became very ill, and Peter, although he was as devoted to the church and its teaching as St. Bernard himself, was very gentle and kind to Abelard. Indeed, Abelard begged to be received as a monk of Cluny, and very soon afterwards he died. Halloise asked that his body might be buried at her convent of the Paraclete, and so it was. Years afterward, when she died, an old woman, her body was buried beside that of the man she had loved all her life. Afterwards, they were moved from place to place for different reasons, but now they rest in one grave, in the great cemetery of Père Lachaise at Paris, and there visitors may see it any day. Some of Abelard's pupils became the greatest teachers of the time and were honored by the church, for although they taught the same things as Abelard, they taught in a different way. But one of Abelard's pupils, a man called Arnold of Brescia, a town in North Italy where he was born, had a very sad ending indeed. He was a canon regular, that is to say he belonged to a church where the canons lived like monks, although they did the work of ordinary priests. Arnold was very discontented with the church as it was. He said the priests should not have any money at all, but should live on what the people gave them. He said, too, that it was not right that the Pope should rule the city of Rome. It was quite right, he said, that the Pope should rule the whole church in religious things, but in things of this world he should have no power. He went to Rome and got the people to rebel against the Pope and set up a government of their own. One Pope fled away from Rome altogether, and for a time, Arnold of Brescia got his way. But when the English Pope, Adrian IV, had crowned Frederick Barbarossa, the Emperor took Arnold of Brescia prisoner and gave him up to the Pope. He was tried for heresy and found guilty. He was killed and his body was burnt. The ashes were thrown into the river Tiber for fear the people who had followed him and loved him should carry them away and keep them as relics of a saint. Two years before St. Bernard himself had died, he had called Arnold the armor-bearer of his master Goliath, meaning Abelard. St. Bernard was the greatest man of his age. His one fault was his severity to men like these, but this did not come from any cruelty, but because he was afraid of the harm they might do to the church and the people. Naturally, St. Bernard was very gentle and tender. He wrote some beautiful hymns in Latin which are still sung in the Catholic Church. They've been put into English and are sung in other churches, too. England after the Conquest We've seen how English dukes and kings took part in the Crusades. The English people, too, shared in all the changes which were going on in the other countries of Western Europe. Monks from the new orders came to England, and monasteries of Cistercians, Carthusians, and regular canons were spread all over England. England had her saints, too, in the 12th century. The two greatest were St. Anselm and St. Thomas Becket. St. Anselm was a monk from the same Abbey of Beck in Normandy, from which William the Conqueror had brought Archbishop Lanfranc. Lanfranc died soon after the Conqueror's son, William Rufus, or the Red, became king. The Red King was not only strict like his father, but he was wicked and cruel. For a long time he would not have a new archbishop at all, but he became ill and was then so frightened that God would punish him that he asked Anselm to be archbishop. Anselm was very gentle and good. When he was abbot of Beck, the other monks were not always pleased, for if he saw poor and hungry people, he would give away the food in the monastery, never troubling about the fact there would be nothing left for himself and his monks to eat. Anselm did not want to be archbishop of Canterbury. He knew that as soon as the Red King was well again, he would forget all about God and would be cruel once more to the church and the people, and he thought that he would never be strong enough to struggle with such a king. He said that it would never do for a poor sheep like himself to be put to the plow with a wild bull like Rufus, instead of the two strong oxen, William the Conqueror and Lanfranc, who had worked together so well to make the English church better. But the bishops made him give in and almost carried him to the church to be made archbishop. Everything happened just as St. Anselm expected. When the Red King got well again, he behaved just as badly as ever. And in the end, St. Anselm fled away to France, and stayed there till the Red King died. Then his brother, Henry I, who was called Beauclerc, or the Scholar, became king. He was a clever man and a good king, and he wrote and asked St. Anselm to come back, like a father, to his son Henry and the English people. He came, and together Henry and he did all they could to make the people and the priests better. 
Priests had been forbidden to get married, but in the days before the Norman Conquest, nearly all priests had wives. But now, this was strictly forbidden. Henry himself and his wife, good Queen Maud, gave a great deal of money to set up new monasteries. The king and the archbishop had one quarrel about investitures, the thing which the emperor and the pope were quarreling about at the same time. In England, it was soon settled. Bishops were to have the ring and crozier given to them by the archbishop, but were to do homage for their lands to the king. The struggle was settled between the pope and the emperor in the same way a few years later. Henry's only son was drowned as he was sailing from France to England in the white ship. The prince had given the sailors a great deal of beer to drink in his honor, and the nobles and ladies had danced on the deck of the ship in the moonlight, but the sailors were not paying attention to their work, and though it was a beautifully still and clear night, they let the ship strike against a rock. It was wrecked and everyone was drowned, except one poor butcher who clung on to a floating piece of wood. When Henry heard of the death of his son, he was broken-hearted, and people said that he never smiled again. He got the nobles to promise that they would have his daughter Matilda for queen when he died. The English had never had a queen to rule them without a king before, and some of the nobles broke their promise and crowned Henry's nephew, Stephen, king. Then for nearly twenty years, Matilda and Stephen fought. Stephen was a weak man, and the nobles did just what they liked. They built strong castles all over England and fought with each other. The people lived in misery, and the monks who wrote their chronicles, the only books of history which there were in those days, give long and terrible stories of the sufferings of the poor people when the cruel nobles took all they had from them and prevented them from growing things on the land. It was the only time that the feudal lords had things their own way in England, and the people could understand what the French and German people suffered until strong kings saved them from the nobles. In the end, it was settled that Matilda should give up her right to the crown, but that her son, Henry, should be king when Stephen died. And so it was. Henry II was a strong king. He soon put an end to the disorders of feudalism and made all the nobles pull down most of the castles which they had built in the time of Stephen. He tried to bring order in the church too, and it was this which brought about a great quarrel with Thomas Becket, who was now looked upon as one of England's greatest saints. Before William the Conqueror came to England, Priests and other people had always been tried and punished for doing wrong things by the same judges. But William had said that the church should have courts of its own, and priests should be tried in them only. This had been done. But the punishments in the church courts were not so severe as in the other courts. In those days, everyone who could read was called a clerk, and could say that he would be tried in the church courts. Henry thought this was bad, for clerks could even commit murder, and only have the easy punishments given by the church courts. So he wanted to have clerks tried first in the church courts, and if they were found guilty, he said that they should be tried again in the ordinary courts and be punished just like other people. Becket, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, said this was not fair. Becket had at first been Henry's Chancellor, and had been so lively and fond of pleasure and so friendly with the king that Henry thought that if he made him Archbishop, he could have things all his own way in the church. But he found out his mistake. Becket did not want to be Archbishop, but once he had said yes, he made up his mind to live like a saint. He gave up all his old amusements and spent his life in work and prayer. When Henry tried to get him to agree to his new arrangements for the church, There was a terrible quarrel, and Becket, like Anselm before him, fled over the seas to be safe and peaceful. After six years, he was allowed to come back. Henry was in France, and heard there that Becket had punished some of the bishops for doing things without his permission while he was away. Henry flew into a terrible fit of anger and said, Is there nobody who will rid me of this insolent priest? Four of his knights who heard him immediately went out, crossed the sea to England, and as the archbishop was in his cathedral just before Vespers or Evensong, they attacked him, knocking him down dead with his brains dashed out on the stone floor. When the monks of the cathedral took up his body to make it ready to be buried, they found that the archbishop wore under all his splendid robes a shirt made of prickly hair, which he always wore to do penance for his sins. The people honored him as a saint, and later he was called a saint by the church. Henry was full of horror when he heard the news. He often had these terrible fits of anger and said things which he did not mean. 
When he got back to England, he wanted to do penance at the archbishop's tomb in the cathedral. He felt that he had committed a great sin, and he must have remembered, too, that Thomas Becket had once been his dear friend. He knelt at the tomb, dressed only in a shirt. He got the monks to scourge him with a whip, and then knelt alone, praying at the tomb during the whole night. For hundreds of years after this, pilgrims came in crowds to pray at the tomb of St. Thomas Becket, and it was soon covered with their offerings of gold and jewels, and became the richest shrine in England. After this, Henry did not dare to interfere with the church courts. But in time, the worst kinds of crime, whether by priests or people, came to be tried in the ordinary courts. The Great Charter There was another struggle between an English king and the Archbishop of Canterbury, which is even more important than the story of Thomas Becket. After the death of Henry II, England was ruled by Richard of the Lionheart, the great knight and crusader. He died soon, and his wicked brother John became king after him. John was a handsome man and clever, but he cared for no one but himself. He was very cruel, and once when a noble rebelled against him, he starved the man's wife and child to death. He made the people pay great sums of money in taxes and spent it on his own pleasures. Another thing which made the English people very angry was that John let the French king win Normandy from him. This seemed a great disgrace. But after this, the English kings thought more of England and less of Normandy, and stayed more in England instead of always sailing over to France. John had a great quarrel with the Pope. This Pope was Innocent III, the greatest since Hildebrand. There was a quarrel between the king and the monks of Canterbury about choosing an archbishop, and in the end, the Pope chose one himself. This was a good priest named Stephen Langton. John said he would not have him for an archbishop, and then the Pope put all of England under an interdict. This meant that the churches were closed. There could not be any services. Babies could not be baptized, and men and women could not get married. All this seemed very dreadful to the people. For five years, John would not let Stephen Langton come to England. Then the Pope said he should be king no longer. This terrified John, and he gave in. The interdict was taken off the country. John gave up his crown and took it back from a cardina who took the place of the Pope. Stephen Langton came and was made Archbishop. He immediately began to help the nobles to force King John to rule better. They wrote down many things which the king was to promise to do, and these promises were afterwards called the Great Charter. The nobles got together an army and marched to meet the king at London, but he fled to Windsor. At last he saw he must give in, and at a place nearby called Runnymede, he signed the Great Charter. But he never meant to keep his promises. When he had signed the charter and the nobles had gone, he threw himself on the ground, shrieking in anger. Afterwards, he got Pope Innocent to set him free from his promise. Then the nobles said they would take Louis, the son of the French king, to be king of England instead of John. A French army came to England, but soon John died. He had been nearly drowned in crossing the wash, and his crown and jewels were lost in the water with his other luggage. Afterwards, he was ill and made himself worse by eating fruit and drinking cider, and so died. The nobles then joined together and made John's baby son, Henry, king. It was said that he was crowned with his mother's bracelet. There was much trouble sometimes after this, but after the Great Charter, no English king ever dared again to treat the English people so badly. And it was chiefly Stephen Langton whom the English people had to thank for the signing of the charter. So we see how in England, just as in other countries of Europe at that time, the monks and priests took a leading part in history. In the century which followed, we shall see greater kings and soldiers and greater saints still. End of chapter 23. The Monks and the People in the Time of the Crusades. Chapter 24. Of the Story of the World. A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jennifer Painter The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill Chapter 24 The Thirteenth Century at the beginning of the 13th century, the Western Church was ruled by the greatest of all the popes, 
Innocent the Third. We have seen how Pope Innocent interfered in affairs in England, but in all the other countries of Europe it was the same. He was a very handsome and noble-looking man. He belonged to a noble Roman family and became Pope when he was only 37 years old, which was young for a Pope. He lived a good life and was very kind and gentle, though sometimes his fierce temper would break out. He believed that the Pope should rule over all the world and that the kings should obey him, or if they did not, that he could take their kingdoms from them as he had threatened to do with John. Pope Innocent was the first Pope who was really able to do these things, and indeed he was the last, for no Pope after him was able to behave in this way. The kings and people were ready to obey the Pope in religious matters, but would not agree that he was over them in other things. Yet Pope Innocent used his power well. King Philip Augustus of France was growing more and more powerful. It was he who won Normandy from King John, and he made the feudal lords obey him, so that France became a strong kingdom like England. But Philip Augustus was not a good man. He married a young Danish princess called Ingeborg, but the day after the marriage he sent her away and said he would not have her any more for his wife. He then married another lady. Pope Innocent was very angry and sent word to the French king that he must take back his proper wife. Philip Augustus would not, and so France, like England, was put under an interdict. Then the king gave in, and soon after, when the new wife died, he took Ingeborg back, but it was twenty years before he behaved to her as though she was really his wife. All this time Innocent would not be friendly with the king, but after this they became great friends. Innocent was very anxious that the Crusades should go on, and so they did through all the 13th century, but though great men joined them, there was never any real success. One great result of the Crusades was that there was much more trading between East and West, and in time, the ships of Venice, the city which had grown up among the lagoons in the north of the Adriatic Sea, got most of this trade. Venice became rich and important. At the same time, the Eastern Empire lost a great deal of its trade and was becoming weaker and weaker. Its emperors were weak and stupid men. Now, when in the year 1203 the Fourth Crusade was begun, it was arranged that the Venetian ships should carry the Crusaders to the east. But instead of sailing to Palestine, the Venetians attacked Constantinople and made themselves master of it. Constantinople was a most beautiful city, full of great buildings and statues and treasures, some of which belonged to the great days of the Roman Empire. The Venetians robbed the churches and other buildings and sent back some of the greatest treasures to help them make their own beautiful city still more beautiful. Most of the northern Italian cities were independent by this time. Venice was a republic and was ruled by a duke the Doge, as he was called, chosen by the people. Every year, at the same date, the Doge, sitting on a throne in a beautiful ship, hung with scarlet and gold stuffs, sailed through the canals of Venice into the harbour. There the Doge dropped a golden ring into the water, saying, We wed thee, O sea, in token of our true and eternal dominion over thee. It was a blind old doge called Dandolo who led the Venetians against Constantinople on the Fourth Crusade. Pope Innocent was not pleased that the Crusaders had attacked a Christian city instead of the Mohammedans, but he comforted himself, for the Church of the Eastern Empire did not obey the Pope, and now for nearly sixty years Constantinople was ruled by princes from the West, just as the Kingdom of Jerusalem had been. In the end, the Greeks won their empire back, but Crete and other islands belonged to the Venetians for hundreds of years. Every year Venice grew richer and more beautiful. Marble palaces and churches were built along her canals, and even now, when the city is no longer great, visitors gliding in gondolas, as Venetian boats are called, along her canals are filled with wonder at their beauty. Pope Innocent was always trying to stir people up for a fresh crusade, 
and in his time people must have been talking continually about the Holy Land. The Children's Crusade In the year 1212, at a time when no one seemed to be taking any notice of the Pope's requests, a young French shepherd boy called Stephen made up his mind to lead a crusade himself. He got together thousands of other young boys, and they marched south to Marseille on the coast of France. Stephen promised those who followed him that he would lead them over the seas without wetting their feet. But most of these children, for they were only boys, were carried off by slave dealers and sold as slaves in Egypt. About the same time, a boy called Nicholas from Cologne in Germany got together an army of young boys and led them into Italy, meaning to go on to the Holy Land, but no one knows what became of them. These expeditions were called the Children's Crusade, and Pope Innocent said to the men whom he wanted to go to the Holy Land, The very children put us to shame. At last, a new crusade did start. The Fifth Crusade had for its leader the Emperor Frederick II, who was one of the greatest men of the Middle Ages. He was the grandson of Frederick Barbarossa, and his father was the Emperor Henry VI. His father died while he was a baby, and his mother Constance died soon afterwards. She was a Norman, and from her he had the Kingdom of Sicily. While he was a boy, Pope Innocent looked after Frederick. He was brought up at Palermo, and he was a very clever and nice-looking boy. He learned all he could from the Greeks and Arabs of Sicily, and knew so much that people called him the wonder of the world. Pope Innocent died when Frederick was only twenty. Although Frederick had been brought up by a pope, this did not prevent him from quarrelling with the popes who came after. Indeed, the quarrel between the emperor and the popes was perhaps bitterer than ever under Frederick II. Frederick pretended to be a good Christian, but people said that he did not really believe the things which the church taught. He made friends with the Arabs in Sicily and South Italy, and lived in great luxury like they did. He gathered scholars and poets together in his palace, and even studied the use of medicines. He had a great number of camels brought from the east, and the Sultan of Egypt sent him a present of an elephant, which people thought a very curious and wonderful animal. Very few people had ever seen such a thing, although four hundred years before, Charles the Great had had one too. The Pope after Innocent was called Honorius III. He had once been Frederick's teacher, and was always very gentle with him. But Frederick only made use of his friendship to please himself. He got the Pope to agree to his son becoming Emperor after him, although he had promised that he would not make him Emperor and King of Sicily too, as the Pope thought that this was too much power for one man. All that during the time of Honorius, Frederick was promising to go on crusade, but he never did. Then the new Pope, Gregory the Ninth, at last lost patience and excommunicated Frederick for not keeping his promise. Then at last Frederick led a great army to the east, and now the Pope was angry again, for he said that a man under sentence of excommunication should not dare to fight in the Holy War. There was practically no fighting, but Frederick made a ten years' peace with the Mohammedans, and Bethlehem, Nazareth, and Jerusalem were handed over to the Christians. Frederick crowned himself King of Jerusalem, but no priest could be got to go through the services of the church for him. Frederick then went back to Italy, where he found the Pope's armies in Apulia, part of his kingdom in South Italy. Frederick soon drove them out, and then at last peace was made between the Pope and the Emperor. Frederick cared much more for Italy than he did for Germany. In his kingdom in the south he made himself a despot. No one else had any power at all. But in Germany he let the great lords do what they liked, and although his father and grandfather had done a great deal to join the German states into one kingdom, Frederick let them become almost independent and it was this which helped to keep Germany broken up for hundreds of years into little states, instead of being one nation like France or England. Frederick's son Henry, who was to be emperor after him, rebelled against his father 
and was shut up in prison in Apulia. There he was to stay until he died. But he escaped, and, as he preferred to die rather than be caught and put in prison again, he drove his horse over a high precipice, and so killed himself. Frederick had a long struggle too with the towns of northern Italy, and won great victories over them, and he quarrelled once more with the Pope. Frederick invited all kings and princes to join him in fighting against the Pope, for he said the Pope wanted to take all power from them, but the other kings took no notice. Pope Gregory, in his turn, said that Frederick was wicked in his life and a heretic in his beliefs, and tried to get the Germans to rebel against him. He even offered the Emperor's crown to the brother of King Louis the Ninth of France, but the French nobles told the Pope that he could not give or take a king's crown except with the advice of a general council, that is, a meeting of bishops from different parts of the world. Pope Gregory did try to get a council together at Rome. The ships of Genoa were to carry the bishops to the council, but Frederick had nearly all the greatest towns on the coast of Italy on his side. Chief of them was Pisa. They got together a fleet and captured the Genoese ships. The bishops were carried off to Naples and were tormented with hunger and thirst and then thrown into prison. Frederick was even going to attack Rome when Pope Gregory died. A new pope, Innocent IV, was just as bitter as Gregory and the emperor again threatened to attack Rome. Innocent fled to Lyon in the south of France and there called a council which said that Frederick should be emperor no longer. King Louis of France tried to make peace, but the enemies were too bitter. Rebellion broke out against Frederick in different parts of Germany and Italy, and in these later years of his life he lost instead of winning battles. Frederick grew very unhappy and began to look on everyone as his enemy. He thought that his faithful friend, Peter della Vigna, who had always served him well, had turned against him, and he had his eyes put out. He then dragged him with him, dressed in rags, wherever he went, until in the end Peter killed himself. Frederick's favourite son, Enzio, was taken prisoner by the people of Bologna, one of the north Italian cities which fought against him, and the emperor was told that he was to be kept in prison all his life. Soon after, Frederick became very ill and died. It was said that he made peace with the church and had himself dressed in the habit of a Cistercian monk and so died peacefully and happily. Others said that he died cursing and in the greatest misery, but probably this is not true. Frederick II was the last of the great emperors who struggled against the great popes. When Frederick II died, his son Conrad ruled as king in Germany. He sent his brother Manfred to rule Sicily for him. But the Pope was no more friendly to Conrad than he had been to Frederick. He offered Sicily to different people, among them Henry III of England, who gladly paid large sums of money to the Pope, who promised Sicily to Henry's second son, Edmund. A crusade was preached against Conrad, and fighting began, but before long the Emperor died, leaving a little son called Conradin. Manfred then fought and won Naples and Sicily for himself, but the Pope now offered the crown of Sicily to Charles of Anjou, the brother of King Louis the Ninth of France. Charles led a great army against Manfred and killed him. Conradin was now fifteen years old. He was a brave and handsome boy, and he made up his mind to march from Germany and win back the kingdom of the two Sicilies, from Charles of Anjou. He took with him his dearest friend, Frederick, Duke of Austria, and a small army, but he was taken prisoner, and he and his friend had their heads cut off by Charles' order. Charles of Anjou was a cruel ruler, and the people of Sicily and South Italy hated him. They hated him too for his cruelty to Conradin. As Conradin was going to lay his head on the block, he had thrown down his glove, which was the way a knight invited another to fight, and had declared that the German people would wash out in French blood this insult to their king. It was not very many years before the Sicilians themselves took a terrible revenge on their French rulers. 
a French soldier insulted a Sicilian girl on the street, and her lover stabbed him to the heart. It was the signal for an attack on all the French in the island. The massacre began as the church bells were ringing for vespers, and went on through the whole night. It was always afterwards spoken of as the Sicilian Vespers. Soon after, Pedro of Aragon, the husband of Conradin's cousin, fought Charles and won Sicily from him. French rulers still governed Naples, but in a few years this too went to a Spanish ruler. Conradin was the last of the family of Frederick II. After his death, the seven German princes, who had the right of electing the emperor, chose foreigners like Richard, Duke of Cornwall, the brother of Henry III of England, or Alfonso the Wise, King of Castile. But at last they saw that they must elect a German prince, so that the emperor could keep order between the states. But after Frederick's time, these rulers were German kings, and hardly interfered at all in Italy. The great towns of northern Italy began each to conquer the smaller towns round them, and soon Venice, Milan and Florence was each the capital of a little Italian state. St. Louis of France King Louis the Ninth of France, who had tried to make peace between the Pope and the Emperor, was very different from Frederick. He was a saint and a splendid king besides. He too had become king as a baby, when his father Louis the Eighth, the son of Philip Augustus, died. His mother was a Spanish lady, Blanche of Castile. She was a very brave and determined woman, and when the feudal nobles, whom Philip Augustus had kept in order, tried to get their own way again, she soon put down their rebellion. She looked well after her boy, and had him carefully taught and trained, so that he was not at all spoilt by being a king so soon. He loved his prayers, and when he was grown up, he would get up at midnight to go to matins in the church, just as the monks did. His nobles indeed grumbled, because they said he wasted so much time in prayer, but he reminded them that they wasted more time still in gambling and hunting. But St. Louis was not sad or gloomy. He was always good-tempered and patient, and could not bear people to say unkind things about each other. He hated swearing or rough ways of speaking. Every day he brought a hundred poor people to eat at his table. For himself he took any food which was set before him and always added water to his wine. He went to see sick people in their homes and would wash the feet of beggars and even nursed lepers. Yet St. Louis found plenty of time too to rule his country well. He was strong and healthy taller by a head than any of his knights, finely shaped with bright eyes and long, fair hair. He loved his children very much and was a splendid husband and father. He kept France orderly and happy, and although he was strict with the feudal lords, he never cheated them or used them roughly as his grandfather Philip Augustus had done. There was never a better king or a nobler knight than St. Louis of France. St. Louis went twice on crusade, the first time was in the year 1248. Four years before, the Christians had again lost Jerusalem, and this time they lost it for ever. It was the Sultan of Egypt who had captured it, and it was against him that St. Louis led his army. St. Louis was a brave soldier and a good leader, but the swampy lands of the mouth of the Nile were difficult to cross for soldiers who were not used to them. The heat was dreadful, and there was very little food. A plague broke out among the soldiers, and soon St. Louis was taken prisoner. His whole army laid down their arms, but nearly all were killed. Only St. Louis and the rich lords were kept alive and set free when a large ransom was paid. Then St. Louis went on to the Holy Land, but he would not go to Jerusalem, for, like Richard of the Lionheart, he could not bear to see the Holy City when he knew that he could not win it back for the Christians. St. Louis brought back to France a crown of thorns, which was said to be that with which our Lord was crowned, and the lance which pierced his side, and the sponge which moistened his lips. He built a beautiful little chapel in Paris in which these relics were kept. It is called the Sainte-Chapelle, and may still be seen today. 
After St. Louis came back from the crusade, he always wore quite plain woolen clothes in winter and robes of dark-coloured silks in summer. The Christians still had Antioch and the other cities of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, but they were always quarrelling among themselves. At last the Sultan of Egypt took Antioch too and threatened Acre and the other cities. Once more St. Louis got ready to go on crusade, but he died on the way in the year 1270. His last words were, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. His followers sadly carried his body back to France. Charles of Anjou, the cruel king of Sicily, was with St. Louis when he died at Tunis. Charles was only anxious to win something for himself from the crusade and made peace when the ruler of Tunis promised to pay the double of the tribute to the kings of Sicily, which he was already paying. Edward of England, the son of the English king Henry III and grandson of King John, sailed up to join the crusade, just as the treaty had been signed. He was very angry and sailed off with his own thirteen ships to Acre. He stayed in the Holy Land a year, but once more Charles of Anjou arranged for peace with the Sultan of Egypt. The Sultan tried to have Edward secretly killed with a poisoned weapon, but he was wounded and not killed. His good wife Eleanor sucked the poison from the wound and so saved his life. The End of the Crusades Edward left the Holy Land to come back to be King of England when his father died. He was the last great Western prince who really went on crusade. A year or two later the Pope preached a great crusade but died before it started and the crusade was given up. In a few years more, even the few places which remained of the Kingdom of Jerusalem were taken by the Mohammedans, and only a few ruins remain today to tell the tale. The Crusades may seem to us to have failed altogether, but after all great things had been done in them, and though some of the men who joined them were selfish and ambitious, many others were very noble. It was a splendid thing that the kings and princes of Europe could agree to go together and fight for their religion in far-off lands. It was a pity that they could not always agree, and that the journeys were not arranged better. If only the Kingdom of Jerusalem had been kept in the hands of Christians, the Turks, who have since conquered Greece and other parts of Eastern Europe, and ruled them very cruelly, might have been kept out of Europe altogether. Edward of England, the last of the great crusaders, was called Edward I when he became King of England. There had been other kings named Edward, but not since the Norman Conquest, and it was from that time that the kings were now counted. But by the time Edward became King of England, the English and the Normans in England had become one people. Edward was an old English name, and Edward I was a real English king. In his reign, the English language began to be used in the courts of law, before that, French had been spoken there. Edward was a fine, handsome man like St. Louis, taller by a head than ordinary men. He was not a saint, but he was a very good man. Even when he was a boy, he had been very wise and sensible. His father, Henry III, the son of John, who was crowned King of England while still a baby, had not been a very good ruler. He was a good man, but not a wise king. He loved poetry and artistic things, and in those days the French people knew much more about these things than the English did. Henry filled his court with Frenchmen. Some of them were wicked and greedy men, and very cruel to the people. At last, a great English nobleman, called Earl Simon de Montfort, made up his mind to fight the king, and make him send away the foreigners and rule England properly. Earl Simon took the king prisoner, and the young Edward too, but after a time Edward got away, and he himself got together an army and fought against Earl Simon. A great battle was fought at Evesham in the south of England, and Earl Simon was killed. Then Henry was able to rule England again, but Edward told him that Earl Simon was quite right in wanting him to send the foreigners away, and so Henry ruled England with Edward's advice until he died. And when Edward became king, he too remembered the lessons he had learnt from Earl Simon and ruled England well and wisely. So, although Earl Simon died in a struggle against his king, 
England ought to be very grateful to him, for he fought and died for the sake of his country. One great thing Edward learned from Earl Simon. Ever since the Norman conquest, the kings of England, when they asked advice at all, had called a meeting of the great nobles, but Simon de Montfort got each county to choose men to send to Parliament, and told some of the chief towns to do so too, and so the ordinary people began to have a share in the government of the country. King Edward saw that this was a good thing, and so he did the same, and this is how our Parliament really began. Edward I was a very brave soldier. He was anxious to win Wales and Scotland, and join them to England. In his time, Wales, whose people were descendants of the Britons, who had been driven west by the English when they first came to this country, was ruled by princes of their own. Edward made the princes pay tribute to the English king, and afterwards when they rebelled, he conquered Wales, and it has belonged to England ever since. He tried to do the same with Scotland, but Scottish heroes like Robert Bruce and William Wallace fought hard for their country, and all his life Edward was fighting to win Scotland, but never did. He died on his way with an army to Scotland, and told his son, who became Edward II, to carry his body with him to battle, and never to bury it until Scotland had been won. But Edward II was a weak and foolish king. He took no notice of his promise, and soon Scotland was quite free from England, and remained so for three hundred years longer, when a Scottish king became King of England too, and so joined the two countries. But in spite of his failures, Edward I was perhaps the greatest of our old English kings, and one of the noblest knights of his time. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jennifer Painter. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 25. St. Dominic and St. Francis. We have already seen how full of great men the 13th century was. There were great popes like Pope Innocent III, great kings like St. Louis of France and Edward I of England, and great emperors like Frederick II. But the greatest men of all in that wonderful time were two saints, St. Francis of Assisi and St. Dominic. Both these saints founded new orders, which were different from the older orders of monks, and did work especially needed at the time. The stories of the two saints are very much alike, and yet very different. St. Francis was born in a little town called Assisi, among the hills in the middle of Italy. His real name was John Bernardone, but his father, who was a cloth merchant, called him Little Francis, or the Little Frenchman, and the boy kept the name when he grew up. In those days there were not, of course, any big shops like there are today. Merchants travelled from place to place selling their goods, and Pietro Bernardone, the father of St. Francis, travelled a great deal in France. Pietro gained a good deal of money, and the little Francis was always well dressed. He was a merry little boy with dark skin and laughing brown eyes, and he was always the leader in fun and mischief with the other boys of Assisi. But as he grew up into a young man, he grew very serious indeed. It was a time when men were growing more religious, and Francis could think of nothing else. His father was very angry once when Francis, who was helping him with his business, sold a great deal of cloth and gave the money to a priest to help him to build again his poor little chapel, which was falling into ruins. Pietro now said he would have nothing more to do with him and took him before the Bishop of Assisi to have him disinherited, that is to say, that nothing he possessed should ever go to his son. Francis said that this only made him understand better than ever that he had no father except his father in heaven. He took off his clothes, saying that he would have nothing at all which came from his father on earth. The bishop gave Francis a cloak, and for the next few years Francis lived as a beggar in Assisi, nursing the sick and helping the poor. When he was a boy, 
he had had a great horror of the terrible disease of leprosy, but now he made it his special duty to take care of the lepers. There was a little old chapel in the flatland below the hills of Assisi. It was called the Chapel of St. Mary of the Angels. One day, when St. Francis was hearing Mass there, he suddenly thought of the words of our Lord in the Bible, which told the apostles to preach the gospel and to carry neither gold nor silver, nor money in their girdles, nor bag, nor two coats, nor sandals, nor staff. It seemed to Francis that these words were spoken to him, and though he was not a priest, he went up to Assisi and began to preach to the people. Other young men joined him, and when there were twelve of them all together, Francis said, Let us go to Rome and ask the blessing of the Pope. And so they did, with bare feet and dressed only in rough brown frocks, with a rope tied round the waist for girdles, they went to Rome, and Pope Innocent III blessed them and agreed to their way of living, and St. Francis went back happily to Assisi. Many of his old companions who had laughed at him and thrown stones at him when he first began to live like a beggar, now followed him. It was very difficult not to love Francis, for he himself loved everybody and everything. His great wish was to live just as our Lord had lived, and to be as meek and gentle as possible. Perhaps no one who has ever lived has been so nearly perfect as St. Francis was. He loved poverty for Christ's sake, and was never happier than when quite without food. No Franciscan, as the men who joined the new order were called, were allowed to carry money. They had to beg for food, and if no one gave it to them, then they must go without and be glad for Christ's sake. Yet St. Francis was always joyful and even merry. He would sing as he tramped barefoot along the dusty roads of Italy, for soon the Franciscans began to go from place to place to preach. He said that poverty was his lady and his bride, and he loved her more than any man could love a wife. Franciscans were soon travelling in all the countries of Europe. They were called Friars Minor, or Little Brothers. Wherever they went, they lived as St. Francis had taught them. All over Western Europe now, towns were growing up, and in most of them there were very poor people. It was in the poorest parts of the town that the Franciscans built their houses and churches. At first these houses were very plain, although the 13th century was the time when the great Gothic churches, with their pointed arches and beautiful carvings and statues, were being built. After a time, the Franciscans forgot some of the things St. Francis had told them, and built fine churches too, but not at first. The Franciscans preached in plain, simple language, so that the people could understand easily, and so they taught and comforted the people whom the ordinary priests had often left quite to themselves. The older orders of monks had often become very rich by this time, and also they had their monasteries chiefly in the country. The Franciscans travelled too into far-off countries. St. Francis himself went to the Holy Land and preached on the way to the Sultan of Egypt. Before the century was over, Franciscans travelled right across Asia and preached at the court of the great Khan, the ruler of a people called the Mongols. St. Francis lived the last years of his life at Assisi, preaching and praying. His chief thought was of the terrible sufferings of our Lord, and before he died, in some mysterious way, his own hands and feet and breast had on them wounds like those made by the nails and lance in the body of Christ. When St. Francis died, his body was buried at Assisi, and a great church was built above his tomb. On the walls there may still be seen wonderful paintings by Giotto, one of the earliest of the great Italian painters. In them we may see stories of the life of St. Francis, and there is one very beautiful picture which shows St. Francis taking the Lady Poverty for his bride. After the death of St. Francis, the Franciscans still went on with their work, but in time they came to use money and to live very much like the older monks, though they always went on doing good work among the poor, and even in England today 
we may still find the friars of St. Francis doing the work which St. Francis and his companions did 700 years ago. St. Dominic lived and did his work at the same time as St. Francis. He was a Spaniard and belonged to a noble family of Castile. Very early he became a priest and a regular canon. While on a visit to the south of France, he made up his mind to spend his life in preaching against the heretics there, who were called the Albigensians. Although these people thought that they were much better than ordinary Christians, they taught some very dreadful things. They thought that everything about the body was bad and that only the soul was good. They even thought it was a noble thing to starve oneself to death or to kill babies and so free their souls from their bodies. St. Dominic went about preaching better things to these heretics, and other young men joined him. They wore a white frock with a black cloak and were soon called the Preaching Friars. St. Dominic, like St. Francis, wished his friars to be poor, and for a long time they lived very much like the Franciscans. But their chief work was preaching against heresy. St. Dominic was very gentle like St. Francis. He would spend his nights on the stone floors of a church, only stopping in his prayers to go quietly to look at his friars as they lay sleeping and to cover them up more warmly. He could not bear to see other people suffering and would cry from pity. He had a very noble and beautiful face and his friars said that a heavenly light shone round his head. He had very beautiful hands. St. Dominic's preaching did not put an end to the heresy of the Albigensians, and in the end the Pope preached a great crusade against them. Simon de Montfort, the father of the great Earl Simon, who fought against Henry III, led this crusade, and in the end the Albigensians were nearly all killed, and so their heresy died out. But St. Dominic himself did not take any part in the crusade. He trusted altogether to preaching the truth, and hated the idea of fighting. Both the Dominicans and Franciscans often preached in the open air, and great crowds of people would gather round to hear them. The Black Friars, as the Dominicans were soon called, because of their black cloaks, were always good scholars, and very soon they became the greatest teachers of philosophy and theology in all the countries of Europe. The schools, like that at Paris where Abelard had taught, had now been turned into universities, in the universities, the teachers banded themselves together and got privileges from kings and popes. There were soon universities in most of the great towns where great teachers had taught in the 12th century. Scholars and teachers from Paris had come to England and set up schools at Oxford, which soon became a university too. Cambridge became a university soon after. In Italy and Spain too, the universities spread. Still, as in the old days, scholars flocked to the place where a great teacher of any subject could be found. At Paris or at Oxford, there were not only French or English students, but many foreigners as well. It was not long before the Grey Friars, as the Franciscans were called, and the Black Friars too, were found teaching in the universities. The greatest philosopher and teacher of the 13th century was an Italian Dominican friar called Thomas of Aquino, and now generally called St. Thomas Aquinas. He wrote a very wonderful book on philosophy and another on theology. He wrote, too, some wonderful and beautiful Latin hymns. The Franciscans, too, were great hymn writers. An Italian Franciscan, St. Bonaventura, wrote a wonderful Latin hymn called the Dies Irae, or the Day of Wrath which is still sung in Catholic churches today. Another great Franciscan was an Englishman called Roger Bacon. The Franciscans studied the uses of herbs and medicines to help them to cure sick people, and Roger Bacon was the first man in the Middle Ages who said that people should try to find out all about the world and things in it by making experiments, that is, doing things and seeing what would happen, instead of just believing the teaching which was passed on from one generation to another. Roger Bacon's way of studying science has been followed now for many years, but in his own time his teaching seemed very dangerous. He was even kept in prison for 14 years, 
but was let out before he died. There were nuns, too, belonging to both the new orders. The Franciscan nuns were called Poor Clares, from the name of St. Clare, who was the first woman to follow St. Francis. She was only a girl of seventeen when she begged St. Francis to give her the habit or frock of a Franciscan. She belonged to a noble family of Assisi, and her father was very angry, but Clare was determined to lead the life she had chosen. Her sister Agnes and many of her friends and relations joined her, and they had their convent at the little church of San Damaniano, outside Assisi, which St. Francis had given his father's money to rebuild. There St. Clare lived with her nuns, dressed in rough frocks, like the friar's minor with bare feet, and there she lived the strictest of lives. The poor Clares lived always in their convents, and gave up all their time to praying and working. There are many convents of poor Clares still. Then, too, people in the world who were married and had children, or for some other reason could not become monks and nuns, were joined to these orders and called tertiaries. They had to live as good lives as they possibly could and say certain prayers, and when they died they had the privilege of being buried in the habit of a Franciscan or a Dominican, according to which order they belonged. So St. Dominic and St. Francis and their friars played a very important part in the lives of the people in the later Middle Ages. The Great Poet Dante There was one other great man born in this century whose name is better known to people today than even those of St. Francis and St. Dominic. This was the great Italian poet Dante. We have seen how the North Italian towns at last made themselves practically free from the emperor's rule and governed themselves. Venice became a republic, governed by men chosen from a few noble families. Others, like Milan, soon fell into the hands of despots and were ruled by one family who passed on power from father to son for many years. The beautiful city of Florence on the river Arno was at first a democracy. In nearly all these cities there were quarrels always going on between different sides. Sometimes one side would be for the Pope and the other for the Emperor. And long after the struggle between Emperors and Popes was over, the names of Ghibellines and Guelphs, as the supporters of the Emperors and those of the Popes were called, went on. A little after the middle of the 13th century, there was born in one of the great families of Florence a little boy called Dante Alighieri. Dante grew up in the beautiful city of Florence and loved it dearly. He tells us himself how, when he was a boy of nine, he met at a children's party a little girl just a little younger than himself. She was dressed in a simple frock of a beautiful red colour, and from the moment he saw her, the boy thought her the most beautiful thing on earth. He always loved her, but though she grew to be a woman in Florence, he only met her again once or twice. She married another Florentine, and died before she was thirty years old. But Dante never forgot her, and he wrote about her afterwards in his wonderful poetry. He himself married a Florentine lady, and had four children. He had an important place in the government of his city, but when he was thirty-five, the party to which he did not belong got power in Florence, and Dante was banished from the city he loved so much. An order was given that if he came back, he should be burnt to death. His wife stayed in Florence, but Dante spent the rest of his life wandering from city to city in Italy. He was always welcomed and honoured by the rulers of other cities, but he was always homesick for his own beloved Florence. At last he was told that he could go back if he apologised and paid a fine, but he said he would never go back unless he was to be received with honour. He spent his years of exile in writing poetry. His greatest poem is called the Divina Commedia, or the Divine Comedy. It was the first great poem of the Middle Ages written by a poet in his own language. Dante, like all the scholars of the time, had been trained in Latin, which was the language used by all scholars, and of course the language of the church. But Dante chose to write in his own beautiful Italian language. 
In the Divine Comedy, Dante described the life after death as it was imagined to be by the men of the Middle Ages. The great poem was divided into three parts, describing hell and the punishment of lost souls, purgatory and the sufferings of those good people who had died before they were perfect, and heaven and the joy of good people freed from all stain of sin. Dante described himself as passing in a vision or dream through all this, and it is Beatrice, grave and beautiful, who leads him through the courts of heaven. Everything which the great philosophers and theologians like St. Thomas Aquinas taught about God and religion is to be found described poetically in this wonderful poem. The language itself is very musical and beautiful, and everyone who really wants to understand the Middle Ages should read it through. Dante died at last in Ravenna and was buried there. In later years, the Florentines would have given a great deal to have his body buried in his own city, but the people of Ravenna would not give it up. One of Dante's great dreams was that all Italy should be joined together as one nation, but that did not come until nearly 500 years after his time. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 of The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Jennifer Painter The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill Chapter 26. The Black Death The men who lived in the 14th century were different in many ways from those of the 13th. It was not a time of great saints. The Crusades were over. Sometimes a prince or noble would get ready to go on a new crusade, but never went. There were great kings in the 14th century, but they were not such splendid men as St. Louis of France or Edward I of England. The great popes, too, had passed away. They no longer quarrelled with the emperors about ruling the whole world, for they soon found that they had no real power in ordinary matters over kings and princes, but only in matters of religion. For seventy years, indeed, the popes lived at Avignon in the south of France, instead of at Rome, and were very much under the power of the French kings. In 1294, Boniface VIII became pope. He was full of the old ideas of Hildebrand and Innocent III about the greatness of the popes. He gave an order that in no country should priests pay any sort of tax to the state. Edward I of England, although he was a good and pious man, was very angry at this and made the priests pay their taxes all the same. Philip the Fair of France, the grandson of St. Louis, was very angry too, but Boniface took no notice. The next year he invited pilgrims to come from all parts of the world for a great feast in honour of the Apostles. People came in thousands and thousands, and Boniface was delighted. It took two men working all the time to shovel the offerings of money from the tomb of St. Peter. Meanwhile, the quarrel between the Pope and the French King went on. Philip declared that France was independent of the Pope. Boniface replied by threatening to take the French throne from Philip. At last, Philip sent some of his servants to attack Boniface in his palace at Agnani, up in the mountains near Rome. These men burst into the palace, threatened the Pope, and kept him prisoner for three days. Then his Italian friends went to his help. But Boniface had received a dreadful shock, and a few days after he died. He understood at last that the Pope was not all-powerful, and his heart was broken. Another Pope was elected, but died almost immediately. People said that he was poisoned by some figs, sent to him by the servants of the French king. The next Pope was a Frenchman, and it was he who chose to set up his court at Avignon, a town in the south of France, but which had been given to the Pope. For seventy years the Popes were Frenchmen and lived at Avignon. The Italians and the people of the other countries of Europe did not like this because it gave the French kings too much power over the popes. People mocked and said that the pope was really a prisoner, and afterwards this time in the history of the popes was always called 
the Babylonish captivity, a name taken from the seventy years during which the Jews had been kept captive in Babylon. The Hundred Years' War It seemed a very strange thing to people in the fourteenth century to have the popes living at Avignon, when they had lived at Rome during so many hundreds of years. But many other strange things happened too, and there was a great deal of discontent and excitement. The English and French people began a great war with each other, which lasted altogether for a hundred years. Sometimes it would stop for a few years, but never for very many. It was called the Hundred Years' War. It caused the greatest misery to the French people, and though for many years the English won most of the battles, it did them no good in the end. The war was begun by Edward III of England, the grandson of Edward I. Edward was like his grandfather in many ways, but he was not such an earnest man. He was a great knight and a good soldier, but the knights of this time were very frivolous and luxurious. They wasted days and weeks in tournaments and were very vain and extravagant in their dress. They loved fighting for its own sake. When his uncle, the King of France, died, Edward III said that he ought to be king because of his mother, who was the sister of the king. In France, women could not inherit the crown, and in any case there were other women with a better right than Edward's mother. But Edward really wanted an excuse for fighting the French. There were many reasons for the French and English disagreeing at the time. Ever since the days of Henry II, the English kings had had land in the south of France, and the French kings were always trying to win it from them. Then, too, the French and the English were both building more ships, and the sailors of the two nations often quarrelled on the seas. The first great fight of the Hundred Years' War was between the French and English fleets, and the English won. After this, the English were always greater at sea than the French. Edward's way of fighting the French was to land in the north of the country and march along, burning every village he came to. If a French army faced him, he would fight it, win a victory, march on, and then come home. But he never really made any use of his victories. Perhaps he knew that he had no real chance of winning France. His greatest victory of all was at the Battle of Crecy in 1347. This was won by the English archers, who fought on foot. These archers were men of the middle and poorer classes of Englishmen, and there were always a good many in Edward's armies. The French armies were chiefly made up of knights who fought on horseback. The archers were men from Genoa in Italy, who fought with old-fashioned crossbows, while the English used the longbow. When the English archers shot at the French horses and knights, these were immediately thrown into disorder. Often the ground was soft and swampy, and the horses could hardly get along. As the years went on, nearly all the fighting in France was done by Edward's eldest son, the Black Prince. He led great armies, burning and destroying, through the south of France, causing the greatest misery to the people. In 1356 he won the great battle of Potiers and took the French king prisoner. The prince waited on the king at table and treated him with the greatest respect. The knights of the 14th century were always careful about these things, yet they could be terribly cruel. The Black Prince himself burned the town of Limoges to the ground and had all its people killed because they had offended him. King John was carried to England, but allowed to go back to France to try to collect his ransom. But France was miserably poor through the war and he could not get enough money. So he went back to England again and died a prisoner. In the year 1360, peace was made between England and France. The English king gave up his claim to the French throne, but was given the Duchy of Aquitaine, which covered nearly half of the south of France. For the next ten years there was peace. Edward III was now growing old, but the Black Prince died the year before him in 1376. Before he died, nearly all of Aquitaine had been won back by France. Edward III had grown very weak and foolish in his old age. He had never been a very good man, and in his old age he gathered round him wicked men and women. One woman stole the rings from his fingers as he lay dying, and left the old king to die alone. 
it is hard to believe that this was the same king who had been so gay and merry a few years before. It was Edward III who set up the Order of the Garter. It became the greatest honour to be made a Knight of the Garter, and it still is. Yet the beginnings of the Order were very peculiar. Once at a ball at the court of Edward III, somebody picked up a garter, and Edward immediately said that he would set up an order of knights who should wear a garter on the left leg as their special badge. It is sometimes said that Edward set up the order of the garter in honour of the taking of the French town of Calais by the English at the beginning of the Hundred Years' War. The English had been besieging this town for many months, when at last it sent to ask for mercy from the king. Edward, who was very angry, said he would only let the people of Calais go free from punishment if they gave their city up, and also sent to him six of their chief men, dressed only in shirts with ropes round their necks, and the keys of the city in their hands, and he would do what he liked with them. Six of the chief men of Calais offered to do this, and came before Edward and his queen Philippa. But the good queen was full of pity for them, fell on her knees crying, and begged the king to let them go free, and so he did. When Edward III died, his young grandson, the son of the Black Prince, became King of England. He was called Richard II. He was only a boy of sixteen when a great rebellion of the poor people of England broke out. It was called the Peasants' Revolt. The peasants in different parts of England rose in revolt against the rich owners of the land. Often they took scythes and other things with which they worked on the land for weapons. The peasants of Kent had for their leader a man called Wat Tyler. He persuaded them to march to London so that they could tell the king their troubles. When they got to London, the boy king rode to meet them and promised to try to make things better for them. But Wat Tyler, who must have been a bad man, led his men into the city and they burned houses and killed every servant of the king they could find. The next day Richard rode out to meet them again. He was a tall, slim, handsome boy, and looked very brave and noble as he faced the peasants. Wat Tyler rode up to speak to the king, but he looked as though he was going to strike him, and the mayor of London, who was with the king, drew his dagger and stabbed him to the heart. He fell dead, and the mayor was afraid that the peasants would attack the king, but Richard rode bravely up to them and talked to them, while the mayor rode off and brought some soldiers to protect the king. The peasants, now that their leader was dead, went back to their homes again. The thing that they had complained about was a tax which the king had tried to collect from them. They said they were too poor to pay it. They had other troubles too. Three times during the 14th century, a terrible plague of sickness called the Black Death had spread over the countries of Europe from the east. People died in hundreds. Half the people in England altogether died of it, and especially the poorer people. In those days there were not, of course, nearly so many people in any country as there are today. In the whole of England there were not as many people as there are now in London. After the Black Death, the rich landovers found that there were not so many people as before to cut the corn and work on the land. Sometimes whole fields of corn had to be left to go bad because there were no labourers to cut it. Then the labourers, seeing that, asked for more wages. In the early days after the Norman conquest, the labourers had not had money wages, but had had small pieces of land for themselves, and were bound to work several days each week on the land of their lord. They were serfs. But for many years the lords had been letting the serfs go free, and were paying wages to the labourers. Now some of them wanted to make the labourers serfs again. Altogether the lords, and the labourers too, were very discontented with the changes caused by the terrible Black Death, and it was really this which brought about the peasants' revolt. There were even some people who said, as people called socialists say now, that there should not be rich people and poor people, but that all should be equal. One man who was a priest, and named John Ball, went about the country saying, When Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? He was called the Mad Priest of Kent. Another of these preachers was called Jack Straw, and another Grindcob. They were all taken and hanged before the end of the Peasants' Revolt. 
Some people said too that the peasants were encouraged by another priest named John Wycliffe, but he had not really had anything to do with the revolt except that he taught that priests should be poor and that the church in England was too rich and sent out priests of this kind to preach to the people. John Wycliffe was a teacher at Oxford and a very clever man. Besides teaching that the church should be poor, he said too that the bread and wine which the church taught were changed into the body and blood of Christ in the Mass were not really changed. This was heresy, and Wycliffe was taken before the Archbishop of Canterbury to be examined on these things. He either denied that he had said them, or explained them in some way to which the Archbishop agreed, and so Wycliffe went safely back to his church at Lutterworth, where he lived for some years saying Mass and working as a priest, and then died. But for many years there were men who went on teaching these heresies of Wycliffe. They were called Lollards, and some of them were burnt to death in the 15th century. After the Peasants' Revolt, people settled down again, and as time went on, the quarrel between the landowners and the labourers died out. By the end of the Middle Ages, all the serfs in England were free, and all the men who worked on the landowners' farms were labourers who were paid with money. In France, too, during the wars of Edward III, there had been much discontent among the peasants. When King John of France was a prisoner in England, a terrible rebellion of the peasants broke out, which was called the Jakery, as Jakes or James was an ordinary peasant name in France. The soldiers, who had no more fighting to do after the Battle of Poitiers, went about stealing from the people. The nobles, who had been taken prisoners by the English, made the people on their lands pay a great deal of money towards their ransom, and the French peasants had suffered from the terrible Black Death too. The French Parliament, which was called the States General, had very little power in France, and now they tried to get more, thinking they could help to make things better for the people. The Dauphin, as the French king's eldest son was always called, made promises which he did not mean to keep and one of the chief men in Paris, called Etienne Marcel, got the people of Paris to attack the nobles of the court. Marcel himself forced his way into the palace and killed two of the greatest men of the court. Then all over France the peasants rose. The feudal castles were burnt, and great numbers of the nobles and their wives were killed. The French peasants had always been much more badly treated by their lords than the English, and now they took a terrible revenge. The Dauphin's wife and her ladies had shut themselves up in the town of Meur, and an angry crowd of peasants were attacking it, when they were attacked themselves by Gaston Phoebus, Count of Foix, and his friends. He fought heroically, and the serfs were scattered. After this they lost heart, and they were dreadfully punished, hunted down like wild beasts, and killed in thousands. The Jacquerie in France was a far more terrible thing than even the peasants' revolt in England. The First Great English Poet Yet though the story of the 14th century seems a sad one in many ways, it was the time when the first great English poet, Geoffrey Chaucer, lived and wrote. By this time there were French poets writing in French. In Italy, Petrarch had followed in the steps of Dante, and written poems in the beautiful language of Tuscany, the part of Italy round Florence. Petrarch's best poems are his sonnets, in honour of Madonna Laura, a lady whom he loved, and who died of the plague in 1348. In England, at the end of the 13th century, some of the chroniclers of the monasteries had begun to write in English instead of Latin. In the next century, Wycliffe wrote his opinions in English, and also translated part of the Bible into English. The poem called The Vision of Piers Plowman was written in English too, but Chaucer wrote the best poetry of all. He was born in London and was the son of a wine merchant. He himself had work at the court of Edward III and Richard II, and it was for the lords and ladies of the court that he wrote. But he wrote about what he saw around him, and his poetry, which is very musical and beautiful, is full of fun, too. His chief work was the Canterbury Tales, in which Chaucer described a number of pilgrims on their way to the tomb of St Thomas Becket at Canterbury. He 
makes each of them tell a tale. By reading these poems, we can get a true idea of what life in England was like in Chaucer's time, and at the same time enjoy the first beautiful poetry written in English. End of chapter 26